also the director of the Hemispheric Institute of the Americas here at the, at the same university. And I'm very happy that you're here. Today, uh, we are having uh, this conference, Challenges and Redefinitions of the Left in Latin America, co-organized by three, uh, three institutes slash centers. So one is the Hemispheric Institute of the Americas here at UC Davis. The second one is the Center for Latin American Studies at Stanford University. And the third one is the Department of World Languages and Literatures at San Jose State University. And we have formed a, an ad hoc consortium that we have called the Latin American Consortium of Northern, Northern California, LACNORCAL. It's a very long acronym. And we have a busy agenda of book talks, conferences, and other activities to promote work on Latin America and the Caribbean. It has become a tradition in our campus to read a land acknowledgement. So we'll do that right now. We should take a moment to acknowledge the land of, on which we are gathered. For thousands of years, this land has been the home of the Patwin people. Today, there are three federally recognized Patwin tribes, Kachil Digi, Band of Wintum Indians of the Colusa Indian community, community. Kletzel, Kletzel Digi, Wintum Nation, and Yosha, De, uh, and Yosha Digi Winto Nation. The Patwin people have remained committed to the stewardship of this land over many, many centuries. It has been cherished and, protect, and protected as elders have instructed the young generations. Uh, we are honored and grateful to be here today on their traditional lands. So before diving into, in the, into the logistics, I would also like to acknowledge the, the recent events that have shaken our community in Davis. While we lament the loss of David Bro and UC Davis student Karim Abu Najim and keep our thoughts with their family and friends, we continue committed to carry on with our mission of broadening our understanding of the Latin American region through dialogue and reflection. That's precisely what we're doing here. We're gr therefore grateful that you have decided to come to share this event with us, whether you come from uh, near or far. Well, we welcome you all. And uh, we are live streaming this event. So, um, that's a possibility that people have to, to connect with us from, from other parts of the country. And we have a stellar panel of, of eight presenters representing four Latin American nations that have recently elected left wing governments. And they will enlighten us with perspectives that range from political science to grassroots activism and from history to performance. So, um, I have been instructed that I need to let you know uh, a couple of logistical things. The first one is the, that in the unlikely uh, event of an emergency, those are the two exit uh, doors over there. Uh, if you need to go to the bathroom, just leave this space here, turn to the right and behind the elevators, the, the bathrooms are there. Um, there are snacks and refreshments at the, at the front of here when you leave this, this space here. And they are for everyone, all participants, both presenters and attendees. And uh, there will be a burrito lunch provided for everyone uh, again. Um, what else? I, I need to acknowledge uh, a whole bunch of people who have uh, uh, contributed to, in one way or another to, to make this event possible. First, uh, the... Uh, I should mention, of course, the director of the... the, the co-directors of the... Center for, uh, for Latin American Studies at, uh, at Stanford University, our friend and colleague, uh, Alberto Diaz and uh, Elizabeth Ackerman, and uh, the wonderful uh, Sara Clemente, who's uh, doing a fantastic work, working with all the logistics. Thank you, Sara. And the Institute of uh, the, uh, and the Hemispheric Institute of the Americas, we have Amanda Aguilo, who has been also incredibly helpful at uh, San Jose State University. We have uh, Sheila Samuelson, of course, here at the at the at the Vanderhoop studio, we have a whole bunch of people who have done all sorts of things so that we can stream live stream those so we can have all this space and all this beautiful venue and the lights and sound and all of that. So I, I'm gonna mention Erin King, uh, Daniel Brem, Nick Rocky, uh, Rick Dam, Danny Villegas, and Alex Lynn. I hope I didn't leave out anyone there. So we have a busy agenda with uh, with many uh, presentations. We have a, the the format that we decided for this uh, 
that we work out for this uh, uh, conference is that we have we will have four pairs of presenters. Uh, one main presenter will will uh, uh, make an address of about thirty minutes, sharing their perspectives, and then th there will be a respondent who, for fifteen minutes or so, will offer some reflections, some thoughts, and maybe some uh, some questions to the to the main presenter. And then after that, there will be fifteen minutes for a for a conversation between the two the two presenters, and also for uh, for for us for the audience. And uh, in the morning, we have. Uh, uh, we're presenting first, uh, we're starting with Colombia, then we're moving on to Mexico, and in the afternoon, after after lunch, we have uh, uh, Chile and Brazil. Then after the presentation from Brazil, we have a capoeira performance, so we're going to spice up things a little bit. We have, for that, we have uh, our wonderful Mestre Cobra Mansa from, from, uh, from Brazil, who's going to be presenting on, in the afternoon. And, uh, and then after that, we will have a round table where the eight presenters plus uh, uh, university, uh, UC Davis history professor Chuck Walker will join to discuss all these issues, but in, a, in the context of the region, not the individual countries, but the trends and or some, some reflections on when, where we think the, the, the region is going. So our first presenter um, is uh, Fernanda Perdomo. I have a an extensive biography here. She's amazing. She's 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 done all sorts of, of wonderful work. Uh, currently, she's the Equity, Access, and Inclusion Manager at the city of uh, Sunnyvale in California. Uh, she's a Colombian native who has lived in this country for 27 years. I, I learned yesterday. Uh, she worked at San Jose State University in various capacities uh, uh, at the Office of Diver Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, is heading various initiatives to support especially Chicanx and, and Latinx students. And for this work, she received numerous awards. I won't go through the list because we it will be too much. So she's been recognized for, for that work she's done. Uh, she's currently a member of Papeles para Todos, Todos to, with an X, Todex, um, a national coalition that the coalition that seeks citizenship, citizenship for all, as well as a part of our voice, rights, and vote, a movement that seeks to strengthen community engagement and sense of belonging by expanding the vote of the city of San Jose in California. She's also a leader in the Colombian American community and is working uh, with the Colombian diaspora and the Mexican American community to support the recent immigrant arrivals from Colombia to the city of San Jose. And it's precisely this facet of her work that she will be sharing with us today. So um, the respondent is going to be Patricia Vergara. So I should probably introduce you at once so that we don't have to interrupt after. So Patricia Vergara is a, a assistant professor professor of ethnomusicology. I know that's a very long word. I have the same title, so I always have to explain. It's a person who studies music and culture at the same time. Um, so she's professor of, of this thing at the UC Merced. Uh, her PhD is from the University of Maryland in 2017. Her research examines Mexican corridos in Colombia from the 1930s to the present in the context of, of political violence and rural urban immigrations. Uh, situating the emergence of Mexican inspired music practices in relation to the consolidation of Colombian national and regional styles throughout the 20th century, her work outlines the ways in which modes of listening are constituted discursively and effectively. Um, she is also a, a professional pianist and accordionist. She's a, is a graduate, graduate from one of the most prestigious music schools in this country, the Berkeley uh, School of Music, a, a jazz, a fantastic piano performer, has toured as a musician, so she has many hats. And, and today she will be uh, uh, sharing with us her perspective on the situation in Colombia in relation to the recent uh, election of President Gustavo Petro. So without further ado, please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Fernanda. I'm short, so I need to bring the mic now. Buenos días a todas, todos, todos. ¿Cómo están? No, mejor, a ver, ¿cómo están? Bien, a bien, okay. Bueno. Pues, um, I just want to say that thank you so much for that introduction, uh, Juan Diego. That was uh, very nice. I also want to say thank you for the invitation to being here at UC Davis. 
uh, for, um, you know, the Hemispheric Institute of the Americans to, you know, set this type of uh, events and also for the Stanford Center for Latin American Studies and the San Jose State, my alma mater, uh, where I worked 20 years. Um, the World Languages and Literature Department to um, set this stage and set this um, uh, kind of dialogue about what we think about uh, the new governments in Latin America that come from a uh, perspective of the left. So um, my talk is going to be about the stories of the Colombian diaspora between seeking protection and in parentheses, the fallacy of the American dream. So um, the presentation is going to be a critical analysis about how the government of Gustavo Petro, uh, but also is kind of like a historical view of what has happened in the uh, migration of Colombia to different parts of the world, but in particular to the United States, how uh, the fact that I am an activist as well as somebody who is the, cares deeply for the rights of immigrants um got involved into uh supporting these recent arrivals and also bring attention that we are at this point uh between which is this uh, this crazy number of five to ten million colombians outside of colombia so um we don't have exact numbers as far as uh because the the colombian government has not done that type of census and also bring attention to the type of need or services that we need as um, as Colombian migrants and immigrants um, in this country, um, by looking critically at the Colombian consulates in in this region in this country. Um, okay, so let's see. I think this is all right. So this is the agenda for today. I'll be talking about again what this wave of migrations that we have had in the United States um, and also kind of like throughout the world. We learn about how to build community in the diaspora and what are those um, challenges and opportunities for the uh, government of Gustavo Petro. So let me let me talk a little bit about the this three waves of Colombian migration, uh, which I have divided in three periods, not me, but several scholars have um, kind of done in general this this uh this division but obviously within those waves there are subdivisions but see, in general this is um how colombians have migrated um, throughout the world so the first wave um it's between 1915 and the 1980s um and the context here is that as you probably know colombia has been a very an inequitable country where the land the problem for us has been the manage of the land, right? So the land is basically in the lands of in the hands of a few. There are uh, high levels of inequality and concentration of the land in the small groups and elites. Um, the, we have uh, we had a sixty year conflict that it was exacerbated by the exclusion of non-traditional movements. Um, there was a lot of government neglect uh, under the underdeveloped rural areas and also privatization of not, not natural resources and the drug trafficking. Um, so in this period of time, there was a lot of organizations, rebel movements that decided to fight against the government. And in this picture, we have a protest uh, of against President Lopez, which was one of the four presidents of the Frente Nacional, which was uh, basically a, a time in our period of our history where the two parity system decided to govern in a way to kind of like appease this time of violence that went from 1948 to 1958. Uh, but it is because of this type of um, alliance between the two parties that the guerrilla emerged in the 1960s because they felt that they were eliminating any political competition while failing to address land reform and social justices, just social justice. Um, so in this period of time, the reasons for people to leave, for Colombians to leave, is like lack of jobs and opportunities and also the armed conflict. And the countries that we left to uh, were Venezuela, uh, United States, and Ecuador. And 
um, around 1 million Colombians uh, throughout the last four decades, um, we have a population around of a million and, and a half. Um, and it's estimated that around 557,000 Colombians um, migrated between 63, 1963 and 1973. Um, this migration was low on high skill workers that came uh, in turn to the United States and kind of set up the, um, the migration or facilitated the migration for the next wave, which is actually a wave that I came. I've been here 27 years in the United States. And this second wave is between 1980 and 2000. And as you know, this um, this time period, um, you know, in the 70s, because of the declaration of President Nixon um, war on drugs, uh, the consequences were fell in Colombia when we started um, fighting the Cartel de Cali, Cartel de Medellin. And here is a picture of the Administrative Department of Security DAS building that I was bombed in December um, 6, 1989, uh, with 500 kilograms of dynamite. 63 people were killed, 600 wounded. I can recount the many times that I was in different parts of Bogota where a bomb will explode and you didn't know if family or friends were actually the victims of that bombing. It was a period where we... Uh, we li lived in constant fear. Um, two presidential candidates were assassinated during that time. Um, my actually, my dad actually was in the National Telecommunication Building, um, and by the grace of God, he was he say he 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 was not in that. Um, I'm sorry, I just get kind of like emotional at that part, but. Yeah, so he he was safe, but not a lot of people can say the same about their family members. So um, the migration that is this time was made of people who left the country because they were part of the leftist government or they were part of the uh, very nascent left a leftist par party that actually was disseminated by the government of Colombia. You don't lead union leaders, people who were threatened by the government and by the cartels recent college graduates and or people who had family abroad. And that's kind of like my my situation. In that period of time, uh, Colombians were also looking to go to Spain um, and other European countries uh, were popular destinations to um, Colombians. The next wave is the third wave, which is between 2000 and 2000 and to this day. And um, during this time, uh, we don't have data exact exact data from 2023, but according to the Pew Research, an estimated of 1.2 million um, Colombians are residing in the United States. They are one of the fastest growing Hispanic Latinx groups in the country that are um, in in this country. Um, you, they represent roughly. 25% uh, of all South Americans that live in in the um, in, in in this country. Also, we had migration to uh, Venezuela, Ecuador, Spain, and um, many in the and because of the situation, in different countries in South America, um, they have also migrated to Chile, which has a large percentage of Colombian immigrants in this period. Um, I'm going to. Talk a little bit about this part of the third wave because the between the year 2017 and the and this year, what we notice is that um, not only people that had you know were high high highly skilled or they had uh, the means to emigrate to the United States because they had a visa, uh, but also folks that perhaps didn't have the economical means, but have the way to actually get a loan, um, it started to also come to the, to the country, which meant that um, if you had a network or a group of people that you knew lived in, um, in this case in California, that actually um, helped the migration because you had a, a family member or a, uh, or somebody who you knew that could help you in your in your journey. So 
these are just some numbers to show you how um, the U.S. Custom and Border Protection website um, shows the migration of Colombians in the in the last three years, four years, um, well, three years. So from 2022, I just want to point out um, the the fact that if you look at the bottom line in 2020, we had uh, in January a number of 52,254 Colombians that were, these are people that, these are encounters. So these are not people that um, in, in either were retained or deported, uh, but these are people that were taken by, by the uh, border protection. But this is a small percentage of those that cross. So you can imagine that if 52,000 were actually in the border, actually probably 50% more of those were the ones that were crossing. So between 2021, 2020 and 2021, and this is because the pandemic, right? It, it was at the beginning of the pandemic, there is a decrease. But if you look at 2021, we have um, jumped to 100, 115,000 Colombians migrating. At the end of that year, um, at the end on September 2021, we have 213,000 um, encounters. And in 2023, by March this year, we have 257 encounters. So, which means that these are folks that, as I said, have been retained or have been detained uh, in immigration um, centers. But that means that at least three times more are the ones that are crossing into our borders. So um, the situation was hard in the sense that um, not only our migration was single adults, which is a large population, but also the fact that many folks came with families. And the problem with it is that um, the migration that we are accustomed, let's say, in the area where I live is um, single family members that usually work and then send um, money to their countries of origin or later come and ask for their, their family members to come. In this case, we were seeing families, complete families coming with nothing because they were either stopped at the border, documents were taken, all their belongings were taken. And um, and the situation was very dire because the city of San Jose and the county of Santa Clara were not um, prepared for for it. So how did I get involved in this situation? Um, as I said, I, I work at San Jose State. I am a, somebody who has been working with the immigrant community for many, many years. One of the things that I am very passionate about is voting rights and immigrant rights. And at the time I was working with um, several community organizations, but in particular Amigos de Guadalupe in getting the vote for the Com Colombian, uh, I mean, for the immigrant community to vote, to vote in local elections. And during that time I was, um, I learned that in Amigos de Guadalupe, they were receiving a lot of Colombian families that were needing immediate support of housing, food, shelter, um, medical atten attention. And um, at that point as well, I was working in the electoral process because Colombians can vote um, outside um, of the of, of the country in in the presidential election as well as um, elections for Congress, and at that point I had gathered a group of people to oversee the elections in the consulate of which uh, for our case the consulate is the consulate in San Francisco, the consulate of Colombia in San Francisco that oversees or supports 10 different states in the West Coast. So I had um, kind of like a, a, an idea of what was happening locally. Um, and I, at the same time, I was um, connected to a network that I was very nascent of Colombians that were working and making sure that the electoral process in the United States was working properly. So that's how the Red de Apoyo kind of came, uh, came to be. And I'm here just showing the power of social media. During that time, I just sent a tweet about it was a, it was a thread where I spoke about or I wrote about the situation of um, the Colombian community, 
how many people were coming, where were the routes that they were using, because these were things that I was finding from the community. And it gathered 11,000 likes. It was retweeted uh, thousands of times, lots, hundreds of comments, because people were, they either knew somebody who had decided to come to the U.S., either by flying to Mexico and then doing the trek all the way to the border, or they were doing the border, uh, the, the trek all the way from Colombia by foot, by by bus, by, you know, by any means of transportation, just to come here. And the story, the stories were terrible. And I probably you're familiar with with some of those stories, but we at that point we were not knowing or need, we were not sure why they were all coming to San Jose. And so the power of social media is just to kind of showcase what was happening, but at the same time is the way that a lot of um, immigrants know that um, there is a space for them to, um, or a network of people that they will be um, sort of supported here. So that's how the Red de Apoyo um, came about. And these are a couple of um, immigrant stories that I am not, um, uh, they're not great stories. I These are not their names, but basically is the fact that folks that came here looking for a better future um, did not reach that goal. And that's why is the fallacy of the American dream in the sense that, for example, Johnny, came here thinking that he was going to be supported. Um, he needed a surgery that took care of a tumor that he had in his neck. Um, he didn't get the support that he needed from the Colombian consulate. And that's kind of like the critic here that I feel the, it's, it has to have a more humane view of the issues, why people migrate. And in his case, he had to go back to Colombia because he couldn't get the, he got, he got some care, but um, it was not enough. The stage and he, and uh, he was, it was um, too far. Um, and he had to go back to Colombia and unable to get some humanitarian visas for his family to come here. So sadly he passed away last year. Um, John is somebody who is still here, but when he was detained in migration, when he was detained and transported from from the border to the Yuma detention center, um, the driver fell asleep, and all the folks that were in the bus um, were, you know, handcuffed. So many of them had like terrible injuries, and we couldn't support him because there is not legal um, assistance through the consulate as well as. Um, he was supported by um, the California Collaborative for Immigrant Justice. But again, this is another example where we think that there has to be a, a little bit more of support, legal support in this case. And Lena is somebody who is uh, actually an, a, a case that was very resonate, uh, resonated a lot in Colombia just in, in the last few months. He, I mean, sorry, she is looking for support uh, because she was a victim of um, gender violence. Um, her family has been um, threatened, and that's why she is in San Jose at this point. And the support that we are doing as a just as a network is not enough. Here we have, and there our group. We have 384 participants, and what we try to do is basically um, these are just screenshots of the information that we pass as when they have questions about, you know, I'm having issues with my rent. So where do I go? Um, where can I find, um, where can I find a, a lawyer? When can I get my um, health, um, uh, you know, some, some support, some, some care, um, health care. Um, also, I'm trying to create a space where people understand their that there are community uh, organizations that not only support them uh, with their basic needs, but also there is engagement, civic engagement that they can also participate. Um, these are other examples of things where there are free fairs and things like that. So not just me and the folks that actually support or are administrators of the group share the information, but they also support each other sending information once they find it. So what are the challenges for the from the uh, 
government of Gustavo Petro? Um, well, there are many, and that's why it, it is a hard conversation. One of them is we still have to uh, ratify, uh, not ratify, but apply the peace agreements with the FARC. And right now we're in the peace process with the ELN and other armed groups. Um, there is a lack of up-to-date infrastructure in the consular system, as I've been speaking about. Um, there is a polarized climate, um, political climate in Colombia and also in the United States. We were recently denied the deferred enforced departure DED, which is something that um, protects the Colombians from being deported. And right now, what the Biden administration is um, agreeing with the with Petro administration is to create processing centers for migrants in Colombia and Guatemala, which is going to exacerbate the problem in Colombia and kind of like move it from the United States. There is a lack of cohesive, co cohesiveness at the international uh, branch of the Colombian, uh, the Colombia Humana political party, which is part of the, um, you know, the coalition and the party that brought Petro to to um, to power. And there is also the mafias and human trafficking. These folks that are coming to San Jose, um, I learned that they were either um, sold some sort of package to come. Um, and so they sell everything that they have by this package just to come to the U.S. And then they are either traffic or they are um, extorted to pay um, even more more money than they, they uh, borrow. And then also the classism and elitism and the consular service. So what are the opportunities in this case? Uh, what I propose is, or several of us, and it's not just me, um, is that we create diplomacy that is head on and at the service of the people. Uh, we call it no más corbata, de, no más diplomacia de corbata y cocktail. So uh, it, avoiding this type of just um, just places where you do just your paperwork and you get your uh, passports and such. Um, also reform the consular infrastructure. So find out how many of us are we out there. So find out demographics, what are our needs, where are we located. Um, continue to press, uh, press the invited key senators and Congress of the U.S. for the DED, for the passing of a DED or a, uh, a better uh, immigration policy. Also, a national campaign of visibility where, you know, migrating is at right, but I also feel that it's important that people know of what they're going to be facing once they get here. So develop a national media campaign where they're, um, they're warned of the difficulties of migration. Also support those that are in detention. Um, the consulates actually have a role of going to um, detention centers to provide legal services and at least just to have a visit. Many, many years, for many years, um, none of the Colombians um, who have been in um, detention centers have been visited. And then um, just to finalize is the community support uh, to, the you know, recognize the Colombian diaspora and the work that we've been doing for years as well as create better channels, like there is a program called Colombia Nasuni, um, to address our migratory, social health, and economic needs. Um, so this is uh, kind of like my presentation. Here we have some pictures with like the, the marches that we have done, the gatherings that we have created for those um, folks that have come to um, San Jose. And those are some of the organizations that I am working with, like Red Colombiana Apoyo, Papeles para Todos, Somos Mayfair, the California Collaborative for Immigrant Justice, and Amigos de Guadalupe. And um, that's all. Thank you. Patricia, 
Hi, everybody. Thank you so much uh, for the invitation. Um, thank you, Fernanda, for an amazing presentation. <clears throat> um, I'm not going to use the PowerPoint, and um, I would like to um, mostly focus on the immigration in Colombia, the internal migration in Colombia, which I see as um, very related to to the immigration um, of Colombians to the United States and other parts of the world. Um, as um, Fernanda has mentioned, uh, land distribution has been at the core of violence in Colombia for many decades, and we might argue even more than that, um, it's been really a way in which the country has been structured um, and land has always been a dispute with, of course, um, people in power, landowners acquiring more and more land and pretty much displacing small farmers and peasants. So this has been um, the history of Colombia pretty much. So these displacements of people um, have happened uh, for a long time. And the reasons got exacerbated when uh, the violent conflict, as Fernanda already explained, beginning in the 1940s, with uh, waves of violence called La Violencia in um, the late 1940s, and then followed <clears throat> by the formation of uh, small militias that pretty much protected landowners and power politicians. So these waves of violence, they have, um, they have transformed, but they've always been um, tied to each other. It's not that we change from one type of violence to the other. And of course, there are many types of violence that come um, in its wake, which is um, domestic violence, gender violence. Um, so um, with the formation of the first peasant guerrillas, which were the FARC, um, peasants who ended up in many ways being in the same areas of forced displacement, um, which happened to be the same areas that the guerrillas first formed because the guerrillas were um, first um, supported by, by, by the peasants, uh, which was really um, an organization that one of it, their claims, their core claim has been land distribution. And also because of a lack of a political path for dissidents in Colombia, um, this has always been, in a way, settled by violence. And citizens, civilians have always been the recipients of all of this. So this has generated uh, uh, waves of internal displacement that, in a way, they, in a way, they mirror the waves of immigration. Um, for example, um, the numbers in of forced displacement in 2023, the estimates, there isn't a, uh, there is not a uh, ultimate number because a lot of those are not reported, but of registered um, forced displaced persons in 2022, uh, was 139,000 just in 2022. And the numbers of forced displaced persons uh, in the last um, 50 years, after the 19, uh, almost 70 years in Colombia, is an estimate of six to seven million people. And it's only second to Syria. And this is something that not too many people know. You know, this has been a, a sort of a silent war. And uh, the focus has been really on, on the drug trafficking. That's what Colombia, Colombia is known for. And the violence is usually attributed to that and to the guerrillas that fight the government. But the, the war is a lot more complex than that. Um, so why do I do all this? I'm an ethnomusicologist. So I do music. Um, so ethno comes from ethnography, right? So we are musicologists that do ethnography. And through that, we get involved in all kinds of things. And politics is essential because, you know, people's uh, lives, societies, uh, you cannot think about what happens to them without thinking about politics. So when I started looking at a kind of music from Mexico that was adopted in Colombia at the beginning of my research, 
uh, I was interested why there was so much Mexican music in Colombia everywhere, which surprised me the first time I went there, which was 2004. Where is the Mexican music? I couldn't hear anywhere. And I traveled a bunch. And I was listening to this music that sounded Mexican, but it was really Colombian. I could tell by the lyrics, by the accent. And I started my research. Nothing had been written about this music and um, took me back to the 1930s and 40s when recorded music circulation started to really um, spread music from all places. In Colombia, Mexican Norteña, which is music from the border US-Mexico, uh, was mostly targeted at peasants, and um, peasants adopted, adapted, started making it their own since the 1940s. And why? Um, what, what does this have to do with immigration? Well, when I was just beginning, I thought, I'm going to go to one place in Colombia where this music is predominant, right? We have this idea that we can associate certain types of music with regions or cities. And I found that this music was popular in very disparate places in Colombia, pretty much all over the country. And I was trying to figure out why, what do they have in common? So this is not from a specific region or a specific city or a specific population. And then I found out by mapping it that it corresponded to the hot the hot spots in Colombia called where uh, the places where violence was was the most um, serious, the most um, predominant. And those were also areas um, of that received a lot of forced displaced persons, like the city of Villa Vicencio in the region of the Meta. Those were all areas that first received um, people who were displaced. And then from there, they became also such hot areas of violence that people were displaced again. So we see these displacements almost as a generational thing, right? Folks that uh, immigrated because of political violence in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and then they are displaced because of um, guerrillas and paramilitaries taking um, the territories and then the drug traffic in between. So we have all these violence, uh, the this, this spots of violence, which that's exactly where the music that I look at was really, really popular. So that's what um, took me on this journey of understanding these paths of um, of displacement and who were displaced and why. So I um, thinking about what's happening now, right? Why are we still seeing such waves of of displacement, internal displacement, and immigration after in 2017, right? In Colombia, it's the same thing. The numbers have gone up. They went down for a little bit, um, but now they've been going up. And 2022 has been a year when uh, forced displacement has has risen like it had not in many years. And we think about 2016, right? That's when uh, the peace agreement was signed between the FARC guerrillas and the then Manuel Santos administration. And we think, okay, logically, we would see a decrease in violence um, because the major guerrilla, right, put their arms down. And years late, earlier, um, the, the paramilitary uh, groups had put their arms down. Uh, and what's going on, right? And that's one of the main challenges for any administration in Colombia. What's going on? Our peace agreement's not, not enough, right? So one of the... One of the things that the prior administration by Ivan Duque has been accused of, and very rightly so, was by uh, it was of uh, not following through with the main provisions in the peace agreement, uh, especially uh, in the, with the issue of land distribution. That's really something that his administration was totally reluctant of even touching. And while this is not addressed, right, there won't be a stop. To, to this kind of violence that happens mostly in rural areas. And that causes displacement mostly from rural um, or small cities to larger cities. So that's when you see the growth of uh, settlements in the peripheries uh, and so on. So, um, which puts a lot of pressure on, on the local economy. Uh, there are no services. So that creates a very massive um, economic, socioeconomic problem. Um, so, 
one of the first things, and that's um, something that Fernanda said, the peace agreement has to start being um, taken seriously and um, the Petrog administration has uh, a motto right now, it's at the core of their agenda, which they call total peace, right? Paz total, uh, which is, we can think about, okay, total peace, um, there are a lot of people who, that are criticizing this term because total peace is uh, almost utopic to think about in Colombia, at least in the short term. Um, so maybe progressive peace would be a, a more um, accurate, term for it, which means negotiating, negotiating with all, all the parties. So the FARC um, has signed a peace agreement, but there are other guerrillas like the ELN who has not, they refused. And there are many reasons uh, for that um, because they have a very different structure than the FARC. So it's been a lot harder to negotiate with them. And also there are there is a dissidence of, of the FARC guerrilla that first did not um, did not go um did not go was not on board with the peace agreement so they never uh signed and there are also um dissidents those that that did did participate in the agreement and then got out of it and the reasons are many uh the peace agreement was not being followed and violence continued a lot of the paramilitaries that put their arms down and other people, the mafias, the drug trafficking formed uh, criminal bands. So after the peace accord has uh, been signed, we saw an increase in these um, um, back crimes, they're called in Colombia, the criminal bands, which do not really align with any political purpose. Um, so Negotiating with these factions, with criminal bands, with existing guerrillas, with um, so it doesn't really have a lot of support, popular support. A lot of people in Colombia do not uh, support any agreements with so-called criminals, right? Which is a very complicated term in Colombia because violence has been perpetrated by all sides. Um, the Colombian government has been uh, liable of multiple human rights violations and many, many scandals of all the people that have died at the at the hands of, of the military and the police forces, security forces. So um, it's very complicated to, to, to really think about, okay, what does criminal mean? Um, so the Petro government is going to have a hard time with this idea of reaching out to everybody to negotiate. So that's a main challenge. Uh, while this doesn't happen, violence continues to escalate. Uh, land distribution is also a main point of challenge because um, historically, land has been in the hands of the elites uh, who have had numerous pacts with uh, paramilitaries who protected their lands and so on. So these are very, very powerful groups. And as the government, like, like similarly to Brazil, so to be elected into government, to govern um, all of these coalitions had to be made. So there is a lot of tension in reaching uh, these agendas to being actually able to implement these agendas. Um, I, I could keep talking forever, but... Uh, <laughs> I just wanted to make the point of um, how forced displacement correlates to immigration to U.S. And I guess the numbers might even be similar uh, when we think about all the millions of people who have um, this been displaced because of violence and because of dispossession. Um, so I wanted to focus on that and on the challenges that will be, uh, you know, they will have to be dealt with to to begin to find solutions. Um, and now I guess I'm gonna I'm gonna talk with Fernanda. <laughs> um, thank you. That was great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, so Fernanda, I, I wanted to to ask you how how do you see the the relationship between forced displacement and and the waves of of migration to the U.S. and perhaps if the the current migration 
to California specifically, if you have any idea if these are related at all, in specific cases that you've been. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. I um, I definitely think that there is a correlation. There is uh, definitely a link there. Some of the some of the folks and and I didn't go into detail, but um, the migration that we saw between 2017 and 2022 um, before the pandemic and during the pandemic was a migration that started with those folks that were had more economical means, financial means to come to the U.S. and they started getting like very expensive hotel rooms until they found a place to live. Um, like a permitted property. Usually that's happening kind of like in states like Florida, um, kind of like in the East Coast. And then we saw another wave, which was people that had family members already here. Maybe they were not, you know, um, you know, socioeconomic class, at the very high socioeconomic class, but they were like uh, uh, middle or lower middle. And um, they also kind of got either some loans to come to the U.S. and they uh, flew with a visa and they are like visa overstayers. But then now what we're seeing is in since um, the borders were open after COVID um, is folks that perhaps don't are, have been displaced by by the uh, violence or they have because of the continuation of that violence um, has not been dealt with. They either decide to sell their properties, they sell their businesses, um, get a loan and come to the U.S. with the hope that they're going to be, you know, recuperating that money, sending it back or, um, or just have a life here. They usually do either the trip to Mexico and then they walk, you know, they do the, the trek from Cancun to the border or if they have visas, um, or if they don't have the the means or the visa to come all the way to Mexico, because Mexico also has a very stringent policy against Colombian, and there have been a lot of um, articles in the news where Colombians have been mistreated by the Mexican immigration police, um, is they do the whole trek. So people who are displaced in Colombia either decide at some point just because they don't have other options just to come to the U.S., but that displacement also happened at different levels of the economic mm -hmm. spectrum. Yeah. Um, so the do you think that the um, the current initiatives uh, that that Petro is is trying to um, to pursue in terms of immigration and the talks with Biden, they don't seem to have had a, a good outcome. No. Do you see um, Do you see that getting any better? Yeah, I I'm hopeful that um, at the local level, it's possible to do something with the programs that, for uh, for example, Colombia nos une. And the, it's, it's a program that the uh, minister or the secretary of um, external relations has for Colombians is not well funded. So not a lot of um, uh, consulados, uh, consulates have that program. Um, so those type of social services that we can provide here in, in, in the local area are very, very hard to do. Because there is no there is no financing, there is no the infrastructure to do um, to kind of find out how many Colombians are here, and then I guess at the macro level, it's so um, polarized the conversation about immigration that I it's going to be an issue in the next election. I think that it's going to be used against Biden. Um, to show that he's not tough on immigration, that there are open borders, uh, that anybody, everybody's coming, when in reality, he's still applying Title 42, even though May 11 is the day that they stop using Title 42. But he's sending troops to the border right now. And so um, it's not that Biden has been, I mean, slightly better than, than Trump, but I feel that things are not going to get better in general mm -hmm. for any country that has some sort of like immigration issue with with the United States is going to continue to be uh, um, a point of contention and definitely in the elections, mm -hmm. in the coming elections. Should we open to to others? Uh, anyone who would like to 
to ask questions. Yeah, go ahead. So, so this language that one uses really matters for the narrative. And yeah. uh, in some ways, you know, one of the things that is so striking to me about Colombia, and I don't know if you want to comment on this, is that it is in a way like the, the, the it should be the place we should be studying the most in the world of migration because of the Venezuela inflow. The internal displacement, and now I learned the movement into the US. Why is that narrative kind of at the core of the way we imagine Colombia? Uh, <laughs> That's a like why, why, why? Also, a surprise, mm -hmm. I would say the same thing you said up there. People don't know this is the biggest mm -hmm. massive movement of people, both with the internal displacement and the Venezuelans. Uh, Sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, so I'm asking about the question about the internal displacement plus the Venezuelan inflow plus the migration internationally and why this narrative does not appear in the way we think of Colombia. I, I, I have, I'm going to attempt an answer because it's a really good question. It's really, really complex. But I will say that we had governments, uh, you know, we, in Colombia, we say that we have a two-party system, but it's really kind of like uh, the the right has always had the government, uh, the governance of the country, right? And if you look at Duque's for years, and even Santos and Uribe's, um, they always talk about the potential of the you know the economic potential that Colombia has, how many you know uh, wonderful not natural resources can be exploited, uh, exploited, um, you know, a beautiful, uh, very friendly folks that live in Colombia, all the positive things, but they never really wanted to bring all the issues up to the forefront in the national, international uh, platform, because they wanted to keep a different kind of view of what the country was, because they were looking for more uh, international financing and support. Um, but now that we have Petro, I feel that there is this opening of like, let's talk friendly about what's happening in Colombia, because is in it, which is also in detriment of the government of Petro, because now they're, you know, putting it all on his um, uh, kind of like is his fault and the lack of uh, uh, governance or what have you. But that's why you don't know what's happening is because it has always been hidden and when we speak about this there are always other issues that we are very complex we have so many issues with the peace um that the fact that we were not able to implement it and that duque torpedo that process that Colombians outside of Colombia are not that important even though we have the right to vote and we send million billions of dollars in remittances to Colombia um even for Petro I think that he is so focused and I, I will give you another example the uh el canciller the the minister of regional um external relations his main focus was not just working on the diaspora the Colombian diaspora but he's trying to get international support to bring the ELN to the table, to get support for the peace process for La Paz Total. And so even in that sense, we were not looking for us who are outside, but is looking at how do we get the peace. Mm -hmm. uh, if I can add just a little bit more, um, agreeing 100%, I would also say that the lure of the drug trafficking um, has been uh really strong like people think of colombia and i don't say just you know the general public uh even people who are interested in 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 doing research so the drug trafficking has really really grabbed the attention and violence because of the drug on war uh, the war on drugs right uh violence in colombia has been construed as derived from 
from the drug traffic and from the guerrillas being second after the drug traffic. So this focus on uh, the guerrilla is a rebel guerrilla that the Colombian government is fighting and that's their problem. So, uh, you know, this is it. That, that's that's the cause of violence. Uh, and, and the other one being the focus on violence generated by the drug traffic. Uh, and that's because the United, the Colombia has been the number one ally of the United States until this government. So these these narratives, right? They they have this foundation as well. Okay, thank you for the presentation. I have a couple of questions. One is more related to internal politics. So um, recently there was a like a dismissal several of the ministers from from Petro and uh, Ocampo, who was supposed to be the financial minister, who who kind of had support from the from the right. Or so I I want to know your reading about that happening. Is that going to give more maneuver for him to accomplish Petro what he wants to do, or that's going to have more uh, a discussion or uh, political would be more difficult because the, he would be more isolated from the other political parties. That's one thing. And uh, you mentioned about that the 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 that, that I want to to focus a little bit more on what you mentioned about how important are the migrants outside of Colombia in terms of of internal politics. So the people that have migrated, how how many vote and uh, how important is for the internal politics that uh, that uh, portion of Colombians outside and and if 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 you see outside the same. Uh, division politically as you see in Colombia, where people that had migrated are more socially conscious because they have suffered violence and they support more petrol than the right. I don't know. So I would like if you have an, a, a lecture, a reading of, of, of what are those debates of the Colombians outside of Colombia? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. I'll answer the second part. Okay. <laughs> um, I can talk about the first one when we go to coffee, have coffee. Um, and Fernandez, I yeah, I can answer the second part. So, uh, do you want to do it? Oh, okay. So, um, there is. So, just to give you some statistics, Petro won in Spain. Okay, in the uh, election, um, and he won in like thirty-five different countries outside of Colombia. Um, he didn't win in the U.S., but I have to say that in California uh, or the district of Cali the circumscription of California, um, some. Sa was the only uh, part that we were close to, we didn't win, but we were like 49% against 51% with Duque. So um, definitely the, the folks that migrate to the, U the United States have a view of, uh, they're more conservative. They're more with, um, you know, Uribe and the kind of like that vision. But I will say that the, the sense and 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 what I try to do, which is some educational, so I come from that educational background. I want to share with them that these issues of social justice and support from services that they're getting from the county or from the city, these are coming because we're paying taxes because it's important for the fabric of the uh, of the community because we want them to feel welcome because we want their kids to go to school. It's the same sense that. Petro is talking about social justice in Colombia. So I have to, um, you know, in my conversations with them, it's like to make sure that in a way they are being um, recipients of politics that the same Petro is talking about of implementing in Colombia and their beneficiaries here in the U.S. because there is, you know, a social network that doesn't exist there. So um that is a process that's an educational process um and they are we're definitely a force and a source of uh votes for the next election so um yeah definitely that's why it's so important that we go hand in hand with the educational part and the um kind of like civil rights of educating those that have the right to vote here and not all of them vote that's the other thing mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Well, remember that we have at the end of the of the of the day uh, roundtable where we will we could bring this this uh, these questions in the context of the of the region. Um, so uh, I like what happened here. Now we we have set some kind of uh, pattern here. So the the main presenter will come here first, and then that will go will go to the hot seat there. What the respondent. Uh, response to them. So now we will have a second uh, pair of presenters. Uh, the first is uh, Viridiana Rios, uh, who is a political scientist specializing in public policy in uh, US-Mexico relations. She's a lecturer at the at Harvard Summer uh, School and received her PhD from, uh, from Harvard University. Her work has been published at various journals and uh, she regularly advises top political leaders, helping them identify, measure, and expose counterintuitive policy through truths using data. Besides her uh, labor as an academic, she's a columnist at the European newspaper El País. So uh, that's Viridiana and the respondent. I'm, I'm very glad, Alberto, you're going to be respondent here because uh, I was looking forward for you to be a respondent with actually with Gustavo Petro a, a few days, days back, and you were not <laughs> allowed to do that by. Uh, uh, a few of us were there in in Stanford a few days ago. But here, we will have you uh, sharing your views on what is happening with uh, uh, the government of uh, López Obrador. So I have a very extensive uh, biography of Alberto. He is a very accomplished scholar. Um, uh, he is uh, the senior fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies and director of the, of the class at Stanford University. He was associate professor at uh, at, UC, in, at UC San Diego. Uh, I mean, there, there's he's published many many books. His PhD is from the University uh, for Duke, Duke University. Uh, his work is on uh, has focused on federalism, poverty, and violence in Latin America. Um, yeah, so you can you can look him up. There's there's a, there's a lot to to learn from him. So uh, welcoming uh, help me in, in uh, welcoming them uh, to the stage. Yeah. Do you have it there? Yes, I got you. Thank you. I wanted to ask you, Juan Diego, if I can sit over there because I'm very short. Thank you. This one, Rios. Right. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, well, uh, I want to start by thanking uh, Juan Diego for organizing this event. Uh, and I'm going to cite one of my favorite professors and constant inspiration from the law school at Harvard, um, Onger Mangaveira, who says that um, ideas are never going to change the world but we would never be capable of changing the world without ideas. So thank you very much, Juan Diego, for helping us bring ideas about the left and about Latin America. Today, I'm going to talk about a pretty controversial character, López Obrador, and I'm going to call him AMLO just for short, right? Uh, but well, AMLO, as you I'm sure you know, AMLO was elected by a majority of Mexican voters under a left agenda. However, he has become increasingly controversial as his agenda moves in between the left and sometimes the right, the hard right, I have to say. Uh, so on one side, we have an AMLO that has increased the minimum wage on 88% historical, that has increased social spending on 14%, this is in two years. Uh, and that has increased tax collection from big corporations on 22%, right? Historical, again. However, we also have an AMLO that has militarized the public security of the country, that has implemented draconian austerity measures, and that also uh, has a preference or seemingly has a preference for oil uh, and not, from, uh, not for uh, green energy. 
So uh, let me dissect this character by uh, walking you through uh, three things that I want to do today. The first one is I want to talk to you about the context of AMLO's victory. Then we're going to talk about uh, his specific policies, and I'm going to focus on five areas. And then finally, we're going to talk about uh, some final thoughts uh, that I have about this, but maybe this could be actually a conversation that I'm going to have with Alberto, uh, my professor and my friend. So let's begin with uh, first the context, right? Right. Uh, uh, so um, let me show you a little bit about the country that elected AMLO, because I feel that sometimes my, my husband is American and he's like, no, really, you think that Americans know Mexico. All Americans think that they know Mexico, but they don't. Right. So let's let's just begin by, <laughs> but, you know, clearing the stage about really what the dystopia uh, that Mexico is, right? So here we go. Let me show you. This is the distribution of income in what, according to the World Bank, is the most unequal country in the world. This is the Gini, right? And according to the Gini, South Africa is the most unequal country in the world. Here you can see the top 1% uh, gets 19% of the total income. Uh, the next nine points, uh, we get 46%, right? And then finally, 90% uh, of the population gets only 30, 35%, right? Well, this is Mexico. So it, it seems like we are, according to the Gini, a little bit less unequal than South Africa, uh, mostly because we don't have 35%, we have 36% on the 90% on the yellow area. But if we look at the Mexicans that are rich, they are very rich filthy rich, right? Like actually there are only two countries that have uh, the 1% larger than Mexico. Uh, no, not anymore. Not anymore, right? It used to be, but good, good point. It, it, no, uh, it's the Central African Republic and Mozambique, right? Uh, I tried to go to the Central Africa Republic and couldn't get in because it was on war. And I'm like, yeah, you know, that's, you know, that's what happens <laughs> on countries <laughs> that are so unequal. But, well, Mexico is, is peaceful, and we will, we will talk about why. Um, anyway, uh, most of the reason why this is happening, well, first, I, I brought you this picture that I took with a drone, uh, because I've been conducting research about inequality in Mexico, along with a, a super talented photographer of El País, the newspaper that I work for. So we developed this algorithm that basically identify the most unequal geographical areas in the whole country because we wanted to observe how this dystopia looks like. And we found so many areas that we, we couldn't get enough funding to visit all of them, right? It was just really impressive. So these images are everywhere in Mexico City and everywhere in Ensenada and everywhere. I mean, you, you have images like this in Tijuana too and so on, right? There should be more, but the reality is that the, the wealthy in Mexico have also managed to increasingly um, live in, in very secluded and faraway areas. So they don't tend to be right next to areas that are very poor, but it's still some of them have managed. So here we, here we observe that. But okay, a part of the reason why this is happening is wages. And here is how the minimum wage has collapsed since 1982. Right. Uh, this is this is considered to be the period of uh, Mexican liberalism or neoliberalism. Now the term has become very uh, heavy, politically heavy. But you know, neoliberalism existed, and because we are in a in an academic setting, I, I guess I can say without you know the, bur the the political burden that now it has been created. Uh, but but this is this is wages in Mexico, right? This is an index, and if we look at uh, not an index but the uh, the amount of money that people is getting, uh, this is hourly wages in pesos. So you would have to divide it by 20. So you understand that more or less is like a dollar and something, a dollar and a half per hour, right? And it has also been, uh, been you know, collapsing over, over the time, over uh, as time passes. Oops, sorry. Wait a second. Yeah, okay. Um, this means, this meant that 39% of Mexican workers were working full-time and living in poverty, 
And this also meant that uh, by the time AMLO took office, 90% of the population was making less money than four years ago. So it was really a very dramatic moment when AMLO took power. Of course, uh, Mexicans uh, were very resented, right? And, and Mexicans were very resented. And uh, for example, let me give you some statistics. 75% in when AMLO took power, 75% of Mexicans distrusted the government. Only 33% were satisfied with democracy. And 90% thought that the government was corrupt. 90% also thought that the government was ruling for the elites and the people with money. Keep that in mind, because at the end of this presentation, I'm gonna tell you today how many people think the same. So 90% thought that the Mexican government was ruling for the elites and the people with money. Now, not only that, but Mexico had a crisis of violence, as we know. And I'm gonna show you one of my favorite graphs to see this. So this is a homicides, a homicide rate. Oops, thank you. This is homicide rates. Uh, in, uh, as you can see, um, the country was, you know, getting slight, slightly more peaceful but during the administration of Cedillo. The same thing could be said about Fox. Uh, then, you know, Calderon takes office and this is the wave of, you know, dramatic violence that many scholars have actually studied in the U.S. And then, uh, you know, it kind of like went down a little bit, but not really that much during the period of Peña Nieto, which is the president in power right before López Obrador, right? So López Obrador takes power with a country that is also, you know, that has homicide rates that are pretty much double than 10 years ago, right? So it's it's a moment that is very dramatic for, for Mexico and for, um, in, in general, for Mexicans. Uh, this crisis of violence, by the way, is not only happening in the general population. It's also happening, for example, among journalists. Uh, for many years, Mexico has been, not every year, but for many years, Mexico has been one of the countries with most journalists being assassinated. There is debate about whether the assassinations are conducted by drug traffickers, by corrupt politicians, by, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a debatable situation, but the, the point is that it is happening, right? Uh, and also there is some evidence that violence uh, has been increasing more in the most unequal areas of Mexico. So there is uh, one paper that show, for example, that an increase of one point in the Gini in Mexico was associated uh, with an increase of 10 uh, homicides per 100,000 inhabitants. So it's, it's not huge, but we do observe these, these relationships. There is another paper that also show that um, militias were emerging more in areas that were more unequal, right? Because people was looking for the security that the state couldn't provide, particularly people living in areas as the picture that I show you, right? Like in a in a tennis court next to next to a favela. Okay, so let me go to the second part of this presentation. And I'm gonna talk now about um, AMLO's policies, right? Well, uh, as you can imagine, in a country as the one I showed you before, where uh, wages have collapsed, that is prey of a crisis of violence, uh, where inequality is, by some measures larger than in the top most unequal countries in the world. As you can imagine, a character like AMLO that brings a new agenda, that brings an agenda that tries to create more equality and to give to the poor, uh, you know, what they have been owned for decades, is very popular, right? This is, uh, and he, he won with an extremely powerful mandate. He got 53% of the vote uh, in Mexico, no president had ever had one with a majority since 1998. Uh, so it was, you know, dramatic. He won in 31 of 32 states in Mexico. Dramatic. Uh, and also he got the first unity government uh, since 1994, meaning he controlled the majority of Congress and also the presidency, right? Uh, AMLO had a plan that was extremely um, how to say that, I guess, um, <laughs> I guess, uh, mm, I'm going to say, I want to pick the word right, ambitious. 
and he 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 was very ambitious, right? In and in his, for example, in in his plan, uh, I was reading his six year plan. Uh, and before coming to this conference, thank you, Juan Diego, for making me do this because I, I really needed to read that because he, this is what he what he claimed. After my six year term, no young people who wishes to pursue a bachelor's degree will be left out of higher education. Salaries will have achieved a recovery of at least 20% of their purchase power. The emigration of Mexicans abroad will stop. Organized crime will be reduced and in withdrawal. Political corruption will have been reduced to only exceptional cases. This is great, like right, like we we you like you listen to this and you're like, yes, this is what we want, this is what we need, right? Uh, but you know how much of this has become reality, and, and that's what I wanna talk to you uh, now. And let me divide this this conversation in uh, five areas. I'm gonna be brief because we don't have a lot of time. So uh, one is. I want to talk about income and inequality. The second one is uh, tax collection. The third one is social expenditure. Then I'm going to go quickly about uh, over militarization and finally about market competition. So let's begin with income inequality. And let me begin by showing you uh, where, um, where we are, right? Um, this is added value. So, uh, and this is how added value is divided between capital and labor. So the way to imagine this is imagine a company creates money by the process of uh, discovery and, and you know, by, by the regular process of, uh, of uh, the market. And that value is regularly divided between what goes to workers in salaries, in, you know, all of the compensation for labor versus what goes to owners and the and and the capital owners of the corporation. And this is normally how it is divided on the OCD countries. This is how it is divided in America. This is how it is divided in the world. This includes Africa, Namibia, Botswana, you know, the Central Africa Republic, all Latin America, and this is Mexico. Well, it's not normal, right? It's not normal what is happening in Mexico. I actually wrote a book called It's Not Normal, in partially inspired by all the things that are quite abnormal in Mexican distribution like this one, right? Um, now, um, AMLO has increased significantly uh, wages. So let me show you, uh, this is how wages change in the period of Calderon negative in both the formal and the informal markets. This is Calderon, negative in the informal, positive in the formal, and this is AMLO. I could not find uh, historically any president that manages to increase uh, both salaries in the formal and the informal market, um, particularly if we consider that these years are the pandemic. Uh, so uh, part of the reason why this happened is because of increases in the minimum wage. So remember, this is the graph that I showed you before, and this is the period of AMLO, right? So this is pretty significant. Um, uh, however, uh, and let me just you know bring to you some of the red flags of this. One is that uh, even with these increases, poverty has remained very sticky in Mexico. So only poverty has only been diminished in two percentage points. Uh, particularly among workers. In Mexico, 15% of workers used to be poor, and now it's 13% of workers, right? Uh, there is a slight dec decline on inequality. However, it seems like the most important part of the decline in inequality is not wages, it's more the pandemic that reduced capital gains for the very wealthy. Second, uh, tax collection. Well, this is how much taxes the Bahamas collect, a fiscal paradise. And this is Mexico, a secret fiscal paradise that nobody knew about, right? Uh, so uh, the reason why this happens is because Mexico does not charge enough taxes basically to anybody, but particularly to the rich. And let me show you how this looks. This is the effective tax rate that people pay in different details. So as you can see, it's, it's pretty low, you know, even on the top 
what you are paying is more or less like 20%. So this is not what, what it takes to live in a functional country. It takes more money to live in a more functional country. Uh, however, if we look at the very wealthy, this is what happens, right? This is a graph that we're used to see in the US. Like this is uh, the, the work of uh, Berkeley, uh, Berkeley professor, um, I'll remember in a minute, but uh, he has shown this in the US and, you know, it's, it's dramatic, but in Mexico is further more dramatic, right? Like what you're observing here is that the top, top, top elites are paying less taxes than the upper middle classes, which is not something that should happen in Mexico, uh, in any country. Um, there is also a problem of how taxes, payment of taxes is distributed. And here you have how taxes are distributed. Sorry, here you have again the distribution of income in Mexico. Remember I showed you that at the beginning compared to South Africa. And this is how taxes are distributed. So this is, again, this, this talks about a, an extremely regressive uh, system of taxation where, uh, you know, the 1% takes the 27% of the income, but it pays half of that on taxes, right? Like it's, it's just, it doesn't really match. While at the bottom, mostly because of income uh, consumption taxes, you have the bottom paying 55% of the whole taxation. So, you know, that's a problem. That's why when, when we talk about taxation in Mexico, I'm increasingly more and more frustrated by people that concentrates on saying that a lot of people are not paying taxes, that, you know, a lot of the poor are in the inf informal markets. When in reality, the problem is not the poor that are in informal markets. They are contributing their fair share because they pay consumption taxes. Uh, the problem is the top 1% that is not contributing their right, the, the right pocket. Now, how AMLO has done on this? Not very well, right? So as you can see here, um, the, the, the tax contribution of people is, you know, slightly better. It has increased 1.7 uh, points of the GDP during AMLO's period. Remember, AMLO goes from 2018 on. Uh, the former president, Peña Nieto, I think we have to say that he was a better tax collector overall. As you can see, he increased tax collection in almost five points during his period that goes from 2012 to 2018. Now, there is something further more problematic than this in AMLO's government, which is that increasingly tax collection is more regressive. And let me show you how this looks. So this is how taxes were collected with, um, oh no, sorry. This is the distribution of income, so you remember it. Um, and this is how taxes were collected. Uh, sorry, this is how taxes in the high poverty sections of society uh, are collected by the three most recent presidents. And I'm gonna keep showing you how this changes in the income ladder as we approach the very wealthy. And you can see how this is a problem, right? Uh, AMLO has, a, or it seems that increasingly uh, the rich are paying less and the poor are paying more. This is something that we need to research more, of course. We don't, I don't think we yet have the, the full data and the full picture uh, to understand what is happening, but I have two hunches, uh, not, not only hunches, but like supported by some data, but still to be, uh, research more. The first one is that the former increase of, of salary that I show you has also made that people in the middle income and below um, are paying more income taxes, right? That's just the nature of it. So I think this was a policy problem because if AMLO was going to increase wages, he should have also uh, increased or change the rates of taxation such that with the increase, people not suddenly start paying more taxes, but remain in the lower part of the tax uh, brackets, right? So I think that, that was a, a problem of, of policy. The second one is that now people are consuming more in established stores, partially because social expenditure uses uh, debit cards to distribute the money. And debit cards can be used on Walmart and in you know formal, formal areas. So instead of going to the markets, to the informal markets, people increasingly more, people are using that money in the formal markets. And of course, that is increasing the BAT payments that, that people are doing. With respect to social expenditure, well, um, let me say first before moving to the to the to the graph. Let me say something. Um, 
AMLO has dramatically increased the amount of cash transfers that exist in Mexico. According to the last measure, uh, cash transfers have increased in 47%. This is in total amount of money. So that's really significant for many people. Um, and also more people receive cash transfers. The former program of cash transfers was mostly focused on attending the poor, uh, which meant that it had you know, conditional cash transfer. It had a lot of monitoring to understand where the money was going. And therefore, by nature, because of these uh, constraints, the program was also limited. AMLO decided to move into a universal cash transfer system uh, in which the, the goal is that everybody receives cash transfers. If they, if th there is still some conditionalities, for example, uh, the most important cash transfer is for people above 65 years old. So it's more, mostly like a universal pension. Uh, another cash transfer is for students in public schools. So, you know, it's not that it's entirely universal, but it's not, it's not as targeted as it used to be. Right. So the problem when you create a universal program in a fiscal paradise is that you're not going to you just don't have the money to attend everybody. And as we know, when when you, you know, open the door for any uh, social program, the people that tends to be at the beginning of the line are not necessarily going to be the most vulnerable because of their vulnerabilities. Right, so that's just the nature. Like if you wanna have a universal program, you need to go and find the poor, find the very poor and make sure that the very poor uh, have a special conditions for access and information. Well, that was a problem and the, re and, and the result is the following, I'll show you. Uh, so this is a percentage of people that receives cash transfers with Calderon. This is percentage of people that receives cash transfers with Peña Nieto. Peña Nieto was a competent, very corrupt government. Uh, so, no, yeah, I mean, we have to say it that way because that's what they were, you know. They didn't increase cash transfers, like the budget of cash transfers, but they were more progressive, right? They managed to create um, a slightly more progressive uh, distribution of cash transfers, right? Um, well, this is AMLO. That's a huge problem. Because he's spending way more, as I told you before, but because he's not, uh, you know, helping the very poor uh, access, then the distribution is becoming more unequal, right? E eventually, I guess, in a full universal program, you are going to have a flat rate, right? And and then and then maybe, you know, overall. Uh, it's not as, as regressive because you're helping everybody. But if you are, you know, increasingly helping the people that has more and reducing the help that people of people that has less, then, you know, this is kind of like a not very positive equilibrium. Anyway, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go faster because I know we don't have much more time. Um, let me just, uh, before moving here, uh, Mexico, even with the increase of 47% on cash transfers, Mexico keeps being the country with the lowest social expenditure of the OCD. So we're still far away from where we should be. And also, most of the money of the cash transfers has not been has not come from a fiscal reform or from charging more money to the rich, but it has come from austerity, draconian austerity measures that have caught uh, funding from for culture, for you know many many areas that the the president and his team does not consider to be priorities in his government. So this is this is also problematic because we're observing um, a defunding of many of the programs that the government used to have in order to create uh, more space, for more fiscal space for cash transfers. So let me move to the militarization, right? And and I think this is. Uh, this is a this is this is a problem, right? But but uh, let me return to the root of the problem. The root of the problem is that when Amlo takes office, he's he has this problem, right? He has this country, and he believes uh, at the beginning in, on his campaign and on his term, he believes that by increasing social expenditure, the attractiveness, the appeal of crime is going to be less, and therefore people are going to join the organized crime less. And there is going to be a creation of a virtuous cycle of um, less organized crime and less violence. Uh, I mean, maybe it would have happened if he had enough money for his for you know spending 
um, in in the poor and in in schools and in so many other parts of the social network. Uh, but he didn't, right? And uh, the approach proved to be quite ineffective. I mean, it's still a little bit better than before, right? Uh, but but pretty much ineffective. What what you observe here? Let me just give you the numbers so you have them. But uh, with Calderon, homicides increased 68%. With Peña Nieto, they increased 31% overall. And with AMLO, they had decreased 13%. AMLO sells these, of course, as a, as a success, right? And I guess, yes, if you have a very low bar, this is success, more successful than before, right? But remember that AMLO, as I, that's why I read you, his, you know, his speech. This is not what he said. He said that crime was going to be, you know, neglected to the minimum. Well, <laughs> didn't happen. Now, uh, when his approach of social expenditure proved to be ineffective, he, he, you know, returned to what most Mexican governments have done, which is the use of the military to to battle organized crime. However, very soon he also discovered that the military was kind of like there to help him with so many other things, right? And in a, in a government that is a fiscal paradise, well, the military uh, is like a very competent, young and well-trained force that is also very loyal. So he said, let's just use the military to do many, many, many things, right? Many things that we want to do, we don't want to do with the private industry because the private industry charge too much money. And we have here these, you know, young, very loyal people, very competent people, the military, to help me. So, uh, you know, the, the result is, is a quite militarized uh, state and government where the military is conducting several things. And I brought you a list that goes from, you know, the nitty gritty things that almost is laughable that they do to serious serious things, right? So for example, they do landscaping in the Mexican White House, right? That's, that's done now by the army, right? Then the Mexican White House is the, called the National Palace, right? Uh, they do safety, safety and security of the president and his family. They manage the new construction of the train in the in Quintana Roo, the Maya train. train. Uh, they developed new airports. They are constructing the airport of Tulum, Chetumal. They constructed a new airport in Mexico City. Uh, they established new uh, branches of a public bank that is called El Banco del Bienestar. All of that was constructed by the army. Uh, the army, of course, created a company to do all this. So now they have the company called Olmega, Olmega, Olmeca Maya Tolteca. Uh, that, <laughs> no, sorry, Olmeca Maya Mexica. Uh, that, you know, is designing to support them with administrative aspects of, you know, all of this new power that they had been acquired. And they even were involved, according to Evo Morales himself, they were involved in helping him evacuate Bolivia in 2019. So this is serious. These guys are doing a lot of things. Uh, of course, this is quite problematic because now we have been noticing that the army is growing like a monster in itself, right? And now, for example, we have evidence that they have been conducting uh, illegal spying on journalists, on uh, human rights defenders. And also, uh, this is to me the most, the most problematic thing. They have eroded the incentives for investing on a, on a bureaucracy, on a real civilian bureaucracy uh, that, you know, that is not the army. Finally, let me talk about market competition. This is one of my, it has become one of my favorite topics. And, and let me tell you, AMLO was the only candidate, I voted for AMLO. And the reason why I did is because AMLO was the only candidate that included the promotion of economic competition on his agenda. I read the agenda of the three candidates and the only one that said that there was a problem of monopoly in Mexico was AMLO. And I'm like, yeah, this is this is my guy because I, I truly believe that this is a problem. However, uh, he he really hasn't done that much with uh, with the, with that. You know, like he, he really hasn't embraced that agenda. But but let me just let me first show you how big the problem of market power is in Mexico. So this is Mark. This is uh, what we're observing here is markups. So this is increasingly used more and more by economists as a measure of how much uh, lack of competition or market power companies have. In, in, in theory, for those of you who are economists, in theory, markups should be small and horizontal, right? They should be flat. Actually, in, in economic theory, 
you know, cost equals marginal, uh, mar marginal cost equals, equals price. And therefore we should not observe markups that increase this dramatically. The reason, you know, behind the US is now discussing monopoly problems, uh, you know, because we have this, this distribution of markups, right? Well, this is Mexico, right? So <laughs> something is really wrong. Um, and this has created also a problem of overprices. Several uh, academics have measured how much uh, market power has increased prices above uh, competition level. And I brought you one of the graphs that uh, show how you know the problem is severe. This is how much prices uh, increase because of lack of market competition in different deciles of the population. And also you can see that it's not, all, it's not only a problem that uh, prices are too high, it's also a problem of how regressive this is, right? Because the people with more money, they have also access to more competitive markets, to markets that have more competition than the people with less money, right? So, you know, huge problem. The problem is that AMLO uh, pretty much, oh, this is my image of the, of the millionaires of Mexico. Uh, well, AMLO, has not really empowered the antitrust commission in Mexico that is called COFESE, partially because he believes that COFESE is ineffective, which is true. COFESE, COFESE has not done a lot, as you can see by the images that I showed you before. Uh, but also, AMLO distrusts COFESE because uh, uh, COFESE, the antitrust commission, is against his energy policy. AMLO wants to create a public energy company with some form of market power and and the antitrust commission believes that that should not be done, right? And therefore there is this kind of like power problem, you know, going on. And the result is that nobody is really paying attention to the important work that the antitrust commission should do and also empowering the antitrust commission the way it should be. Uh, furthermore, AMLO has become, you know, very close with some of the oligarchs. My favorite example of this is what happened with the with the subway. I don't know if you knew about this tragedy, but like uh, the subway of Mexico City that was created uh, in by with the money and a company of one of our mayor billionaires, which is Carlos Slim, collapsed. And now we know that this is because it was constructed. It was not very well constructed. And AMLO basically agree with Carlos Slim that there was no problem except that he needed to fix it, right? When people should have been in prison because there were people assassinated. Anyway, let me just conclude here uh, and uh, tell you a little bit of, um, you know, the. I guess we're going to have a conversation now with Alberto, but let me just finish with my, my, my data point that I gave you at the beginning of the conversation. Remember that when AMLO took power, 90% of the population thought that the government was uh, ruling for the elites. Well, now that that share is diminished to 45%, right? So something is happening in Mexico that may not be necessarily entirely related to results as we observe, uh, but you know, people are hopeful and people are supporting AMLO still. Thank you. Here. You can also bring a chair and we can sit here. Okay, I'll, I'll start here. Okay. And if I can have a chair in a second. Uh, I'll start here for a very specific reason. Uh, so uh, first of all, I do want to thank Davis uh, and the community for welcoming us in their, in their beautiful campus and uh, at a time with, with uh, so much grief and, and so much, uh, you know, uh, very, very uh, difficult times for, for those of you who have been living in fear. Uh, I do have to say that, that Latin Americans um, constantly live in fear, the majority of Latin Americans, uh, uh, not exactly for the kinds of things that happen here in Davis, but I do want to make this as a point about how the normalization of living in fear. And one of the things that is most important of uh, Viriana Rios's work, I mean, it's a tough act to follow to talk about 
these issues after what she just did. Uh, but uh, this book that she has, No Es Normal, the, the way we normalize uh, things that we should be so outraged and so angry and so upset and think of them as completely unacceptable in a society that to some extent has succeeded in various things of economic, political, social development uh, throughout the 20th century and a good part of the 21st century. Uh, but we as Mexicans, and it's painful to say it, have just normalized uh, so many of the things that happen in our midst. And, and I think Viridiana's work is so important because of the way she's, you know, putting, you know, uh, uh, Dedo en la llaga uh, on, on, on these issues. I, I do want to also say that any of you who did not see her El País uh, article uh, that uh, came out, I tweeted it just a few minutes ago. Uh, do do like look at that if you if you cannot read her book. Okay. Um, so so let me tell you a little bit about um, you know four points I, I want to make. I, I actually had a longer thing, but I just reduced them, uh, <laughs> given uh, the, the way um, things are going right now. But let me say uh, four things uh, that are reflections really about, um, you know, Mexico. But I think it's it's also about Latin America, and it's also about you know the the the, the reckoning uh, that Latin America has to make as, as a region. Um, so the first one is that it, Mexico really cannot we cannot have a meaningful discussion of Mexico if we don't start from the questions of inequality. I think that comes so clearly from what Viviana just did. Uh, but it's it's just not just inequality, but it's also something about what's going on in the most excluded segments of the income distribution. So this is something that she kind of hinted at different aspects of this. Uh, but one of the things I just want to highlight is that it is something about what's going on on the one percent, uh, and 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 that is very powerful. You know, and when we see, when we see the pictures, for example, of these uh, uh, Mexican billionaires, um, you know, we we need to reflect on on where their wealth comes from. You know, and their wealth comes from things like uh, controlling all the railroads and all the transportation networks of the country, uh, having been able to somehow, in 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 incredibly abnormal ways make sure that Mexico had the worst royalty regime of any country in the world for decades. So they made these fortunes on the basis of mining uh, mining corporations, uh, Valleres, La Rea, um, uh, which basically paid no royalties. It's unheard of. Royalties happen in any country in Africa, in any country in Latin America. Mexico had no royalties to speak of. I mean, it was a completely crazy tax that comes from a particular moment in history that was based on the surface of the land and it was measured in pesos. You have to pay 50 pesos if you have one hectare, 100 pesos if you had two hectares. Uh, unbelievable, un completely unnormal. Um, so that's kind of the 1%. But then when we think about the other side of the distribution, we have to reflect a little bit on what's going on with the with those who are excluded. And, and one thing that, that Avili did not highlight um, is that excluded in Mexico, uh, happen to be indigenous and happen to be Afro-descendant. Uh, and the indigenous are not just living in this far away re regions of refuge in mountainous areas and whatever, you know, where, where they were able to survive and and and, and somehow resist uh, the, the, the sort of the cumulative processes uh, of, you know, development, whatever that meant uh, throughout throughout Mexico's history. But they are also in the midst of the cities, uh, in the urban spaces, uh, with very little understanding, I think, by the rest of society, by the rest of Mexican society, that they have never disappeared. The indigenous peoples never were, you know, kind of completely transformed into this mestizo myth that the, the, the nation wanted to create. And, and we have to, you know, uh, seriously, you, you know, take these questions uh, as social scientists, but also as a society about, uh, you know, how much of Mexico is, is a racialized uh, a society, how much it is a pigmentocracy, and these kinds of issues that in Mexico, again, completely abnormal. Uh, people felt outraged when some scholars started discussing skin tone and a series of issues having to do with, with the racial character of, of exclusion. Let me move to a second issue. I mean, I, I would spend two hours talking about this, but we cannot do that. Uh, but let me move to a second issue, which is a little bit something that has troubled me over these years. 
Um, and I, I really do not understand it fully, but let me share a little bit what, what, I, what I think I can understand, which is what is the country that AMLO imagines? Uh, what, what is the country that he believes you know, he, he, he can construct or he could construct. And, um, and it's interesting that Vidi went to see, to read the, the, the plan de gobierno. I did read the plan de gobierno back when it, when it came out and, and, and I was a little bit, uh, you know, astounded by what it said, but I said, well, this is just campaign promises. Nobody's going to hold him accountable. Vidi will, I, 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 I know she will, uh, you know, keep on thinking about this. Where, 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 where are these promises going on? Well, one of the things that, that is very striking about AMLO, when you think about the, the society he believes in, I think he has, you know, I read very carefully and I wrote something on, on a book on the Cuarta Transformación that I was asked to, to write a chapter there. He really believes in this moral transformation that is uh, linked to the family. So, so one of the things that is very striking about the way he thinks of solidarity, uh, about the way he thinks about uh, even the role of the state, is that he has in some ways very little faith in the possibility of transformation that that you know our state structures have generated in in human history you know if you think about the success for example of the social democratic model in european nations at the end of the 19th century beginning of the 20th century was the possibility of a state doing the kinds of things that Vidi has just shown you so, you know you tax you spend progressively you put universal uh, health insurance you you put in place a series of things that are all hinging on state presence on the possibility not of the overpowering command economies or the overpowering authoritarian states of, of the communist regimes that, that were one of the horrors of the 20th century, but really about the state that is able to take these social issues at the core of, of, of its activity. And, and there's something very unusual, I think, in the way AMLO has a rejection uh, of the state. And, and that that makes it makes him very, very sort of different from, from most leftist leaders. Most leftist leaders really believe, and, and I, what I think it, 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 at the core of it is this moral sense that he has about how the family will somehow rescue. So that's the emphasis on the viejitos, on the, on the, on the, on the 65 and plus, and the idea that the, we will take care of each other during the pandemic because we just take care of each other when somebody's sick. It's a very strange utopia in my mind. It's a very regressive utopia in terms of the way I, I see the world. Uh, but in some ways, uh, and this is a friend who shared with me this, this, uh, this image, it is an image that, you know, the way I would phrase it, and, and I'm, I'm sorry if I'm going to be very stereotypical and, and, and in what I'm going to say, is he imagines uh, a family um, you know, in a small, uh, you know, kind of next to the ocean, next to the beach in Tabasco, not particularly nice beach. Uh, there's a small shack. You can buy some food there. The kids are playing soccer. The grandparents are there next to you. Uh, and there's in the back, actually, the reason why that family, you know, they're, you know, the dad works for the oil, oil for Pemex, for the oil company. And the reason they can do that is because there's this oil boom going on. Tabasco is getting incredibly wealthy. So people kind of are, are a gusto which is one of the phrases that people have used when they talk about why AMLO should be re-elected. Uh, a, a complicated discussion, I don't think it's going to happen, but you know, one of the lemmas was, estamos a gusto. Hmm. It's, it's, it's peaceful, it's, you know, there's not much aspiration, you're not trying to get wealthy, you're not trying to have power, you're not trying to be particularly rich, you probably don't have internet, you probably don't have, you know, access to many of the things that people in our societies actually want. Uh, but I think that's a little bit, uh, part of his utopia. Um, okay, I'm going to move on because otherwise I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be able to, to constrain myself in the times. Um, third point I want to make is uh, the challenge of what's going on in the, in the Mexican party system. I cannot spend too much time sort of developing this point, but one of the things that, you know, people thought that after all these years of party hegemony in Mexico, the PRI would basically be a party that would collapse. Uh, you would have a new kind of party system with a typical organization, programmatic organization of the political space with left and right, uh, what has happened is, is very different. Uh, we have a, a political organization that has become overwhelming, which is Morena, uh, and it's really puzzling, and I, I, I hope, you know, really may, might want to take on a little bit of this challenge of trying to understand 
why is it so difficult within the established party system of Mexico to mount a credible uh, alternative uh, to the kind of, you know, sort of narrative uh, of, of course, it's a narrative about the elites. It's a narrative about the exclusion. Uh, but if you're an indigenous person who's being affected by the Tren Maya, you're not happy with what AMLO is doing with your territory. But at the same time, you know, if you have been excluded historically for, you know, centuries, if not at least, uh, you know, the, the 20th century and the beginning of the 20th century, at least this guy seems to be listening to you. But within that kind of whole uh, sort of, you know, programmatic political space, it is not really clear to me, and I'm really struggling with this, is what Morena is. Is that really a political party? Is it a social movement on the basis of one charismatic populist leader? Um, is it going to outlive uh, kind of the the the, the change of, of government when 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 AMLO uh, when AMLO leaves office and 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 someone else wins? What is very clear, however, is it it seems to be very clear that Morena that there is sort of Mexico is in a very peculiar <laughs> kind of political moment. A, a, a democracy, without any question, still a democracy, in which most of the game will be about whether Marcelo Ebrard or Claudia Sheinbaum, I think those are the only really relevant ones, uh, will be president because of the nomination into Morena. It's it's almost like the election is a done deal. We don't really, you know, unless unless beauty proof tells me why I'm wrong, uh, I don't think it, any of the political parties has any leader with any appeal, any charisma that was able to defeat either Claudia or or Marcelo. Uh, now, at the same time, I do not understand what Claudia or Marcelo stand for, which is, you know, a problem when you think about supposedly this is a party of the left or a movement of the left, etc. Okay, I'm going to say my fourth point, and then I'm going to move on to a couple of questions for Vidi. Um, but, uh, I mean, my fourth point is very simple, and um, it is a little bit of the question of, you know, how, what kind of alternative, uh, not, not, not in terms of just the political uh, kind of moment of Mexico, you know, when the next election comes, but what kind of alternative, and this is more a general question for the whole conference, what kind of alternative is the left articulating in Latin America? How, how are they conceiving what it means to be left? Uh, what, what, what is it that, you know, in, in, in some sense, I, I feel, for example, I understand better what Lula stands for. It's harder for me to know after having had him hosted at Stanford, uh, what Petro stands for. Um, I do not know enough it, about Chile, but I hope we get kind of some insight in, in this conference about it. Um, but I, what I can tell you about the Mexico uh, context is that it is very clear to me that my conception of the left, the one that I had when I was young and I was in university and then I kind of over the years, which is this social democratic uh, vision of democracy, is just not there. Uh, is it because we have completely lost faith on the possibility of creating, you know, solidarity in, in our systems of rule of government in which we can, you know, tax on people and spend some people, some money on the people that are less fortunate? Is that is that project? a project that is no longer viable in any way, why don't we have a truly social democratic uh, project in, in, in Latin America today? It is possible, I mean, this is the kind of thing that Petro did at Stanford last week, uh, that that maybe I am really wrong, that I am too much of a reformist, I'm one of these traitors like Karl Kautsky and Rosa Luxemburg, and I do not understand that the only way forward is going to be an abolishment of capitalism, as a form of, of 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 social organization, you know, maybe I'm 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 very naive, but I believe within kind of the realm of possibility. Uh, why is it that we cannot articulate something that looks more like this progressive, redistributive, and democratic, uh, you know, vision of, of of government in 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 Latin America? Um, okay, <laughs> that, uh, so this is my remarks. I, I'll now switch to to asking a couple of questions to Vidi. So, Vidi, I wanted to ask you something about the compensation during COVID. Right. So this is a very specific question. Uh, uh, oh, I forgot. Sorry. 
I said I was going to go up here. The reason is I want you to realize, uh, Vidi said it at the beginning, I want to sit there because the microphone is too tall. This is what inequality looks like. <laughs> I wanted to stay here, uh, but I wanted to actually move to a, ta to a chair next to Vidi in a, in a minute. But, but I wanted you to notice what inequality looks like. And we just normalize it. We just think it's okay that I'm standing up here and she's sitting down there. Um, we normalize inequality in so many aspects of our life, even in the way we set up a podium or set up a, a table. Um, sorry, so I, I, I forgot <laughs> that I wanted to mention that. I, can, can I can I get a chair? Yeah. <laughs> So really, good question is. Okay. okay, the question is really, why did AMLO probably do the most stingy compensation <laughs> right. of any country in Latin America during the time of the okay. COVID? So I think that, can, can, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. So um, first about the remarks on inequality in the podium, I think that, you know, this could be simply solved by a policy solution, which is having a little banquito right there. So people that are short can, you know, jump in. And I think that would be very, you know, pro pro female because we tend to be shorter. Uh, so yeah, that, that is true, right? Just like a banquito. Uh, but, but well, uh, so like a tiny bench that you stand up, you know. Um, that's a wonderful question. And I think Alberto, that that speaks a lot to what you were formerly mentioned, right? Which is why Hamlo has so low ambitious, right? Like, because on, on the paper, he seemed to be very ambitious on his plans. But in reality, what we observe is a very, is a government that is really not delivering. And that part of the reason why it's not delivering is because it hasn't dared to, for example, conduct a dramatic uh, fiscal reform or to, you know, properly tax the rich or change the the, you know, the health system and so on, right? And I feel that AMLO, sadly as it will sound, but I believe this, I think AMLO is kind of like the perfect son of, of neoliberalism. AMLO is like, you know, the perfect example of what happens after the decades of neoliberalism, where the expectations of people about what the government can do are, are like, you know, brought to the minimum. And I, I feel that AMLO comes from that, comes from thinking that there is really, comes he's defeated. He thinks that the government is already something that is never going to work. He thinks that if you tax the rich, they are going to complain in the USMCA and panels, which will happen. And they would, you know, sue the Mexican government for billions of dollars. He didn't want to change the mining law that you were referring to is part of this problem of royalties in land. Because he said, if I do that, then, you know, mining companies in Canada are going to sue the Mexican government and it's going to cost us billions of dollars, billions of dollars, because, you know, that's what we sign on the USMCA. And, you know, what is the alternative for a country like Mexico? Not signing the USMCA? You know, <laughs> that's just like impossible, right? So I feel that he comes from this idea that the state is already defeated. And us that we think about the state, you know, uh, we're thinking about a state that we really never have seen, right? <laughs> like when we, when we think about Latin America and the and, and the state that we want, that's that's imagination, that's fantasy. That state has never been there. No, nothing tells us that that state is ever gonna exist. It's just ideology, right? Like we we like to believe that that state may work. Amlo is brutally, you know, simple. He's like, that state doesn't exist. It's very unclear that we're gonna be capable of forming that state. And therefore what we can do is act on the margins. And that's, that's his COVID policy. His COVID policy was, you know, I have little money to spend, I'm gonna use it. He created a microcredit, very stingy microcredit that was given to people, some cost, no reason to return the money. And then he closed the economy for, he closed the country uh, for like three months. And then he had this speech that I think we should study on history books where he says, you know what? Mexico cannot remain closed because Mexico is a poor country. And if we close the country more, people are gonna die of hunger, right? And I think that that's just the perfect example of a politician that is already de defeated. That he, he, he really has no expectation of, 
you know, is spending more money because he thinks that at the end, the Mexican government is would be punished by the capital markets, which is actually happening in other countries in Latin America, when the countries that increase their debt and so on, right? So I, I'm, I'm not with AMLO. I want a government that is more uh, ambitious, real ambitiousness, you know? I want to believe that the state that AMLO is doing is not the state that we, that we need and is not the only state that we can have. But I think that, you know, that's, you know, that's hope. But we don't know that state. Can I can I ask you a second question and then we'll we'll open up to to Q and A. I, I I don't know how we're doing on timing. I I, I lost track. But uh, okay. So can I ask one more question? Um. So this is a question about the minimum wage uh, effects, and and it's striking because it's it's really a puzzle. I mean, you pointed it out a little bit in in your comments that we need to study it further. But it seems to have made very little dent on the average wages in one of the graphs you had earlier. And I wanted to ask you, you know, whether whether one of the challenges is that while economists were wrong that the minimum wage was not going to generate, you know, massive unemployment and the yeah. kind of things that people were discussing, in many ways it was not really binding on the economy. Um, I suspect, and that's why you don't see such a big dent on 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 average average wages. Uh, so it's just a puzzle that I I cannot really right. grab my mind around it. So that's 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 a great uh, that's a great question again. Uh, so I would I would say that this this is because of two two things right well three things i would say one is that uh only 50 percent of the population works in mexico so and that's a normal rate regularly you know if you look at the uh, población economicamente activa which is people working for some form of wage in most countries with the exception of a few european countries only half of the population works because you know you have the elderly you have young you have females that sometimes cannot join the labor force. So that's, you know, one part of it. You would need to increase the minimum wage, not only to support the person that is making the minimum wage, but the whole house, household. So we would need to see way more than this. The second one is that um, the, the minimum wage applies only to the formal market, which is 50% of the population working, right? So you are already talking about 25% of the population. Right. And the third one is that uh, among the people that happen to work in that are in the formal economy, you know, only a, a group of those earn the minimum wage. So at the end, you are end up with a policy that is increasing wages for six million people. But Mexico is a country of 120 million people. Right. So so this is revealing of the limits of the, the policies that we demand, right? When we demand policies that to reduce inequality, we cannot just re remain demanding increases in the minimum wage. We need to, that's why it's so important to talk about market competition, the creation of new companies, the support for small businesses, you know, taxation for the wealthy, a universal health system, perfect and, you know, amazing education on public institutions and so on, right? Like it's a, it's a bundle of things. And he has done great on labor. Like I think that, you know, if you have told me the only thing AMLO is going to do is increase the minimum wage 88%, I would have said, mm, okay, finally, let's just, you know, let's just vote for this guy. You know, <laughs> it's just like, okay, fine. <laughs> but, you know, it's just like we, we needed more. <laughs> we open to the, please. I think they need you on the microphone because of the streaming. Thank you so much. This was awesome. Um, um, so I, I have two questions, but I'll ask one first. So um, thinking about the, um, I, I was really curious when we got to your, you know, you, you went back to your first prompt. So what, how many people now support AMLO, right? Right. Is there, a, are you aware of how this is distributed? Uh, maybe along the same mm -hmm. uh, socioeconomic categories mm -hmm. or ethnic, racial, or mm -hmm. political leanings? Because mm -hmm. I'm really curious who supports them. Yeah, I mean, it, the poor support AMLO. It's, for example, one of the most interesting maps that I'm sure you have seen, Alberto, is 
how Mexico City voted in 2021, which is the midterm election, right? And there is almost perfect correlation between income levels in different districts of the city uh, and the vote for AMLO. So th that's why, you know, when I read the, I'm, I'm very concerned about the news in the US because when I read the Atlantic, the New Yorker, the New York Times, arguing that AMLO is a dictator, I'm wondering who they are talking to. I'm wondering why they haven't get the right sources, or at least they haven't get the right, you know, the, the kind of like the whole picture. And I think that partially, and this is very, very sad, but I think partially is because to speak English in a country like Mexico, you already need to be kind of like from a privileged background or, you know, be kind of like a complete outsider. So uh, like, you know, kind of like something that doesn't really happen. So I feel that the U.S., the press in the U.S. is making wrong decisions on how they cover Mexico because the majority of Mexicans approve AMLO. And you, you observe these, you know, differences in, in both and income that are very, in, very, very intense. And this happens too in academia. There is a very famous poll that shows how as students, we don't we don't have the numbers about academics, but students in public universities approve AMLO like by far, right? While students in, students in private universities believe that AMLO is authoritarian and is a dictator. And if you talk to the people in the elites, which are not even the elites, it's just the middle classes, right? But the middle class in Mexico is very small, as I show you. So if you talk to people from the middle classes in Mexico, they truly believe that AMLO is authoritarian and that the other people are not understanding because they are ignorant, right? And so, so then this, you know, it's a very difficult conversation to have right now because if you are going to assume that, you know, 60% of the population is ignorant, then just transit to authoritarianism. Like, you know, why, why would you have a democracy? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'll save my other question. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. The presentation was um, incredible, and I um, I just kept thinking about how familiar, how similar in Mexico and Colombia with AMLO and Petro um, and their governments um, are. Because, um, but I'm not going to concentrate on that. I wanted to ask you if you think that because this is a criticism that I also have with Petro's government is the lack of uh, a very much more feminist view of. Um, the situation that is affecting their country. And I didn't see in your presentation, and it was not part of my presentation, but I I feel that um, when I was in Colombia last year, I actually met people from Morena and because they were supporting, I mean, they, for us, Pacto Histórico and Colombia Humana, they were kind of our um, guide in, in a way, right? And and I saw several women, right? And so I'm thinking one of the criticisms that I have for Petro is that his views are very patriarchal and that he has not given a space for more women to, uh, even though he had an, a, a, you know, equality kind of, kind of um, government, the problem is that some of those policies are not with a lens of, you know, a, a women's view or a feminist view. And I feel that that is seen in some of the policies that AMLO has. So wanted to have kind of your perspective in that sense. Yeah, I mean, AMLO is not a feminist. And I, and I feel that this is partially because he is he is raised in a in a in a former form of left that it was all about labor, labor and capital. Right. So the main cleavage, the main cleavage for AMLO is uh, labor, the, the struggle between labor and capital and feminism and other forms of identity politics for him are the result of the disempowerment of workers and of the contamination of the left agenda by neoliberalism. That's how he observes this, right? So then for him, uh, the, the reason why women are oppressed is not that they are females, is that they don't have money, right? Is that they cannot battle capital. And I think that this is, you know, kind of like out of touch. Of, of course, like he should be more multidimensional multi and understand that there is the struggles of labor and capital and also the struggles of other forms of identity. But I think that he really doesn't uh, understand that. Now, in Mexico, most people don't understand that either. If like Mexico is not a very feminist population, it's not like, you know, most people are against abortion even today, you know, it's just like, it's, it's not a society that has moved to, you know, uh, 
more modern uh, form of understanding of the left agenda is still kind of like on the very basics of like, you know, wages and or labor organization, you know, the, the more traditional left. And, you know, adding to that is all of the conservatism that Alberto was mentioning that he actually believes that, and he has said that the best uh, welfare institution is the family, which is, you know, kind of like, like, you know, from the seventies, no, not even from like 19th century, right? So, because, you know, it's not the family, it's like females working without payment, right? <laughs> that are the, the support and of the lack of uh, a welfare institution. So, you know, let me, but let me tell you a story because uh, I think this is gonna, this is gonna give you hope because it did to me, hopefully, which is that I was in a meeting of really radical feminists that voted for Morena. <laughs> and this is a big meeting in like Iztapalapa. It's like, you know, hundreds of females. And it's just like, they are talking about, you know, radical, radical things. Like they need to, you know, move into an agenda of the destruction of capitalism because capitalism is oppression and is a patriarchy and very young, very, also very well collected, like, you know, fascinating, super articulated. And I'm, and then, you know, one of them takes the microphone and says, you know, we know that AMLO is not a, is not a feminist. We know that AMLO does not understand what we are discussing here right now. But what is the alternative? Vote for the right wing opposition? <laughs> like, give me a break, you know? So, so I feel that the feminist movement is kind of like understanding that under the current uh, distribution of alternatives, kind of like AMLO is the best they have. And at least is probably the one that it would be better into moving into an agenda or more redistribution that eventually would be helpful for them. Now, let me just finish with one thing, uh, which Alberto was mentioning, what is Morena, right? Like what wh what is that thing, right? I feel that Morena, increasingly I classify it as a, as a celebrity movement, right? Because it's not, it's not a movement. I mean, it is a movement, right? In the sense that you do have people on the base moving in favor of Morena, like this is, this is real, right? Like it happens, you go to, to places in Mexico and they are Morenistas, they, you know, they love Lopez Obrador, but, but that's, that's the key, they love Lopez Obrador. So it's a celebrity movement and, and celebrity movements have one, one big problem, which is that they are not accountable, right? Because once the celebrity leaves, who is gonna, you know, who is gonna take responsibility? And also the celebrity itself doesn't take responsibility in the case of Mexico. So it's like, it's, it's, it's problematic. We don't know what Moreno is going to turn out to, to be in the future. Can I, can I add one thing, Diego? I indulge. Uh, it's really indulgence. Uh, I, I, I do want to say something about this uh, aspect. There's, there's something that we did not talk about, but AMLO has also this evangelical streak, which is very important, I think, for understanding Latin America these days. Uh, the populists who have been elected in Latin America, from ranging from Bolsonaro to AMLO, have this very peculiar link with with the evangelical movements and uh, and the role of women. Uh, you know, is, is is very different if if you think about that particular base of support. So that's kind of an additional paradox. Uh, but I think it's throughout the region, Central America is where also the, this is very very strong. Um, and I do want to say one more thing, which is, you know, it, it, at it's similar to when when Vidi said, you know, I would rather vote for AMLO uh, if 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 the one thing he does is the minimum wage. Well, at least there's six million people that are better off today than than they were, uh, you know, four years ago. Um, when I think about the alternatives we have right now, I I did see in the airport in San in San Cristobal in in Tuxla Gutierrez in in Chiapas. I saw Mar uh, Claudia Sheinbaum arriving to the airport there. It just happened to be the case that she arrived. There were all these women receiving her, uh, welcoming her. Uh, it was an incredible energy and excitement about her there. Everybody has told me Sheinbaum is so uncharismatic and so, you know, unattractive and whatever. And I think there's a dose of misogyny behind that. Mm -hmm. When I saw her there in the airport, I thought, you know, if you ask me, there's no question for me that this is the one I would prefer among the two Morena candidates right now, but that's my little advertisement. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> John, sorry for, for being the person who's playing this role of interrupting these very interesting conversations. Thank you so much for a very, very interesting and relevant uh, conversation to the four presenters this morning. Now we have a break. Do we have a burrito lunch there for everyone, including attendees and, and presenters? And we will uh, reconvene here at 1 p.m. to continue with the with our set of presentations. That's yeah, that's a very good idea. So we have a beautiful, we're very proud of uh, our arboretum here. So if you just walk, uh, you know, ask a local, a person who has like UC Davidson will point you in the direction, direction, take a little walk. It's a beautiful place to to take a break. Thank you, everybody. Gracias. We have wonderful burritos in the lobby, so please join us. And if everybody agrees, I would like to let the presenters probably go first. <laughs> Thank you.
two. Porque si, si te escucha por la bocina del computer y sabe por las opciones, se hace un loop y hace feed. Oh. Juan, pa Juan Pablo, ¿me escuchas? Hola, sí. Hola, sí. ¿Qué tal? ¿Qué tal? Okay, okay. So um, we are we are here. We're about to start. So um, uh, do you prefer that we pre that we um, press the button and, and play the presentation that you recorded, or do you want to do it live? Yeah, if you can do the former, that that would be better. I'm, I mean, I'm not in a in the best place uh, uh, absolutely. to present. Uh, absolutely. Um, absolutely. So I, I think it will it will run better if if, if you just press Muy play. Muy uh, Muy and I'll be here. I mean, for the for the exchange with with uh, Christian and. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Muy, uh, muy bien. Thanks so much. Okay. Yeah. So so I'll, so I'll mute myself, right? You yeah, mute yourself and uh, and uh, you will be hearing yourself. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I... No, está, está muy bien, Juan Pablo, no te preocupes. Un abrazo. Hablamos, hablamos un abrazo también. Hablamos. So let's, let's just give me a hold
Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Um, so we are here, we're continuing our event. Now we have another set of presenters. And as I announced, we're going to start with uh, with Chile. For this country, we have two, uh, two Chilean presenters. The first is uh, Professor Juan Pablo Luna, who uh, is not with us uh, today. He he was planning to come, but he had some some uh, family uh, issues that he had to take care of. But uh, he recorded his presentation, so we're gonna uh, just press the button and, and uh, enjoy his presentation that way. And after that, we will have uh, uh, Dr. Christian Ballet, Ballet, who will be uh, responding. So let me just read a couple of things about them. Also, very accomplished scholars. Uh, Juan Pablo Luna is professor of political science at the Pontificia Uni uh, Universidad Católica de Chile and principal investigator of, with the Millennium Institute for Foundational Research on Data and with the uh, Biodemos, which is another institute uh, on violence and in democracy. He's interested in partition politics and representation, the, the effects of inequality. There goes again, that, that uh, that's a theme that we probably should uh, bring back during the, the round table and methodology in political sciences. His books include dot, 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 many of them. Uh, he has uh, been awarded many, many prestigious uh, uh, recognitions. One of them is a Guggenheim, Una is a, an award of the Guggenheim Foundation. Um, he has had, he has held visiting appointments at various universities in, uh, in this country, including, I see Ivy Leagues here all over. So very accomplished. Uh, uh, a scholar, um, and um, the response is going to be by Christian Belay, as associate researcher at, uh, of the Center for Advanced Research in Education, and assistant professor in the Department of Sociology at the University of Chile. He previously previously worked. Also, he had a life, uh, a past life at, as a at the Chilean Minister of Education and UNICEF in Chile. His main research areas are educational policy, school effectiveness, and school improvement. He has published uh, ex extensively about uh, uh, quality and equity in Chilean education. Also many books. Um, his doctorate is, is from uh, Harvard, the second Harvard graduate hey, of our, our panel set of presenters. So uh, join me in welcoming uh, our presenters. So, uh, of course. So we're going to have uh, uh, the record the presentation of uh, Professor Luna first.
contexts. Yeah. Well, we have seen in Latin America during the last three, four decades, cut to what And what do we have today? Essentially, most of the other parts that were in the early time, the same thing we have been doing for in the process of the What we have now is what in recent. And some of the others have been called the of the angels. And essentially, what we have in the American American is for the American leadership. Um, so, this is the uh, different systems in the region. I think you can see the Okay. 
Uh, 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 the first three presidential terms uh, the last the last in the presidential terms in each That's uh, in each and what you have here is the number of bonds that on average Where is the 
uh, you are elected and before 10 months, you already are, are, are facing problems. Right? And what you have on the right is different presidencies in, 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 in Chile. It's compression, right? You see this pattern. It's consolidated to one near uh, Bachelet. Yeah, in which, uh, and, and I did this sometime ago, so it's not, uh, that's not include the whole premier period and, 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 and now orange. But it's further compressed and compressed uh, as uh, we get to, to, to uh, the One of these universities in, 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 in the country. And for the social prize of, of 2019, and that future was taken. And that future was taken. And that future was taken.
Societies that are very close, this uh, huge inequalities, not only those in terms of different citizenship rights that have to do with social rights, uh, with civil rights, with political rights, and the way those are practiced in, in society or, or enjoy and, and, and lead to, to, to society. Uh, Try to expand this uh, analysis to Latin America uh, with Rodrigo Miller, which just published an article that
Districts for political representation and the left. Right. Where I, I, I want to, to uh, wrap up with, with the challenge. Essentially, politicians are increasingly able to start the plan. Legitimacy because this is so tense that are very difficult to 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 set uh, the story of legitimacy very powerfully. Conditions are increasingly unable to compress and simplify space. The representation yeah. in, in, in the region. Some of the case uh, and switch to let uh, see the, the social rights of 2019 looks like. What I'm understanding as a threat has to do with Republican history 
how well it were uh, evident uh, elected bodies and uh, parliaments in for, for the bank register. And you see suddenly a uh, crossing is done here. So the left elevation was popular in the elevation which was Uh, 
So from from Pablo's joining us through Zoom from uh, from Uruguay, I believe, with uh, where he is right now. Now we have a Christian Belay with his response. I call a PowerPoint presentation to call um, Paolo's presentation. Uh, but I, I will anyway, thank you um, for coming and thank you for inviting me. Um, and I am very sorry that Paolo is not hearing us because I admire the role of Juan Paolo. Uh, and as you, can, uh, you have seen, uh, he's a wonderful scholar and he has a very broad view of Latin American issues and also uh, human issues of all the world. Hi, Juan Pablo. I was talking about all my wonderful work. Hi, uh, everyone. Sorry, sorry. 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 Uh, following what you're saying, uh, but I don't know if someone from the tech table can help us with that. And I'm do I don't know if my my mic is sounding okay or, or is there the noise there? I'm sorry about that. Yeah, that's not all the way. So all the way for him. Um, 
So I, 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 I will provide you some resources from the chair. Okay, so uh, this is the, um, this is the bottom line. Um, first of all, uh, Chile has been um, very, you know, in Chile, and uh, the, the social movement in general, and specifically the student movement, have been extremely active. And for Paulo, in some of my, I, I read his paper, uh, in some line of his paper, for Paulo asked us, as a lawyer, uh, why the Chilean students, Chilean Jews, are protesting in the streets so strongly, and they are the kind of privilege, uh, the privilege generation because they have had access to uh, education and other um, benefit of the, of the development uh, better than any other previous generation. So why this kind of privileged generation protest so strongly in the streets? And actually, he's right. Uh, I have uh, published some papers uh, showing where oh, I have this. Why they are protesting on the, the streets? You see, if they are the, the poor generation. Uh, and actually, they have protested a lot. Uh, and you can see, uh, after the period of the regime, after the strategy, we have 30, 30 years of uh, protest uh, events in, 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 in promoted by the, the university and high school students in Chile. So it's very active. But in the last uh, 15 years, they have increased, they have been massively, they have increased the participation of the, of each of the, um, um, protest events. Uh, we have an average of 30 university student protests by year. Uh, but as you can see on the graph, the amount of people, students protesting in the street has gone from, uh, something like a couple of, uh, hundred students in the streets to now on average, 30,000, 40,000 students in each, on average, in each of these 30 um, protest events each year. Uh, and this is just the university student, we have an also graph, we, can, we have analyzed the highest cost to the movement. So why, why this uh, privilege uh, group of, of, of children in society is protesting so strongly? And, and I think, uh, Juan Paul is right, uh, but I, I want to complement some of, of his analysis. Uh, I think the way in which the new generation of children and uh, youth has access to the education, particularly in high school, but also um, university uh, studies, uh, has been uh, shaped by, by the market logic of which the system has developed since the uh, dictatorship in the 80s reform, which was marked by uh, the neoliberalism, um, the neoliberal ideology. So we have, have access to a very different system than the previous generation, a system in which this uh, is highly receiving the prioritized, uh, with high pressures in relation to the uh, to children, uh, family income, we have 
one of the most uh, expensive uh, 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 programs in the world. Uh, most of the universities have for-profit companies, uh, so the system, and, and uh, for example, to the middle class and lower middle class, um, the, 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 the tuition has been paid by loans. That was managed by private banking, uh, supported by the state, but managed by the private banking. So uh, the money is uh, going to uh, for profit universities and to banks, but the loans and uh, the debts and the students uh, uh, face the study that were very large debts. So the educational system uh, possessing this social right is actually organized in a way that is um, the opposite side of the traditional way of, of seeing uh, human rights, social rights. Um, so in this sense, related to Juan Pablo's analysis, uh, the protests are both, are also of both some objective situation, the ones very difficult to pay, because the labor market didn't provide the returns expected to pay the loan with very high uh, tuitions. Uh, but also in general, in general, some kind of subjective interpretation of this. I have to put more effort than the past generation to be in the same way in the worst, in the worst compared to the, in the worst situation compared to the previous generation. So, um, the children do this increasingly perceive that China is a less democratic, a less meritocratic society uh, than the past. And this is a trend we have been seeing uh, systematically. Even if they have objective, more objective opportunities, they perceive that they are living in a less meritocratic society than before. This is my first point. So how to interpret it, uh, how to interpret uh, social movements when you have this kind of situation that you have to combine objective and subjective uh, interpretations to understand the people uh, in the street. Okay. Let me go to the second point. Uh, Juan Pablo mentioned that it's very difficult, has been very difficult for Latin American uh, social movements to the political system. in the long term. And that's, uh, and that's of course, uh, very true. But uh, I, I will have a story. It's a different story. They have been extremely successful, and they are uh, in, in this way, in, in institutionalizing the protest and then the power, the social power and the political power, and transforming this in political power. Um, and they are not just a kind of anti-government or anti-everything uh, movement. Uh, and this has been um, for 15 years. It's not just a kind of uh, short-term event. It's a 15 years process, starting in 2006 with the high school student movement, 2011 with the university student movement. Some of them were participating in both movements. And then the, the leaders were going to the parliament. They work in the parliament. Uh, they created political parties. So they are uh, building strong social and political and academic coalitions to support the changes they are promoting. They are working, in, they have been working in the social media, in the public arena to change people's mind and to relate with the with different uh, constituencies in different parts of the country. So new social movements, not, now not just related to education, but environmental issues, social issues has been um, very active in Chile since then. So I, I will argue that they have been very successful in constructing this kind of general social anti anti commodification. We will say is the is the is the common uh, idea here, because they started in education, but the health issue, the social security issue, they, they are the same. You you can see the neoliberal uh, ideology corrupting all of these uh, social rights in Chile. And the, the, common, the common idea here is how to create a um, welfare state uh, that is outside of the market of the, neo, the neoliberal uh, way of thinking uh, or providing services. Um, and actually, uh, it's not only Gabriel Boric as a president. Some of his main ministers are also previous students, leaders, university students, leaders. Um, so I, I, I think they um, 
successfully created uh, not just social movement, but political coalitions to institutionalize power. Of course, Juan Pablo is right. Uh, times are very difficult. And all of these uh, general trends that you have seen affecting previous um, Chilean governments are now even more, uh, more uh, severe uh, uh, in, in processing Gabriel Boric's power. But the future is uncertain. I would say that uh, this coalition, the current coalition, has been um, during the 20th century maybe the second most uh, most successful uh, student movement moving to the general political arena in just uh, a couple of uh, 20 years, 15 years, only compared to the Democratic uh, Party, the, the Christian Democratic Party in the 50s and 60s. Uh, but they were also saying at that time that they will go in for 30, year, 30 years, and they just won one presidential election, Eduardo Frey uh, Montalva before Allende. Uh, so. Is, and, and they and they were the the, the most relevant um, renewal of Chilean politics in 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 the after the Second World War, World War II. Uh, so I, I I will give more time to Gabriel Boric and his uh, uh, previous student movement, now political movement, uh, to 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 make a final uh, evaluation. But what is uh, especially I, 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 I previously say, previously say is that the, the general trends have been more severe with um, treating Gabriel Boric. And I, and I agree with that um, because I agree with the analysis of Juan Pablo, which, uh, which is that um, some structural uh, features uh, of, the, of the, our society, capitalist, advanced capitalist society, you're saying advanced in the sense of, of uh, a very radical neoliberal economy, which is the Chilean case, uh, creates a very difficult structural situation uh, for, uh, le for legitimizing public policies oriented to uh, provide uh, social rights to the population. Uh, um, but uh, I think in, the, in Juan Pablo's analysis, it's not totally clear how this um, weakness of the state uh, capacities uh, has been created by the very policies implementing the neoliberal reforms. So uh, promoted by the state policies, the private sector have been, has increased his power enormously. But most of these areas has been promoted by specific state policies that are privatizing um, housing policies, uh, health policies, also educational policies. For example, um, in education, we provide universal vouchers and we provide vouchers even for for-profit companies, for-profit organizations providing educational services. So the, the public uh, education has decreased a lot and uh, now the power is in the hands of private companies providing education, but they have been funded by public money for for years, when the system, when when the Chilean politicians wanted to increase the quality of educational of education in Chile, they didn't uh, um, increase the capacity of the public servants to do that. They created a market of consultants, private consultants, for-profit consultants, and they provide pa provided public money for these private consultants. And you can you can have. Many, many, many examples, similar examples. So when after 40 years, a progressive coalition, not just Gabriel Boric, but previously Michelle Bachelet also wanted to use the state power to provide, to, to design and implement uh, public policies oriented to a uh, more egalitarian way of um, implementing uh, social, the access of, uh, to social services, they, uh, see themselves in a very difficult situation because they don't have the state power to implement this effectively, but also they have to negotiate all the reforms with a private, private sector that now is, in my opinion, the most powerful stakeholders in all of these social uh, fields, that, uh, especially in education and also in, all, in other fields. Uh, so market dynamics are still there. So you wanted to, to 
to change the market dynamics, but using, but you have to work, you have to play in the market logic. The best example is precisely uh, a consequence of the university student movement. They were asking for free university. So when Michel Bachelet, I'm not talking about Boric now, but previous progressive government wanted to provide free public education, she couldn't do it because it's in, unconstitutional. So they have to provide the same money to the private uh, universities also. So uh, now you have a very, very expensive program of free university, but most of this money is going to the private sector, not the public sector. So it's not public as, as in the first uh, photograph picture I, I show you, it's not free public education. Now it's free education, but it's mostly private education funded by uh, the very uh, Michel Bachelet reform. So you are kind of trapped in this um, market logics. So is there a way out of neoliberalism? We don't know. Um, final point, we are uh, on time. Um, sociocultural issues. Also, Juan Pablo talked in his paper and other uh, work um, that is not just structural limitations, the weak, weakness of the state, in my point, uh, the, the power of the private stakeholders, but also some cultural issues are here. Because when you live in a radical neoliberal society like Chile has been for the last 40 years, um, who is seeking for the public good? There is a new common sense. And the common sense is that you as a private entity, as a family or as a person, you have to fight for your um, uh, best, best position in the market, not just a collective uh, issue in the, in the social arena. So for example, um, in, in Chile, we have a universal voucher program uh, in, in high school and, prim and primary school. Um, we, can, we have conducted a lot of uh, research on the way in which uh, families um, exercise a school choice and it's heavily social class uh, related, but in a very specific way in the first, uh, the first quote you can see there, uh, the theory of the market say that family will choose the best school for uh, for their children, but families are not educational experts. So they, uh, what, what can they see and evaluate? Not the quality of the service, but the quality of the peers, the families of the peers. So as you can see there, um, they don't want to discriminate. I don't want to discriminate, say, a, 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 a um, new middle class, I would say, uh, mother. Um, but I think that the requirement of money is also important because this discriminates against a certain type of people, children with bad education or family problems. So the fact that there is a little bit of money excludes a huge amount of people. So she don't want free education. She don't want free education. So when Michelle Bachelet announces that she, announced that she will uh, implement the policies that the students, there's <laughs> the son and daughter, the children of this family were asking in the street, the parents were not so happy. I will provide free education. So uh, it, it's just um, public money which will fund high schools and primary school, but the families say, no, no, I want to add some money. I want price discrimination also. And uh, so it was a huge debate in Chile where this, this way of thinking about um, about the school choice is compatible with the idea of egalitarian education. And then you have a lot of discrimination in the in the admission processes of the school. Families with poor, uh, poor background, um, lower cultural background, uh, single mothers, um, people with no the same religion that the owner of the school. So a lot of discrimination in the admission process. So Bachelet again, wanted to create a kind of online, uh, non-discriminatory random assignment uh, system for um, distributing uh, students among schools. But again, you have a, a strong opposition in the new middle class, because as you have, have read, I don't have enough time, um, mothers and fathers of this uh, social segment wanted to differentiate from others 
below, but it's always a relative terms, uh, that they think don't have the moral uh, commitment with good education for their children. So they want a discrimination and don't want a system that is random assigned um, based on random assignments on the idea that every child, every child is have the equal right to education. So I think um, it's very difficult in this kind of situation implement policies focus on uh, a kind of traditional way of welfare state, uh, public policies focus on the justice and not just the private competition for um, for advantage and not just a common commonality of social rights. Okay, thank you. I have a question to Juan Pablo. Uh, Juan Pablo uh, analyzed the, the result, the, the, the process of the constitutional um, the, the constitutional process of creating a new constitution in Chile, which is part of the result of the social movement. Uh, but I want to, to hear um, more, Juan Pablo, how do you see the unexpected uh, rejection of the constitutional proposal? And how do you relate uh, this rejection with, this, with all these uh, very complicated structural and cultural issues in Chile? Uh, thanks, Christian, and thanks also for, for, for the comments that I, I finally was, was able to hear. So thanks so much also to the technicians that made this possible. Um, let me like address some of the issues you mentioned in, the, in your response and, and in that way also try to, to address your question. Uh, I think something that it's very important that this youngster did uh, and I think it will last longer than, and, and I completely agree with your point on that, uh, than, than this president. It had to do with uh, a transition of uh, protesting in the street without voting that was very uh, clearly uh, dominating in, in the early 2000s to a situation in which they not only protest, but they also vote and they also build uh, a political party, right? And, and, and that's an important outcome of, 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 of this process. In that process, they also, I mean, the youngsters also uh, produce what uh, a colleague of mine, Sergio Toro, calls uh, inverse socialization, right? They, particularly in the popular sectors, youngsters were very actively uh, convincing their parents and grandparents to vote and to engage in politics. Uh, and this was people that were not being voted for, for and, and being not, uh, were not engaging in politics for, for a long time, right? So uh, there is also a politicization of older generations that has to do with this uh, uh, electoral mobilization of, of, of youngsters. And as Christian said, this mobilization had to do with uh, 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 different issues that related in different ways to consequences of the economic model that was enacted by the dictatorship and that was kind of maintained during uh, the, the, the after the transition to democracy. Right. In this way, uh, the the youngsters and the uh, like student movement created a, a, a cultural victory in terms of like. Uh, uh, putting into question, bringing into question the, uh, the, the, the economic model. And that provided, I would say, the, the interpretation for the social rights of 2017 and 19, and the motivation of the political class that was caught in, in offside to uh, like see the constitution and the constitutional process as a, as a way to address that demand that was like all over the place, no one could, really define it, but something had to do with the model. The model was um, institutionalized in the constitution. So we had to uh, uh, like change the constitution. Um, and in this context, this, this kind of destituent assembly got, uh, got elected. Uh, but my sense then is that two things happen, right? And this has to do with, with Christian question, Christian's all last question. One has to do with uh, the, the context change, right? right? 
uh, you have the pandemic, economic distress, the security crisis being kind of like uh, uh, taking over the, the, the agenda, immigration is starting to create xenophobic reactions and that xenophobic reactions also uh, were like uh, triggered by the association between immigration and uh, new uh, challenges in terms of security. Uh, and that created an, uh, a rapid stretch in terms of uh, public opinion mood. Right? At the same time, the, the constituent Assam was priming and, and, and pushing for like uh, post-materialist issues. So what, what became post-materialist issues in the context of that uh, public opinion change, right? Which has to do with the environment, gender, like work issues, and uh, some uh, like um, uh, aspects of the of the of the economic model. And I think like that misfit between what ended up being the constitutional convention and, and public opinion uh, after this shock of the pandemic and all the other related things that, that I just mentioned uh, explains part of what, what, what we saw in the referendum. The other thing, and, and this was very clear in, in uh, focus groups and qualitative interviews we did in the popular sectors is that at the beginning, the people expected the constitutional convention to create a new political game, a new political class that was more responsive, right? And that was closer to them, that uh, took care of them, et cetera. And even, so, even though the, the, the traditional political class saw the new political class uh, as very different from that, uh, and, and they were very different, particularly in terms of ethnic, uh, ethnicity and class, right? Uh, the popular sector saw the constitutional convention representatives as behaving uh, in a similar way as the uh, traditional political class had behaved before, right? In, 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 some, in, in, in a certain way, the, political, the, the new political class of the constitutional convention representatives were seen as abandoning society not being responsive to like uh, those that voted for them and voted them into office. And I think that too explains the, the result of the, of the referendum that we saw uh, last September. Uh, and just to, to wrap it up, I, I think it's a very important point and, and uh, if you wish, you, you can call it the, the, the neoliberal trap. And I think we are in agreement with Christian on this, is that Chilean society is a society in which there are no public goods, right? And uh, without public goods, you cannot anchor solid political coalitions, right? Solid and stable political coalitions, right? Because people organizing around public goods, right? and that's what kind of enables political parties to vertebrate uh, constituencies and, 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 and electoral coalitions that last. For, 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 for that longer, right? Uh, and there is no way to do that in contemporary Chile, in my view, and that's part of kind of the limitation we're seeing, right? Uh, this movement has created a leadership that will last, has created some political organizations that will last and will eventually continue to be important in, in, in Chilean politics. Uh, but uh, like in the short term, uh, like, crafting a, a more or less stable political coalition and alliance, it, it's very difficult to, to get. And just to, to summarize this in a way that I think makes sense, um, I always recall a, an interview um, someone had with a, a technocrat of, of the Pinochet regime. Uh, and uh, the interviewer asked her, uh, why did you decide to municipalize to, to shift to the municipal level, uh, education and health. Uh, and what she replied was, uh, the first reason she gave was, uh, well, we'd rather have 350 a small municipal union than having a one national union for teachers or uh, uh, physicians, right? So the political project of the 
economic reforms uh, like introduced by the dictatorship had uh, as it, one of its main aims to fragment uh, political coalitions uh, that uh, and, and, and and the effects of that uh, of, of, of those reforms are still uh, very uh, central to explain what what we see in Chile and and and, and, and its democratic fall. I'm, so, I'm sorry I have to to sort of interrupt the conversation here I want to open it up for for the public for at least one question hopefully waiting for a brief response so that we can move on yeah. thank you for that um and this might have there the, might be a counter example of Mexico I, I was in Chile in, in January and one impression I had was what you talked about compression, just this incredible impaciencia con Boric. Like a lot of people, progressive friends sort of expected, in my mind, too much too quickly. And I'm simplifying brutally here, just so I know we're short in time. New social movement, younger people were very critical of his government wasn't perfectly representative of the country. There were sufficient women despite having major gains. Then I talked to older friends, tr more traditional leftists, who said they're not attacking structurally neoliberalism, the, the the modes of production. And it just struck me as an outsider coming from the very dire, horrific, you know, politics in the United States as just impaciente and things like that. So when I saw your numbers, I guess my question would be: Is this something faced primarily in, in Petro comes to mind as well by the left, or also in the right, where it, at first I want to say Trump and Bolsonaro? did everything wrong and got away with murder, quite literally, but they were kicked out of office. Is this something specific to the left and maybe it's incredibly mosaic, broad coalition, or is it part of electoral politics that AMLO has sort of tricked us by having the you know people that that statistic you gave? So anyway, I know it's a broad question, but thank you. Thank you for the, the question. I, I, I would say, and my, my hypothesis is that this is uh, bro it applies more broadly than to, to leftist leaders, right? And I would even say that uh, populists today, unless they engage in like uh, democratic erosion and, and democratic backsliding you know, or whatever, however you want to call that, if they continue to contest elections and without like uh, uh, going the, the, the authoritarian route, they last less. Uh, and have less time than, uh, than 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 in the past, right? So, so I think this has essentially to do with a very fragmented, uh, like electoral uh, universe in which uh, candidate segment and put together an electoral coalition on election night, right? But the only thing that they have in common that night is essentially that they are voting against someone else or that they have a very specific uh, agenda that they wish this leader will eventually enable. But once in office, uh, that electoral coalition, that election night coalition that crystallized uh, by, 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 by at the polls start to uh, like uh, collapse, right? And, and uh, I think that that's not only uh, uh, something that you see for the left, but you also uh, see it for, for other types of leadership. But uh, that's my intuition, and, and uh, I, I'm more than willing to, to debate it and discuss it and, and explore it further. Thank you very much to our presenters. <laughs> Our, next, uh, our last uh, uh, pair of presenters uh, represent Brazil, uh, another case that, of course, is, uh, is part of this conversation about the left in Latin America. And for that, we have uh, first uh, Dr. Sinesio Feliciano Pesaña, better known for, to all of us who, who know him as Mestre Cobramansa. He's a Capoeira Angola Mestre and the founder of the Fundação Internacional de Capoeira Angola. Uh, perhaps the largest uh, Capoeira Angola organization in the world, along with uh, 
his mestre and others in Bahia, he spearheaded a movement of revitalization of Capoeira Angola during the 1980s and 1990s, forming uh, mo some of the most important mestres uh, of Capoeira Angola of the next generation. In addition of all that, he was uh, uh, his, uh, he was co-investigator in the project The Angolan Roots of Capoeira, uh, which produced the acclaimed documentary Jogo do Corpo, uh, Jogo de Corpo uh, in 2013, co-directed with Matias Rorin, Asun Sound, and Richard pa Papleca. This is a documentary that was actually recently uh, liberated for the uh, on, on YouTube, so you can go and watch it. It's, it's a wonderful piece. Uh, he recently completed a PhD in education from the Universidad Federal de Bahia, and he's also the leader of and founder of uh, an intentional community called Quilombo Tenonde in, in Bahia. Uh, that practices and promotes environmentalism, sustainability, and permaculture. His presentation today is yet about, about another facet of his work, which is his involvement with grassroots mob movements uh, in Brazil, more specifically the Mo Movimento Negro and Movimento Sem Terra. The respondent is going to be Professor Cliff Welsh, who is visiting us in this moment. He's based in Santa Cruz, but he's uh, more permanently based, based in Sao Paulo, where, he, where he's a uh, uh, professor at Universidad Federal de São Paulo. His PhD is for, uh, in Latin American history from Duke University. Um, his work is mainly on agroecology and the, uh, the history of the ag agroecology movement in California with a special, a special emphasis on transnational influences. He has authored and co-authored several books. Uh, I don't know which one I should mention. There are so many here. Uh, Geoffrey Correa Neto, Capitan Capoins. Is that a good one? I'm sure it is. So um, many, many, many awards, many, many kinds of things that uh, successful academics have. And um, so let's welcome Mr. Cobramanza with his presentation. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to everyone who is here. I want to say thank you to Juan Diego to invite me. But um, first of all, I wanted to say thank you to my ancestors who brought me and they gave me strength and they make me think my ancestrality. And the, I hope. I could represent them on the best way I can because the, my life and the way I was raised, I was not supposed to be here today. I came from a very poor family, fatherless. And by the statistic of Brazil, I was not supposed to be nowhere when I get by 21 years old. And uh, I broke all the statistics they gave it to me. And uh, I say thank you to my ancestors, but basically I wanted to say thank you to Capoeira because there's one who gave me a space between the last space they gave me on the way I born. And uh, me and my friend now the group of 30 people, 12 of them, decided to do capoeira. And we are going to commemorate on September 50 years of life. That means we was one who decided to overcome poverty. And the, our dream is from the trash through the internationalization. Do lixão para internacionalização. Um, my presentation is going to be on my experience um, on these 45 years. I have been not just doing capoeira, but with the black movements, landless people, and many other things that get involved. 
And this is going to be the challenge redefinition of the left in America Latina. On the first, I wanted to say this denomination, left and the right, like someone told you here, I think it's too anachronic, it's too old, and it's, it's don't represent anymore what we have today as government called left. Um, because of that, I, I'm going to use like popular movement. And if this name, popular movement, either they don't represent, you know, um, what is, because most of the people, if they were elected with the majority votes of the people, they make some kind of agreement with this big company. And at the end, they need to satisfy this company. Uh, however, it's present during this administration, they, we encounter the great challenges because we need to be confronted with a big paradox. Because when the government of the left is elect, we form social movement. You get the one hand, we cannot make a big criticize because the right movement is going to take our criticize and make that against us. But the other side, we cannot be so soft because otherwise none of our claim is going to be done. And they're going to be dealt with, reduced to a simple manifestation without concrete effect. Uh, but it's necessary we, as a social movement, to find some way for our demands to be done. I write Eduardo Galeno in his book, A Veia Aberta da America Latina. I talked to everybody, this was a Bible book for most of you guys. <laughs> Uh, demonstrating the tale that our election in America Latina era financial by big capital, always interesting in the abundance of rich soil and the subsoil and the, the continuity of the beginning of the exploration. The colonization of the land of the original people, economic exploration, ethnocide and ecocide. That has been always the project of the Eurocentric monotheist elite, and now they are linked to an international capital. We found a popular movement in America Latina. We are aware that our government, whether popular or not, in order to achieve political power, are obligated to have alliance into the most diverse oligarchy group that want all the costs to dominate the resource, natural, political, cultural, and the financial aspect of the country. I thought this movement during the election have a speech direct toward the social, less favored class. We know that several negotiations are, ma are made to enable their section and well, the mountains of the same government forever. This historic cycle had shown us the limitation of the emancipation project with the bourgeois democracy. Although popular government have managed to meet some of the social movement historical agenda, like reduce the poverty create opportunity for education and social ascension, they also helped to tie the struggle of the part of the movement, bring them to the party leadership and the government position, like what happened with Lula last time, and even love him. Uh, he took so many of us from this social movement both closer to them and the death tied their hand. And it was very hard for now us uh, to recuperate that. We cannot be naive 
and think the popular government will meet Alcuin and the agenda. The previous experience on the very popular movement in America Latina are marked by internal and external agreement that generates difficult and decision make special regret to the eradication of the deep social and political economic of our society. For decades, less favorable population have insisted on the same guideline and the demand. Almost the most important demand of the social movement in the work, the issue of land for peasants and the demar demarcation of the territory of the original people are the sum of the example that we can use to start this discussion. In Brazil, the previous government of Lula and Dilma both important advancement. However, some of the guidelines that are currently required for us Afro Brazilian, some of them is before the abolition of the enslavement of uh, abolition of the enslavement in Brazil. Others like the marcation of the territory and the recognition of the genocide and the invasion of the land of the original people in America Latina that never have been talking on the previous government. Um, I told you we have some advance in the several area during the Lula. Our most deep demand I have not seen yet. And many mistakes are made, and this mistake was made cost a lot for us from the social movement because some of the demands, what you was believing the government before the Juma and the Lula, we because we are in, on the on the on the end, we are the one who contact directly with the people. And when you say something, the people who you talk to them is going to be with the eyes all the moment. And today, you're going to ask us what's happening and why you said something and it's not happening now. It is very easy for the government to tell, fortunately, we cannot do that. But for us, who is there on the community every day, you're going to say for somebody who is a neighbor, to say sorry, everything what you say, I cannot demand enough for you. My experience of 45 years of struggle with the social movement allow me to say that it's going to be very difficult to eliminate totally, eradicate social inequality because this is generated by structural problem. A popular government can mitigate this problem but the structural change project, you're going to need many years to be implemented. History is full of examples of the leader who one day dreaming about eliminating equality and end up themselves to be eliminated. Popular movement, we cannot wait for the government to do its work. The fight go and the work did not stop. We need to build a egalitarian society on the everyday daily task. The current government of Brazil has demonstrated action and measures, and the most social and economic advantage population is going to be. Oh, sorry. But at the time, we need to be careful on all demand because that's a key negotiation to promote profound change. But the big question as from the social movement we ask is, how long are we going to be to wait? How many fights we need to do? And how many blood is still be shed? At this moment, I wish the new government who take off around the need, around the great expectation uh, are generated 
and a lot of reflection. We had the opportunity to listen carefully to our elders, but our elders have alert eyes. We needed to be careful and now build a new cycle of the illusion on your mind and the heart. The constant alliance with the latifundio and the capital are the same because the latifundio and the capital is almost the same face of the corn. They will never give us what you need. And what's most fundamental, they never gonna give us the land, territory, freedom, and the dignity. We cannot believe in donation. We're not encouraging this way because this way we remain with your army crossing, believe the parliament that the many times committed themselves and you cannot just wait for law. They will not reach out satisfaction, struggle, revolutionary process, work organization. I see the most conceptual ways of the conquered rights for this reason, for this reason, we at the of the povo believe the only way we can do is with autonomy, land, and the territory. And together as organized people, we be able to archive our secular demand. We need, yes, to take advantage of the political historic opportunity that the old government uh give it to us you know this grotesque management of the old government was a private fascist we need to bury them it's the time to bury authority authoritarianism and militarism on this land bahia during the election gave us a good example that fascist is not to be raised the spirit of the great fight will be continue to spirit Brazil and the world, putting down all these fascists in Brazil. I wanted to give a good save to all the movement and the one who dies, fights and still fights for a great cause and humanity. Now I'm gonna present uh, like I was talking, we cannot just talk about the problem. It's very easy to tell the problems, you know, but how we together can think about solution, what you can do. And for me, it was very interesting to see, I, I did not touch so many people is gonna talk about the most the same, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, I did not know so many people is gonna be talking we are talking about almost the same thing. You know, we are happy with the government on the left, but at the same time, it has so much critic. And we don't know how to manage this both thing, how we can make all the money to be done. And at the same time, don't give space for somebody like the previous government. Oh, sorry, I mean, um, we from uh, Afro religion, we have something what we, if you wanted somebody to be uh, forgotten on our community, we never gonna tell his name. That's one of the reasons I never tell his name, okay? And I know we will not. Because when you tell the name, they become ancestral and they're gonna be your community forever. And if you don't tell his name, he's gonna be forgotten for good. Um, and the, as alternative, I'm gonna show the work we have done for the last 10 years, it's called Net of the People. It's a small movement, what we start in Bahia, but now on the last five to six years, they have been grown, they are those povos. And it's something what I'm a 63 year old and I still believe the world can be changed even with the all deception I have done. But anyway, that's the movement, it's nothing new. It's the opposite. It's 
all the old demand the people have done, but for the first time we took all the demand together in one group, because in Brazil, the indigenous demand, the black movement demand, the quilombo demand, and the, the landless people demand have to be each one working on your side. And now what we try to do is to make a collective demand, but not just ask for people to do something. Our question is what we can do for us, what we collectively can do. Of course, we will still ask for the government to do their part, but besides that, what our part? And that's why I'm going to show you some of the work we have done over there. Wow. I mean, I miss, I miss too bad and to be here. I, I, I like to be walk. But anyway, uh, oh, somebody help me here. Oh, OK. One of the first things is the strategic alliance between indigenous community, quilombo, countryside, city movement, small farm, and the institution. That's our basic, what you want to do. Get everybody collectively. Oh, somebody help me because I, I'm not passing. OK. We seek the construction of a unified path for our struggle, design and wall action agenda that assists the development, empowerment, and emancipation of the integrated community. Oh, oh man. <laughs> so I'm <mean>, old fashioned. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Uh, the other thing is we have is, is try to have articulate basic nuclear movement. You know, we try to get everybody on the same path. And this big alliance, you know, between black, indigenous, and the popular movement, like the landless people. And now we decide because this movement is started on the countryside, but we saw the countryside is not enough. We need to go to the favela, to the slum, and they be together with them because they have something what we don't have, and we have something what they need. And we can do a strong alliance. We write our principles. to fight in defense of the land and the territory, to build a straight network between people. Uh, that's what my friend was talking, you know, uh, the Brigada. <laughs> you know, um, I don't have this strong Brigada. What the net is principle, one is we as a net. And if you touch one part of the net, you're gonna, shake the whole net and if you shake the whole net you're gonna have a problem because everybody is for one uh to work in the study for freedom that is construction it's not a new society because we don't think on this way what you think is a territory we wanted to make some free territory, and for you to have a free territory, the first thing you need to have is food. We cannot have a free territory with no food. And one of the goal for the next three years and is out the territory, what you call the nuclear, to be independent on food. We need to plant our food collectively and we can share or sell or exchange the exit. But the first thing, we need to be able to feed our community with our food. Don't depend on something for outside. But for that, we need first to change the way we see food. And the second, we need to change our diet. 
That's the best way. Otherwise, I'm gonna always want to have things from outside. But we can learn to do our own thing. Like uh, we have a chocolate uh, fabric. You know, you you make chocolate. We make essential oil. You make soap. We make many of the things. You know, we have like a a big distillation of essential oil. You know, you can make different kinds of essential oil. You can make a cream, you can make a uh, toothpaste. Everything was is done already. To reaffirm the ancestral look and the identification of new time continues to our form. We can take the mistakes and the good thing what our ancestors did and this can be our guideline for you keep forward. One of the way we use it to plant is the agroecology with the agroforest, you know, and the permaculture. We use everything what is, we don't want to destroy the land. It's not about it to be agro negocio. It's not about it to be a new, big farm, what is going to produce enough. No, we wanted to produce enough for us. That's what they say. The first thing is not to sell our food, it's to feed ourselves. Because that was one of the big mistakes some of the MST and landless people did. They started to produce it to sell. And when you produce to sell, you become a slave of the system. You need to do the opposite. You need to feed yourself. Because if you can feed yourself, you're not hungry for the things for outside. Wave the herb. You know, now, like I said, we start in Bahia, very small, but now we're in Sao Paulo, Ceará, Rio Grande do, do Sul, uh, Pernambuco. You know, and one of the things we do, we call the jornada. You know, uh, the journey, because we have two ways to think our life: caminhadas and the jornada. Caminhada is just the way you do things every day, and the jornada is something you do for your life. And the, the jornada is never going to end until you die. That's a big journey. And they think what we do is a special seed network and the pre-agroecology journey. What is this? The pre-agroecology is we get a territory. What you call territory is someone who already have a land or a community who already have a land. And we go there. And if they need to plant, we do what we call mutirão. How do how you say mutirão? How is, I don't know. How to... Mutirão is a group of people go to work on the land. And now we get together and you do this big mutirão. It's like you're going to plant corn, beans, and you're going to make, OK, what's the day? OK. How many people can go? Too many people? Okay, prepare everything, make food. We're gonna be two days over there working. And next month is where? This is you, what you need. You need to build a place for to do something, yes. Okay, we're gonna go there. That's some of the community action, you know. Uh, because Bahia is so, a land for rich, for you plant cacao. That's have been our base, you know. But we don't want it to be just on that. We know you plant uh, so many other things, you know, special fruits. But till now, like we have a friendship, you know, the part of our network is Maranhão. Maranhão produces a lot of rice, and we can produce bean and exchange for rice. That's the kind of exchange. And one of the things is exchange seeds. 
seeds have been one of the big problems because we work with what we call the Criollo seeds, you know, the seed what have been keep on your community for many, many years. You know, and Monsanto, some other one that wanted to take <laughs> that over, but we, we try to exchange the seed between yourself to keep the best seeds. That's what we call the mutirons. Uh, that's the native seeds, you know, we exchanged. And we have what you call the, sand, the seed keepers, you know, guardian da semente. Uh, there's some community, and the most is the ladies, you know, uh, they are the one who you take the best seeds and give it to them for them to take care of. And after they're gonna distribute that seed for the people. And there's one, one story about the seeds. I think it's, it's interesting because we tell that story why you give the best seed to the other people. You know, uh, there's this guy who go to the, the market every day or every week. And every time he go, he bring his best seed and give it to everybody. And one capitalist came and say, whoa, you want to give the best seed of your corn to the people? But look, in a few years, everybody is going to have the best corn. And you're not going to be the only one to sell the best corn on the market. And he say, do you know how the corn is pollinized? If I give them my worst seeds, the wind is going to blow to my good seeds. And at the end, I'm going to have the worst seed. But if I give it to them my best seeds, the wind is going to blow to me the best seeds. And my seed is going to get better, better, and better. And I think that's one of the things the capitalists never understand. If you give them best seed, it's going to grow to you better seed too. That's how the seed we keep. And the, we try to pass our knowledge, you know, for the new generation, and that's the two books. Well, we we try now, you know, to write more books. Um, but one, this woman is an indigenous woman. Uh, she now is almost 80 years old, and she has been one of the first teacher on Bahia for the Patachois. Patachois is one group of the indigenous who is in the south of Bahia, and she uh, was one who teach them for many years. And this book is about her experience with um, Reconquista, you know? And uh, Joelso is the guy who responsible for starting the TEA, and he wrote exactly for Terra e Territorio. It's a book what he tell about his experience. He was from the MCT, but after like all the movement, there's something what you decide you cannot go anymore, and you know you you try to make better. And the agroecology journey is when our big encounter every two years, and the, we try to get everybody you know to that. That is the one you do before, you know, like you do a small in each community and you have to do a big one on the big communities. A national meeting.
Thank you very much. Okay. What you need eyes is great. There's small thing that separates us. Okay. Thank you. What? <laughs> Very good. Oh, when you give me saw let me think. You're gonna present some? Just one slide. Uh -huh. Okay, it's better to see this. See if I can get there. Yeah, you can help. It's a little different program than familiar with. Yeah. So, thank, thank you. Thank you. Oops. It's worth all this. <laughs> you just protect them. You want to start speaking? Yeah. So uh, my name is Cliff Welch, and I'm happy to be here, and uh, happy to have the opportunity to I, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers and everybody, all of you, for being here and the organizers for organizing this and inviting me, and. Um, and it's been really great. I didn't know the Mestri Cobra Mansa until yesterday. Hadn't met him, so <laughs> he's a great guy. I've been having a good time chatting with him. Um, as uh, Juan Diego said, I teach uh, in Brazil. I've been a, a student of Brazil since uh, the 1980s and been going there for over 30 years and about 20 years ago, I started working there. I moved my career from the United States to Brazil uh, with the intention of contributing to the movement that Lula was uh, a representative of. And I thought that my uh, what I could offer there might be more meaningful than it was at the institution I was a uh, professor at in, in Michigan. Um, and it's been a great journey and a, a really good experience in which I've, uh, I my most of my work is about agrarian history, and so I, my studies have uh, dealt with uh, rural workers and the countryside in diverse ways. And I finally, uh, part of that has been studying the MSCT the, that um, Messi mentioned, and you probably all of you have heard of that land this uh, workers movement, and for the last. Most of the last 20 years, I've worked with the uh, MSCT, mostly in an education capacity, uh, organizing their archive and also teaching uh, uh, activists at the graduate and uh, at the graduate level and undergraduate level uh, in some programs that I helped create with, uh, with a lot of help and all led by Brazilian people. I'm not a Brazilian. I'm from San Francisco. Uh, that's why my accent's not very thick. <laughs> um, and so I wanted to, uh, in the last, or one of the, the, I think it was the presentation about Mexico, um, they mentioned the importance of inequality and understanding inequality. And I think actually, so I went and found a graph for Brazil because we didn't have that. And I thought maybe this really excellent internal view from a movement that the Mestre represented maybe needed some help with context or might be useful to have a little more context about the situation in Brazil for you guys. And this um, 
it's so small, isn't it? <laughs> it's not the best image for for the show, for the stage. But uh, what it's showing is a distribution of wealth, and it's showing that uh, the top one percent have about fifty percent of the wealth among them. Okay, so that's the this enormous inequality. But it gets worse. So the next uh, group is the the remaining nine percent, which is showing the fifty percent. So they have about um, thirty one per. Uh, about what 20 21 percent that they divide up amongst themselves the next nine percent along uh, associated with the the top 10 percent altogether and then the middle what they call the middle 40 percent of the population has about 20 percent of the wealth and the 50 percent of the population is down in a negative uh, 0.4 of wealth so they're actually in a def living in a deficit, uh, living on debt, basically. And if uh, you go to Brazil and you see these enormous, uh, they're called favelas, slum areas that are around cities. Some of them are more uh, established than others. Uh, and people really work hard to establish uh, their homes there, building them voluntarily. And usually one house on top of the other because the land ownership is so concentrated that uh, they, it's, it's impossible to buy the land. I'm, I'm, I live in the middle class with my civil ser servant uh, wage, but I can't buy the land. The land is tied up in the estate of some long <laughs> line of latifundios, uh, latifundiarios and, and such. So I pay taxes on it. I own my house. I have a right to use it, but the land I am unable to buy. And imagine somebody that doesn't have the resources I have. So they build one house on top of the other and tie their electricity into the one wire that's kind of going nearby. And uh, they call it a gato. They're stealing the, basically stealing the energy and hook up the pipes and so forth. No sewer, no real sewer system that they're connected with. And like I said, eventually some of them get much more hooked up over time and are accepted and kind of legitimized. But at any rate, that's um, I think that's important because uh, I think something very different in our, in the talk that um, uh, Mestri offered is the whole question of struggle for the land that we didn't see much in the other experiences. And this is a, a way, uh, this, this, this very difficult situation that a, a, such a large portion of the population is involved with has made uh, the idea of uh, retaking the land or settling on the land uh, a, a source of a new, another source of wealth, uh, a, a way to build up wealth uh, and stay alive, basically, and get out of debt. So it's taking that that natural resource and turning it into a base of building uh, a more sustainable life. And so it's so it's pretty basic struggle and a lot of um, what Mestre is involved with, a lot of what I study has to do with that, has to do with that struggle and that um, kind of, re, re, what we think of it as he territorializes under a re-territorializing, <laughs> awkward word, uh, the land uh, after being uh, from families that in the most, for the most part, have been pushed off the land or exploited on the land in some form or, form or other and have run from it, they see, many people see the land as a possibility for uh, sustenance for their for them, for them their families and, and future growth. So um, this, uh, this is a, a way, I think, of, of, of trying to contribute a little bit to the talk uh, that uh, that he gave. And um, I didn't have the slides that he just showed, but that was very interesting that Taya Dupova, we talked about a little bit, beautiful slides. And um, and he did make reference to the text that uh, I read. And I'd just like to talk about maybe one or two other points because I know the time has gone by. Um, <clears throat> He, he mentioned the anachronism, uh, uh, used the word anachronism a couple of times in his text. And one of them is about left and right. And I think we're all, you know, really dealing with that whole question of redefining what those are, th throwing them out and whatnot. But it is interesting to think about uh, the origins of those words in the French Revolution. And the right was one that um, defended the monarchy 
and the left was the one that defended a republic. Um, uh, the, the beginnings of the beginning, the beginnings of building a, a democracy in in Europe, and um, it, in some ways, I think those issues are still relevant. I mean, you think about some of these populist authoritarians, like the two already mentioned several times, Bolsonaro in Brazil and and Trump. They both have kingly aspirations, so they kind of do represent a monarchy or or. Uh, better yet, the Messiah uh, that's been used in reference to both Trump and it is some kind of second coming of uh, the Lord. And the same thing with Bolsonaro, it, his middle name, Mes Messias, lends itself to the idea of the Messiah. <laughs> and he's played with that a little bit. And and <clears throat> and the left um, is uh, defending uh, Defending democracy, I think, uh, interesting the presentation on Chile, which demonstrates that, you know, the loss of faith in, in that. And we can see, we can see it, but to see it in, in the numbers and in how many countries that's happening was really interesting. But the, um, I think that defending democracy, defending the state as one of the only institutions that can confront concentrated capital that seems to have that possibility, right, of doing it, having the strength and possibility to do that. And so I think that I, uh, I can identify with that left. Um, I, can, I think that's a, a, a left to defend. Um, and then you get another point that <clears throat> um, in the talk that I wanted to uh, uh, underline was the idea of the structural need for structural change and the importance of the what what you you know probably all have dealt with the the idea the concept of the re he primary is asked some there's some concepts that I just haven't had in Portuguese but the bringing things back to the uh, natural resources primary source exportation model huh? and this is really present in Brazil it's interesting with Lula's recent election for example you 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 might have seen expected a bunch of strikes to take place, workers going out on strike to demand higher wages after a long time of being repressed, suppressed their demand for wages in the previous uh, government. This happened after the end of the di dictatorship, the workers mobilized, but who mobilized? The, the peasants mobilized with 33 land occupations in the early part of this year. And um, a lot of mobilization in the countryside. That's where the cutting edge of the uh, popular movements are in Brazil, at any rate. And um, and that has a lot to do with this agro extractivism, uh, this uh, search for minerals, the government um, opening its borders up to to all kinds of land grabs. The, the, the chief land land grabbers really are the guerrilleros, the internal. Uh, 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 financial backers of land thieves, thieves. Uh, but there's also a lot of foreign intervention in, in that way as well, uh, from all kinds of countries, including socialist countries like China, uh, in, in quote marks. So that need for to confront that kind of um, uh, collaboration between the state and that, um, uh, uh, these international and national companies taking over the land and using the resources um, and exporting the resources in primary in a, you know in their basic form is something that needs to be confronted and is li also like the mystery spoke uh, a difficult situation in which Lula's some of Lula's biggest backers are among agribusiness. Uh, large ag agribusiness corporations, mining companies, but we can see at least some progress um, already in defending the Amazon and indigenous peoples against fires and against um, mining. Hopefully that will continue and get stronger. But I think his uh, the main point that um, he wanted to make with uh, Tea dos Povos, and, um, and I think is an important one, and an interesting one is the the role of social movements, or what I like to call, and I think we, we've talked about this a little bit, so, socio-territorial movements, that is movements that uh, see the 
conquest of, of space, of territory, as key to their survival. Uh, it's not just a social movement that goes out in protest, which is, you know, a, 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 can be a very good thing, an important, important element in any kind of struggle, but one that's trying to get space that it can territorialize and turn into a source of strength. And that's one of the things that's allowed the MSET to, is coming, to come into its 40th anniversary uh, and the growth of more, uh, more than 9,000 agrarian reform settlements in the country, serving uh, over uh, 5 million people, right? Um, and, and so that need, the, the need then to continue to mobilize and not count on the government, even a leftist government, to resolve the questions that you have, the needs that you have. And um, and to keep the pressure on that government. And in the case of Brazil, it's interesting that the federal constitution of 1988 is called the People's Constitution. And we had an example of a constitution mentioned in the Chilean case. Um, this was a process that did involve a lot of the population. My very own uh, father-in-law was involved in the uh, for, uh, in reforming the healthcare aspects of the constitution it, from a mobilization standpoint, not from an actual writer of it, but went to put pressure on in Brasilia during in 1988, pressure on those writing it. But many civil society groups were brought into that process. And the constitution has a lot of really good things in it, including uh, the first uh, agrarian reform uh, demand within the constitution says the government has to uh, create agrarian reform when people violate labor laws, environmental laws, or don't develop their land. The problem is implementing it. Huh? So working to implement these. If Lula would just defend the constitution, which also has great, um, quite a few good uh, uh, um, articles in relation to um, quilombos or the quilombolas and um, uh, indigenous people, that would be a, a great step forward. Uh, just defending that, those uh, those articles of the Constitution relevant to that those questions. So um, I guess that's uh, also one Diego's reminding me of at the time. So <laughs> that's what I had to say for now. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I was supposed to ask a question, or you want to ask from the audience? Yes. Yeah. So, so we have uh, a whole bunch of things coming up. So we have the, the discussion here, which uh, let's hope is not too long. I mean, there's a lot to discuss. This is very interesting, but we have also a Capoeira performance coming up for which we need to do a little bit of a setup here. So why don't we um, uh, open it up for a couple of brief questions so that uh, either to Mr. Cobramanza or to Professor Cliff Welch in uh, and then after that, we start to set up for the Capoeira performance. You're right, once it's right, but very appropriately dressed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oi. Um, Oi. So I've been really frustrated myself uh, trying to just have undergraduates be motivated um, with social movements and just protests in general. Um, and I know we talked about this kind of when we were talking about uh, Chile and just the involvement in politics and just kind of that legacy of students being involved. Um, so I kind of just was like interested because you said you teach um, at a university, right, in Brazil. Um, just kind of what's your sense on a thermostat of what it's like for students and university students there in terms of activism? Like, has it changed? a lot since Lula has come in and are they involved with movements uh, such as yours? And I just wanna hear more about student movements, if you have any. Um, do you wanna? Yeah, no, but, uh... <laughs> uh, but it's an interesting question because like I say, uh, during the time of the right government, some time for us as a student, it's more easy to make a protest. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like some kind of involve you to go against, you know, but it's like when it, it's the left, it's like you get like, what am I gonna do? And you know, and besides that's gonna have a lot of professor 
who you love in them because they say, think what you would like to hear. They are going to be ones like, take it easy, you know, not now. We need to wait. You need to understand. And you know, it's not a good moment for which to go. Well, that's how the game go. <laughs> but you, yeah. you professor can have another answer. <laughs> Yeah, that, that that would be great, but my students don't listen if I say that. Be, calm down. Uh, <laughs> um, it, it, you know, as a student, I participated in protests against the South uh, divestment for uh, uh, investment in South South Africa, a bunch of different issues in the past. But in terms of being in Brazil with the students, which you're asking about. Um, because the universities have been under attack in the last few years, at any rate, there's been a lot of student activism. Uh, it occ definitely occurred before that, but students, um, I've been shut out of my university many times, actually, that, so that's by students. So they, they get all the chairs, they pile them up in the door so you can't get into the classroom. They uh, block access to the campus. And usually, eventually, the professors vote in favor of their action and take part in it. So they're very, they're very active. It, it, like I said, it often has a lot to do with their interests. You might say that is they're they're fighting for public education, which will help them, and that's what's under attack with budget cuts. So, but they're they're very active in other ways too. Pretty good. It's pretty dramatic sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, and for all you students in here, like, get active. You know, we don't have time for this. <laughs> right. <laughs> Maybe one more brief question. Okay, so thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Let's go. <laughs>
Uh, okay, everyone. So we're ready here. So the next part, the next part of the of the program is a um, is a mini capoeira performance. Uh, the name of this kind of performance is Hoda, which means circle in Portuguese. And uh, uh, the reason why we we are excited to, to to share this aspect of our practice with you is that capoeira is is an art that is uh, born from uh, liberation uh, in Brazil and is and is linked to is deeply linked to to social movements is deeply linked to the construction of community, and uh, not only in Brazil but in many parts of the world, including our community here. So we have our own capoeira community in Davis, and. Uh, Many members here that I'm very, very happy to see friends who who we have made over over the years through the practice of capoeira. So uh, we're very lucky to have uh, a Mestre Cobramasa, of course, uh, sort of preside in this 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 event here for us. You will see him now in action doing the thing that he's really known for. I mean, he has many many hats as I as as I mentioned before, but this is really what he's known for in the world. And uh, we also have Mestre Caboclinho, also from Bahia, who, who is how is that uh, old uh, old time friend of of Mestre Coramas, also a, a Capoeira Angola practitioner. So we're gonna be sharing with you uh, a little bit of music. The songs are in Portuguese. And there's gonna be uh, some physical games here that we call jogos or or, or, or games, and. Um, uh, there won't be a lot of uh, sort of the rhetoric we use here is, is a little different, is more uh, embodied. And um, um, I don't know if we have time for, for Q&A after this, but um, I hope you enjoy, you enjoy it. This is something that is deeply meaningful for us, the uh, practitioners, and it's not just something that has to do with pleasure. It's something that is, is as Mestre was saying, is part of our jornada, our way, our way of, of, of living, our way of... Uh, Sort of being in the world. Okay, so um, here we go. Yeah, but give me a I'm sorry. Now, uh, before we start, because uh, I really wanted to to sing one song here. Um, I think some of the Brazilian people know that song, but I will make a question to do this song because this song represents everything what we are doing here. Okay. Um, some people are gonna remember. If you're gonna remember, please just help me to sing. Okay.
Vamos separar o que é que vai Precisa de dois. Tem mais? A Lidiana foi no gay. Ah, tinha você também, pô.
I forgot to mention at the beginning the Kashmir. But Mr. Coral is my Capoeira master. So everything I know about Capoeira, he has taught me, as you could see. Very <laughs> special. This is the second time we have him uh, in campus. So he's teaching us this beautiful art. We have a small uh, what? Well, a capoeira <laughs> group here at Mr. Davis, a study group. And uh, so students can uh, 
registered for credit and he is teaching us <laughs> so Monday and uh, the day, just uh, open to the public. So Monday and Wednesday, it's coming Monday and Wednesday, 10 a.m., 10 to 12 at the Della Davidson studio. That's all I can say before I take a little. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So and, and tomorrow, I can just. <laughs> so tomorrow we have a, a performance at 6. Uh, no, at uh, at noon, at noon at uh, at the quad, a bigger performance. So Mexico Cage is going to be there. Most of these wonderful friends of Capoeira and other people coming from the Bay Area and from Sacramento. Yeah. Okay. I want to say one thing about the class. It starts in an accessible way that anyone with any level of content can do. It's not you get to here. <laughs> <laughs> You don't need to go to the store for what all the men do, okay? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so uh, we're gonna we still have a very exciting part of the of the event coming up. So we have the the closing uh, round table. So for that, we need to do again a little bit of a setup. So let's take five while we organize them. Sure. Thank you. Thank Hello, hello, hello. Yes. Yeah, I like
Hello, hello, me escuchan? Odio la derecha mucho y hasta ahora lo la izquierda, izquierda, la izquierda, izquierda. Sí. No, es complicadísimo. Ah, no, no me piden a mí cosas de Perú, yo les sigo los siento, pero sí, no, yo sí, no puedo sí. dar lo que eso. Yo, 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 yo estuve en el Ah, ok, muy bien. Ok. Mike. Mal. Open mic. ¿Qué decías sobre tu sí, sí, sí. ¿Quién se dio ese? Ya, ok. Ya, ok. Ya, ok. Ya, ok. Ya, ok. Ya, Aló, aló. Ah. Sí, okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. Okay. Um, welcome back, everybody. Um, 
I have to say, uh, first of all, I'm Professor Chayla Samuelson. I'm from uh, the World uh, Literatures, um, Languages and Literatures Department in San Jose State. Um, and I'm really pleased to be with you here today. I'm very grateful um, for the invitation from UC Davis, and I'm really excited that this is our first official um, event as our Consortium of Latin American Studies of NorCal. Um, and I have to say my mind was just sort of wiped clean by that performance. <laughs> I don't know if you all feel that way, but all of the things that I was thinking and all the smart thoughts that I had just kind of went out the window. So um, uh, that was incredible. Um, so uh, we're finishing up here, and the idea is that we're going to have a roundtable with our presenters. We have all these specific case studies, and we want to try to bring it together and maybe bring it up to the regional uh, level, bring it up to the level of Latin America and see what things are in common, what things are different, how we can kind of think along those lines. But before we dive into that, um, I'd like to introduce Chuck Walker, who's a professor of history here and former director you know, of the Hemispheric Studies Institute. Um, and he's going to speak to us a little bit about the situation in Peru, which is quite complex. So. Well, thank you, and thank you, everybody, and thank you for that wonderful performance. That is truly a hard act to follow. Um, I want to make two. I want to add two comments. I want to thank everyone for coming. Um, without trying to turn this into a joke, which I always do, um, I know it's hard to accept an invitation to a city where there's a serial killer on the loose. Um, and it's been a really hard week for us all. Um, I knew both the both victims really well, or, or well. Um, and the best way to get back, and I want to mention one of my students, Celeste, who's here, who like said, let's have class on Wednesday. Let's not let that, I won't repeat the word you used, uh, get in our minds. And, you know, so the best way for us in Davis is to get back and have this, you know, have this activity, see our friends. And, you know, and this love, one of our pride and joys is the Mandavi Center in this place. So I want to really thank you. And for me, it's a great honor. And also just because, you know, I've had long ties with Stanford and the Bolivar House. My, and I, I know San Jose State very well. People in my family have graduated from there. I've spent, my, myself, spent time there. So it's just a wonderful, and it's been a great day. Um, I also just want to make a comment. One of the things that I, I liked about today, and I'll see if Didi and Alberto and, and our other friends, Juan Pablo, agree with me. I just feel like I, I come from history that there are, it's sort of, Decade by decade, there's acercamiento y alacamiento. I mean, there are times when I go to a politologo talk and I don't understand a word. The, about a decade ago, it was all looking for Vidi to see if she, okay, there you are. Um, you know, numbers and, I, you know, once an historian sees a formula or an alpha sign or an infinity, we leave the room because we don't know what they're talking about. And I feel like right now, and, I, and a lot of this is from Peru where there's a, we were gossiping before in his live mic. Fortunately, I didn't say anything too inappropriate. But the politologos in Peru are really the people to follow right now. There's some really good people. So I just want to say that I thought it was nice today, this sort of approximation of multiple discipline, undergrads, grad students, professors from different disciplines. I also want to mention literature. So I have the task of talking about Peru, and I probably take a couple more minutes. Other people, because I'm going to give, I, I don't like to do assumed knowledge, but I think everybody in the room knows it's it's really complicated. Um, right now, and I really like Vidian. Viridiana's approach about mentioning how the foreign sort of press approaches it. I've become, I won't, I don't get quoted, but I'm a fact checker for AP and Al Jazeera, two very different lines because they they run art, uh, ideas by me. There's sort of a sensationalist approach to Peru because it's it's extremely peculiar. Peculiar. They have five ex presidents in jail right now. Now a lot of us say hear that, and we have a couple or at least one we'd really like to see in jail. And I know Brazil does as well, but it really is, and and so I. I you know, and and the, and the sixth one, Alan Garcia, uh, committed suicide to avoid jail. So it, it's it's a really really peculiar um, situation. The, the the there's another thing that some politologo needs to really study that the two interim presidents, President Interinos in Peru, have been fabulous in the 21st century. Paniagua, who's no longer with us, and um, Zagasti, who took over a couple of years ago, was a sort uh, and things like that. But um. I just sort of want to run through what's happening and try to move beyond this incredibly odd situation to make some parallels to talk about the discussion today about the left, the situation, the the um, the the difficulties and, and challenges ahead. So, as most of you know, some of you know, Pedro Castillo was uh, elected president and was then deposed in de in December. Um, how people view him varies greatly. But um, he tried an autogolpe, that is, he tried to close Congress, and he didn't get away with it. And, and as they you know, said in Peru, he was president in the morning, dictator at lunch, and in jail at dinner that day. On, um, and 
He disgraced himself, um, prisoner immediately. The irony is the people who imprisoned him and have been forcing this are all are generally Fujimoristas, and Fujimori was the master of the auto golpe because that's how he took power. So there, there's just lots of um, ironies and, and horrible things here. And then there was a uh, gobierno interino who won't go away. Dina Boluarte is the president. Um, this sparked protest immediately, almost immediately people said elections now, this was so for defenders of Castillo, and there's a small percentage too, this was a coup to take power from him, and for La Derecha, broadly defined as the term used, the Fujimoristas, to, to stay in power, and that's sort of proving true. Um, it sparked six months of protests. Uh, very creative ones, very broad ones. They wane, they've come back. They are also just treated brutally. And this is when I was there in December, in, or, no, excuse me, in January. Um, we we now have studies um, that, for example, in Ayacucho, uh, those those killed were executed. We seven or eight protesters um, were shot in the same place above the heart. In other words, this wasn't a random bala perdida. It wasn't even. It wasn't. Um, and what was very chaotic, these were efforts to kill people. They were is much more brutal outside of Lima because once again, impunity is much easier outside the capital and the glare of the press. They were also brutally um, repressed in San Marcos University and elsewhere in Lima. Um, the, the the sort of absurdity of it right now is the Congress, part of it is, is uh, in part as a constitution imposed here, echoes of Chile, um, the Fukimortis have sort of a superpower and they're staying in power. Part of it is very venal, to, just to get the, the sueldo and things like that. Three days ago, these things you can't make up, they, 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 it's been come out that all of the majority of congresistas are charging a cupo to their empleados. The people working for them have to pay cut, well, in the United, kickbacks, exactly. And so what the, the solution is to raise their salaries so there's no scandal. So it's, so it's, it is a wretched, you can see why there's a sort of simplification or an absurdity of it. Going back to Castillo, though, um, you talked about, uh, you know, uh, we talked about um, Mexico being very, you know, ambi ambitious was the word you came up with. And Castillo was the opposite. He was unambitious and incredible disappointment. One of the first sort of the question we, we all receive is like, how was he? You know, what did he do? And, 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 and you know, the answer is not very much. He really didn't know how to how to govern. And this was it's a very difficult train because all the classism and even racism. He's a man, a, a rural teacher from northern Cacamarca, from northern Peru. With, with, he has a strong northern Andean accent. And of course, of course, the right wing or conservatives made fun of this, that no sabe hablar, this very classist term and things like that. But the, tr the truth of the matter is it was incredibly, a crushingly disappointing government. Um, I remember a friend joking when they on we were watching TV, we were, we were having a very early breakfast, like seven in the morning, and they have kind of a cambio de guardia at the Palacio when he showed up. And my friend said, you know, this is like the joke about the Argentine military. No hacen nada, pero lo hacen temprano. You know, they, he's not doing anything, but he does it early. And this is just, I mean, the, the lack of initiative. I mean, a, a lot of us, a lot of people have been looking for, you know, what did he do? And he seemed to have done very, very little. Um, the point I want to, what I want to focus on here, and I will, I'm going to be brief because we've got such a great panel here, is the opposition to Boluarte was incredible. It really represented this broad coalition um, of the left. Um, it was, you know, and this is the question, is this the base of a national resurgence of the left? It was very, uh, it was very out. It was very strong outside of Lima, particularly in the north where Castillo is from, but above all in Puno and Cusco, which have been a bastions of anti-Fujimorismo. Um, it's been also very much a youth movement. Um, it broadly brought together what we call just anti-neoliberal -neo groups, groups that could define that the, the the Milagro Peruano, which I, I, you know, if we had graphs here, I think in the last 20 years, fastest growing GDP. Uh, in, largest increase in export income, these sort of things who are questioning this. Um, but it, it this was quickly, and this is something that the, the foreign press asked about and was pushing, is this the new Zapatistas? I was asked that by, uh, by AP. And this coalition has incredible divergences and differences that I do think are, are, are beyond sort of just, well, any coalition has these. The groups in the South, for example, prove to be extremely socially conservative. Um, they are have a very strong, this weird homophobic element in their protests. There's a sort of anti-modernity to them um, about this. Um, there were also illegal, there were, uh, illegal minors from the Amazon joining in. There were some contraband groups, et cetera. And, I, and again, this sounds like 
Chuck Walker is bought into the you know right wing propaganda against this. But I I I I think I'm sincere or right saying that you know you it's hard to over romant or romanticize this group. And this is the sort of the the, the great difficulty of the Peruvian left right now. Um, when Castillo won, a lot of people expected Veronica Mendoza would be. She was the candidate of the left. She would have been. The, um, she was seen as a stronger candidate, and she's. Um, but her support for for uh, including the LGBT rights, uh, legalization of marijuana, abortion rights, all these things cost her greatly. And this is a debate within Peru. It's you know social conservatism within the opposition is very very strong. She part of this was casting her as that you know candidata caviar, the champagne socialist. She's elitist. She was bashed because her father is French and she's. She has a sin of speaking French. Um, and one one particularly obnoxious Aldo Mariati journalist greeted her in really bad French. And she she brilliantly responded in Quechua, which she speaks. Um, but this is within the spectrum of the left. I think that this debate in, in Peru comes up that I think every country has. We really this 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 coalition of the old left, which really if Castillo had a base, it was the old left somewhat close to the shining path. I don't, I, they weren't part of the shining path, which were, you know, it's mo, it's going to, it's it's attacking capital, which they didn't do. These other things are a BS bourgeois uh, passions and things like that. Um, and, and these are the tensions um, there, the elephant in the room in Peru or the, the other, the other factor is a shining path, which was defeated, still extremely uh, unpopular, um, has a teeny political presence, but that the right wing knows brilliantly how to use up heteroqueo, which is used personally to get people in trouble if your defensive terrorism is still, a, is still a crime in Peru. But it is still used quite well by conservative groups and others to say the left, that they're Maoistas, they had car bombs and this association of what were very bad years. So um, the left is, again, you know, in this situation of, can, and, 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 I, and I've, you know, on Zoom, follow these conversations. Can we rebuild this coalition? Uh, they are, if anything, their most defining point is how anti Fukimori they are. They proudly have defeated Keiko. Keiko Fukimori has lost the present election by very close margin three times. And what you've had are mal menores, where th you know the, the 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 this broad electorate I'm I'm calling leftist, progressive, etc., ended up voting for Umala, PPK, and Castillo. And so conservatives would hear this and say, and you were right. I mean, you know, et cetera. Um, you know, what's wrong here? Why, why have you done this? All three of them are in jail, as is Fukimori. Um, and, and Keiko Fukimori very likely could be in jail at some point. So um, this so there is sort of the, the, the news of, well, this this broad coalition against the Boluarte is very enlightening. On the other hand, mayor elections, the, the midterm elections last year were three right wing candidates vied to win Lima. The worst one in my mind. Well, not the worst. The second worst one uh, um, was victorious Lopez Aliaga, who has taken it. He's sort of trying to out Bolsonaro and out Trump them. He uh, is a member of the Hopeless Day. Uh, he's immediately fought picked fights with Memory Museum. He's closed um, health organizations that help um, street kids. I just, it's an astonishingly uh, rigid and um, reactionary government or mayoral. And again, Lima is, you know, more than a third of the country. It's where the power is centered. And it's a very great fear that he'll be a strong candidate for president down the road. Um, so anyway, to close, one of the debates, I think, beyond all this, beyond these sort of, you know, electoral politics is neoliberalism. Uh, there's a lot of neoliberalism bashing, which there should be. Um, but there's also in the, many, you, you often hear debates about this, but people, particularly voters, middle class, lower class, poor will say, we now have a house we didn't before. There is an acceptance of the boom in Peru, which I think the left often overlooks. And again, this is a very complex topic. I'm oversimplifying um, in a sense here, but it is one, what, what do we mean by anti, what do we mean by neoliberalism? It's a debate to have. What do we mean by this privatization, et cetera? Um, the COVID, however, showed the incredible absence of healthcare. Peru suffered one of the worst countries, a country that was very proud of itself. This was culinary nationalism. If you go to Peru, the first thing any taxi driver will say, we have the best food in the world and, you know, the, you know, and, and Gaston Accordio and things like that. And also people will start brag about the new buildings and, and et cetera, et cetera. And COVID just showed how this is the absolute lack of public health, which meant one of the highest mortality rates in the world. Um, 
So, you know, these are the debates that come up. I come back to, um, uh, I know Alberto brought up, you know, some of the traits of the left. I wanted to sort of push some of these because I thought they, they would go well in debate. Um, and again, we have to meet again next year or the year after 18 months, something. I think the right deserves, uh, you know, more attention. I, I, I know a couple of people brought up evangelicals, that that variable, and these other things. So again, that was a very quick overview, um, um, and I'm, I hope it prompted dialogue and discussion among all of us here. Press. Thanks again for the opportunity, and thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Chuck. That was great. Uh, I really think that you did touch on a lot of the main themes that I hope will open up uh, more largely in this um, in this roundtable. So um, I would like to say uh, what I plan to do here is to kind of touch on the main points that I gathered from these different tables, these different mesas, um, and the kind of like questions that they brought up for me. And I hope that's kind of like a jumping off point and also some main themes. Um, but first of all, I want to say that I'm in literature. I'm not a social scientist or an economist. Um, uh, and thinking about the left and what the left is when I'm trying to teach, um, the next generation of students have no idea what that is. Um, they don't know what the Cold War was. They don't know what the USR, USSR was. And so I find myself working backwards, you know, hey, do you guys, do you know about that? No, I don't know about that. I'm like, okay, Che. And they're like, yeah, Che. I'm like, okay, let's start with Che Guevara. Like, what is this, <laughs> right? Let's, let's figure out what this is. And the thing that I always say to them is that when I was a kid, we thought there were options, right? We thought there was like a possibility for a completely different economic and social structure. And we really believed that it could happen, you know. And I was 17 when I went to Nicaragua to like volunteer with the Sandinistas, you know, while there was a civil war going on. And I was raised up in a family that I really thought, you know, there's an alternative structure here and we can pursue it. Um, whereas with my students now, I feel like, you know, sorry, guys, capitalism won you know, like on a global scale. So now what do we do? You know, and so I think that's a, it's a, it's a really interesting thing to try to think through. It's not that we have no leftist movements, but that the idea of these two almost equal forces that were dueling it out, we're not in that place anywhere anymore. And so a lot of the struggles that I saw in some of these talks about why isn't this working? Why are these systems breaking down? Why can't progressive um, politics make headway? And it's because it's up against this massive wind, right? Which is like a global economy that's like the race to the bottom. It's capitalismo salvaje, right? It's like the bottom. So anyway, that's that's something that I think about like on a larger scale when I try to help my students understand like, because they don't know that there's any other possible world. It's like, this is the world now. So um um, and then, so thinking about uh, Fernanda and Claudia, you know, I think the thing that was most striking to me with your wonderful intervention is it really answers the question, why should we care about Latin American politics, you know, in the U.S.? Like, what does it matter to us? Well, it matters a lot to us. Um, we see this massive influx of immigration and every time there's an upset you know, we see it coming to the U.S. And I think, you know, educating the wider population, putting things in place. I mean, and I think um, trying to hold, you know, the 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 Colombian government responsible for their actions and how they support immigrants, but also holding the U.S. government responsible for how they interact with with people. Um, and it also just it just gives us an idea of the complexity of the story of the left. You know, there's the story of the left in Colombia. And then there's the story of that relationship of that government to the to the Colombians that are not inside the country. So that I, I think really struck me. Um, and then um, Viri and Alberto, that was incredible. And I have to say, I, I study contemporary Mexican literature. And in 2016, I went with Sarita Poterrera to Tijuana so she could vote for AMLO, and it was a big deal. And then we went to the protest, you know, we walked La Reforma at night when they shut down the Zocalo to protest the, the stolen election, you know, um, with AMLO. Um, and so, yeah, I really, I think as a person uh, who is most closely allied with cultural workers in Mexico, 
and seeing how much they supported AMLO. And there was just so much passion and excitement around him. And then seeing how he's really gutted a lot of cultural, you know, um, uh, things that have existed for a long time in Mexico and the kind of decepcion or the disappointment of a certain class of leftists with AMLO. And, and Vidi, you really gave me the thing that I was missing, which was numbers, mm -hmm. you know? Um, I think that like, uh, and my students and I, we talk about narrative, right? Like there's narrative and then there's numbers. And so to having those numbers, having that kind of concrete thing of like, look at this. And, you know, you see why when you listen to the Mañanera and you see all the comments like, mi presidente, like people love him, you know? And, and it's really important to understand those real numbers behind it instead of getting on these kind of like, oh, he tried to sell the plane and that was just a, you know, he was just showing off or whatever. So thank you so much for that. Um, that was wonderful. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to say about numbers is that it goes both ways. Um, in our class, we read uh, Yolanda Segura, Serie de Circunstancias Posibles en Torno a una Mujer Mexicana de Clase Trabajadora, which is a poemario. It's a long poem. And it's it's Yolanda Segura's attempt to like think through her grandmother's experience in Mexico through numbers. So like how much money did she make in such in this year and how much did it buy? What percentage of her ingresos went towards food or cigarettes in this year and then how much in this year? So like there's a cross cross pollination. And I also this is a moment for me to recognize my students that came all the way from San Jose State. And I'm really, really grateful for them to be here. Um, yeah, and I think. Um, um, Juan Pablo, who's still um, here, um, and Christian, I think the talk about Chile was so interesting um, because I think, again, it helped me think through some of the narratives that we are really accustomed to, the narrative of left versus right, um, and the idea that, you know, we can dig deeper under there and see these larger trends and that acceleration you know, of dissatisfaction with the political process that cuts across all parties. That is fascinating, you know. So um, um, it's interesting, but then I loved the two talks because there's this concern and this acceleration of some kind of crisis that seems ongoing. But then there's also this very hopeful narrative, which is like the young people organizing, you know, and how does that, how is, could we short circuit that, you know, that unhappy or concerning narrative with that? Um, and then finally, um, Mr. Cobra Mansa, like, again, you wiped my mind clean with all of that. Um, but, uh, in terms of your talk, I, I think that the thing that is most inspiring is, yeah, what is left and right, right? And to know that like left and right comes from a European tradition, right? And so, uh, maybe what we need to talk about is more indigenous, more Afro-descendant ways of knowledge and practice. Um, and what I'm super interested in is how can we scale that up? And I think that's a little bit of what you're talking about because you're like, we're taking care of communities. We take care of ourselves, but it doesn't mean we're not engaging with the larger system. We're asking them to rethink, you know, what that structure looks like and what it could look like. And how can we go back to not necessarily go back, but go forward with structures that come from before or with models of community that come from before. And that was just, to me, that was just gorgeous. Um, and again, Cliff, um, thank you for providing some of the some of the numbers underneath of that, you know, because it's so, it's so good. I think it comes to ideas and numbers. Um, so I just talked a lot, um, but I'm really excited to hear what you guys have to say about the role of narrative. We didn't talk about media and WhatsApp in Brazil. Um, but that's really, you know, like um, he who shall not be named uh, le leveraged that kind of thing. And so we talk about the splintering of political parties and and the ability to gather to people under a big tent. And part of it is the splintering of media um, and where people get their information. So how can we deal with that? Um, again, the economy, I really, you know, this the give and take between this global economy that really is if you don't want to make our stuff cheap, we'll move you know, somewhere else, you know, um, and how to create alliances. I mean, I definitely see the alliance in Mexico breaking down between this kind of cultural elite that is leftist and then you have, you know, the working class. So, you know, what is, what can we do about that? What are the implications, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then finally, the role of education. I'm a professor. So for me, 
that is so important. What is our role in the universities? Um, what are we trying to help our students, you know, learn and go forward and, and be good citizens activists? Okay, thank you. That's it. Um, does anybody, I, I, we don't have a particular order, so yeah. Um, so thank you, thank you for that summary. Um, just one correction is Patricia, not Claudia. <laughs> Patricia. Anyway, uh, that's okay. Um, no, I mean, I think it's really important to answer that first question that um you asked about why should we care about what's happening in um, Latin America, and um and I think it's. It's thinking historically too. Um, I feel that with my presentation, I spoke about the Nixon uh, war on drugs and the fact that we had um, this intervention from the United States in our democracies over years. And the fact that during the 1980s, uh, we had this war in Colombia where we were um, being bombed and kidnapped and killed. And um, and then we have this neoliberal agenda that has created, uh, you know, this accumulation of uh, wealth in a very, very uh, small group of people who um, are not distributing that wealth, first of all. And second, uh, where, you know, with the presentation from all the, um, the statistics about how much do people are getting uh, as a minimum wage is always declining. So the answer is, is because everything here is connected. And the fact that these people are coming here is because of years and years of policies that the United States have affected in Latin America. So when you see waves of immigrants coming to here, not only from Latin America, from, from Africa, from the Caribbean, is because all these policies have created this um, very difficult spaces where we live, where there is no jobs, there are no jobs, the, um, there is exploitation not only of labor, but of the natural resources. So I think we need to think globally. And I think that's the reason why it's important to talk about things like this, because we have a very small um, view of what is happening. You, we are just thinking maybe back 10 years, you know, 15 years, but it's the context of where we are and how neoliberal policies have created the mess that we're in. And I I definitely feel that going back to um, a conversation that President Petro had, had in Stanford, I was there. I, I do feel that it's important to kind of elevate a little bit of what he said, which was capitalism is not going to solve this problem. And I think the only problem, um, the only way to solve this problem is to social um, connection and in the way that we're doing the the small stuff that we do there in San Jose, I think that's the 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 way that I see the future, or at least is my hope. Because looking globally is really hopeless sometimes. Um, but also, what Master Capoeira was doing is the community working together to grow food for them because. Food insecurity, as you all know, you know, college students, because I also work at San Jose State for many years, is a big deal. And so if you don't have food, you cannot think, you cannot work, you cannot function as a human being. So I will say it's really important to think about this because in context, we're all interconnected and whatever is happening in our countries, the source of it came many, many years ago from the involvement of the U.S. Uh, well, so many things were said, so I'm just going to uh, focus on one single topic, which is um, how do we move forward, right? Like how, in, in a world where we understand that neoliberalism was here for a very long time and where it neoliberalism hasn't left and it's very unclear when it is going to leave, right? Uh, so then how do we move forward? And I think that one important way to move forward is to start thinking about what are the constraints that the U.S. is creating on the bilateral relationship between Mexico and the U.S. for Mexico to reduce its inequality, right? Because uh, if we think, for example, about how the USMCA 
uh, has limited the capacity of Mexico to conduct industrial policy to, uh, you know, for example, even simple things like uh, charge for water, right? Like currently, for example, Mexico does not charge the full price of water for agro industries. And this is, you know, this comes from like a long tradition that, you know, after the revolution, uh, the land was supposed to be given to the people and with the land, water should come. And, and that was kind of like a good idea back in the time where, where we were thinking about creating, uh, you know, land redistribution and agriculture. But currently, uh, that constraint is only, you know, the constraint of not charging for water is only benefiting large scale agro industries. So, <laughs> and, and part of the reason why that cannot be reformed is because if you reform some laws in Mexico, then you can be accused by corporations of uh, what they call indirect expropriation, right? Which is when a change in the law uh, creates a liability for corporations. Well, that that that, that problem, you know, has inhibited uh, law uh, change in many ways for Mex from Mexico, right? Another one, for example, is the drug on war, the, the, the drug war, and how that is affecting the capacity of Mexico to properly create uh, a system that, you know, has uh, a, a more safe and, and more, less criminal environment and so on. I'm not going to I'm not going to continue because it's a long way. But I feel that when we and to close, uh, when, when we think about Mexico, we think about three problems, which is migration, uh, violence, right, and trade. Those are kind of like the three things that we think about. And I feel that we need to change that. And we need to start thinking about redistribution, income inequality, fiscal policies, and competition. Because when they tell me in Mexico that the problem is capitalism, I'm like, what, what capitalism? We have never had that. Our, 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 our economy is just monopoly economy. And it has always been. So, you know, we need to even try that because we, we haven't really tried capitalism yet. <laughs> That's a wonderful point. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm wondering if if Juan Pablo, would you like to um, contribute? Can you hear us? We'd love to hear uh, if you have some comments. Yes. Uh, thanks so much. And uh, it's a lot to comment on. Um, I I think well, like my, to me, I mean the the central issue has to do with how uh, Neoliberalism challenges democracy, right? By by inducing an inability of politics to to change things that that matter to people, right? Um, and that are central to to people's life, like uh, privilege, inequality, the distribution of goods and services in society, security, uh, the ability of governing, right? Like by uh, suppressing conflict, uh, like uh, establish the rule of law, et cetera. Uh, so I, I think that, again, to reiterate something that we discussed with Christian uh, during the presentation, uh, the, the, the problem is that neoliberalism also introduces this trap uh, by which it's very difficult to leverage uh, societal interests that uh, eventually would benefit from a structural change uh, to make that change uh, possible in through through democratic means right and 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 that's I think uh, the trap we 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 are we are in uh, something that uh, hasn't been mentioned that I would like to brought to the table as well is uh, a state weakness right we we this is a very long-term trade of Latin American states. We have patrimonial, corrupt, powerless states vis-a-vis -vis other actors that locally are, are better able to, to impose conditions uh, on the ground and to, and to therefore like uh, uh, draw the conditions in which uh, the life of people takes place. Uh, and, and I think that's important because it, it also introduces constraint on on elected leaders, right? You you are elected, but you you govern uh, a, a powerless state. So uh, the societal demand has has increased. 
uh, and frustration with the ability of politics and democratic leaders to uh, uh, like fulfill and, and respond to those demands has also increased uh, over time due to this uh, uh, effect of, of, of state weakness. So uh, I think those are, are, are things that I, that I would consider. Just one minor uh, observation on, on, on why the US of Latin American politics. Um, and and uh, I'm, I'm not like necessarily trying to be provocative here, but I think it, it, it's uh, important to acknowledge too that uh, US politics today uh, resembles in American politics more than it used to do in the past, right? And, and I would say that advanced capitalist societies uh, and the US uh, and, and politics in those societies have, have become more, more like similar in the last two decades uh, to dynamics we have seen in the region for, for a long time. Uh, and that also has to do with globalization and its effect on, 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 uh, on society and politics. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. Sort of going in order, but not really. Uh, would uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to bring a point that we haven't touched on yet, and it's another effect of multi um, of neoliberalism, which is the multicultural state, uh, and also um, to call attention to all the effects that neoliberalism has on so social and cultural. Uh, levels, right? We've been talking a lot, a lot about the macro, uh, macro relationships, but um, we know that uh, micro relationships, the everyday relationships, the encounters we have every single day, right? Those uh, have the power to perpetuate the inequalities. So things happen at this level too. So uh, in Colombia specifically, um, with the new constitution of 1991, which was uh, an attempt, right? One of one of the attempts of the government to address the escalation of violence that was happening at the time. So, in one of the things that was done in this new constitution was to declare the Colombian state a multicultural, uh, pluricultural uh, state, while you know for centuries it had been considered a mestizo. Uh, state, just like it has been in many places in Latin America. Um, so the idea of multiculturalism, in a way, um, generated a lot of change, and some positive, some not so much, right? So uh, Afro-Colombian groups, Afro-Colombians were, um, were recognized as a, a people, right? Not this idea now we are all Colombians, um, indigenous people. So um, gradually, a lot of um, statues were passed, and these groups were able to to have access to re, re, um, to compensations. To of course, it also created a lot of problems. Um, and this, in a way, um, at the at the cultural level, right? Multiculturalism has this effect of it's kind of like the Benetton diversity, right? Uh, it it glosses over. Um, the 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 real inequalities, right? So it, it brings some people to visibility while not really providing real material change, right? So this is something that we've seen in in across Latin America in places that have um, have gone through this path of multiculturalism. Um, a large a large portion of people who have been most affected by war, and we know. Afro-Colombians and indigenous peoples because of the territories that they inhabit that have been exactly the territories that have been coveted um, by drug traffickers in, in, in the middle of the forest um, and then extractivist uh, corporations, right, that have been able to operate uh, really without much uh, oversight, right? So that has created all kinds of problems. So these communities have been able to access uh, resources, but at the same time, no protections against all this, right? So it's it's very lopsided in a, in a way, uh, these communities gain visibility, 
uh, and it's all oh, great. Now everybody's recognized in Colombia while it's really glossing over much larger um, issues. And another large proportion of the population that cannot identify as Afro-Colombia or indigenous is really left uh, in a totally marginal position, which is the majority of peasants in Colombia. So the peasant outcry, uh, you know, and there were many marches of pe cocaleros, peasant cocaleros, who had been really um, stigmatized as guerrilla supporters, as uh, drug traffickers, when many of them have to plant coca leaves because that's the only way, uh, the only mode of subsistence that, that they have. So it, it creates this imbalance and the narratives that are created about all these people that do not fit into the very narrow modes of multiculturalism. Um, and, and this is at the everyday level, right? People uh, are consistently stigmatized socially, economically, and et cetera. So that's one effect. And then um, talking about... Um, cultural policy not in bringing it to, to Petro now. So one of the positive effects that multiculturalism had and was the creation of a Ministry of Culture in Colombia, and that happened uh, years later in, in 2011, which was also dubbed as the, the Ministry of Peace, because the rationale is that, okay, we're gonna promote uh, culture, like all kinds of, you know, expressive culture, manifestations, support Afro-Colombian arts, create all these music festivals and have really uh, support for that. So there was a large program that that uh, was funded by the government, uh, something that we don't have in the U.S. So we had um, uh, very robust, in a way, uh, resources put into that. And that was the moment when um, the, all of these, you know, uh, diverse um, diverse communities were able to have more cultural representation. Of course, that also brings problems because it marginalized many others. Uh, so that was a good outcome. So there were actual government sponsored programs that were that were offered uh, classes for children. And this was a, a national project actually that happened in Colombia called Batuta. Um, now, uh, with the new, the, the Petro administration, um, the Ministry of Culture um, came with a proposal to, to create a model of national uh, music education. And I'm talking specifically about music because that's mostly my field, but this, hap this has happened, you know, in a, in a divert, in a broad, broad way in Colombia. Um, the project, the proposal is to, um, to um, bring to Colombia uh, the same model that Venezuela used, the the, the of uh, edu musical education based on classical music, and uh, of course Gustavo Dudamel, the very very famous Venezuelan conductor, came out of that program. So they're all of these um, this. Um, facade of something great that happened in, in, in Venezuela with this with this project. So this was the main proposal of the new uh, administration in terms of culture to install this project in Colombia. Uh, and this is, I think that's one example of something else that we were talking about, about the old left and this all of this residual, um, you know, patriarchal, um, Eurocentric, really, uh, view of of um, you know social um, and cultural, right? Perhaps in terms of politics, it might be progressive, but we also have to pay attention to how regressive, right, culturally and socially they can be. Um, mostly because you know it's not considered important enough, and and. That's that's I think that's one thing that's not talked about enough, right? When classical music, what's the problem with classical music, right? So it's if you do that, you are pretty much elevating classical music as the best music. So you are feeding into all of these Eurocentric models of culture, and you are undoing a lot that had been done, even though very imperfectly. 
right? So this has created a, a real big controversy and a lot of debate. Of course, um, activists, academics, musicians are all <laughs> complaining. These are, this is one large group that's really protesting this. Um, and apparently there has been no resolution yet. So the, the Ministry of Culture um, left. Now we have a new one that apparently really wants to stick to this idea. So this is one, one example, right, of how we see uh, this idea of this old left that is not really embracing uh, progressiveness in a social, a, a broader social sense. Yeah. Uh, what to do? Open up for more voices, right? So they have to form coalitions, not only with established politicians, with um, but really open up to to more progressive views in every sense. I wonder. Sort of initiating. You are. <laughs> I want to make sure everybody gets it. You, you want to be first? Uh, no, no. Okay. I was going in order. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, just a, a quick point about the this idea of whether do we have an alternative to capitalism. Um, I don't know. I, I don't see any alternative in the near future. But I think that the point here is that neoliberalism is too much. So I am not looking for an alternative to capitalism. And I think that the Chilean student movement and the current president, um, even if in the Chilean context, extremely dominated by, by, by a very conservative elite, they have been um, accused to be too radical. Uh, in fact, they are just trying, they are kind of social democrat uh, in Europe. They are trying to create a welfare state. Uh, kind of warranting so basic social rights, universal social rights, not uh, social services not distributed in the market uh, logic, uh, in the market dynamics. So I, I, I think this is the point. Um, we don't we don't need a clear, detailed picture of the paradise. We just need to agree that neoliberalism is too much. It's a it's a specific uh, way of capitalism. Uh, that is a showing that has a lot of uh, weakness in different uh, angles, in different dimensions. Uh, I I uh, I have uh, put more emphasis on the social inequality, but of course, in environmental issues and other issues are, is, is also relevant. And I think this is the the second point uh, related to this uh, to this idea. Maybe uh, Juan Pablo maybe can can add something here. Um, how to reconcile the uh, kind of 20th century agenda for social justice with this uh, 21st century agenda of more, you want to say, post-materialist uh, demands. Um, I, I think the Chilean experience with the uh, Constitutional Convention was a clear example of uh, this uh, kind of um, um, maximalism, trying to, to create uh, the 21st uh, First um, constitution, very post-materialist constitution, uh, animal rights, all the demands, historical demands uh, of the of these new social movements, uh, without having basic health issues, social, housing issues, social security issues. So how how to combine both in in a single uh, process of uh, political change that, that is viable. And some people say that um, because this post-materialist uh, discourse, I will say discourse, uh, was taking too much uh, presence in the, in the creation of the new constitution, this alienated the more basic social right demand that created the opportunity for uh, constitutional change in Chile, and this alienated uh, vast, uh, non so um, cultivated and university based uh, students voters, but the popular votes in the, 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 the popular votes and the, the, the poor and the new middle class that I was trying to describe. So how to uh, reconcile those uh, both agendas um, in, in, when you don't, you cannot say, well, let's be um, 
let's develop um, first and then let's take care of the environment. This is, this, is not, <laughs> this is not possible. But in a country like Chile or in most of our Latin American countries, uh, I think the basic issue of, of guaranteeing social rights uh, is still a pending issue. And this new left have to uh, be able to combine this. Uh, when when Piñera, I finish this with this, when Piñera, a billionaire president, has uh, to face the, the, the issues of uh, the pandemic, uh, the health, the Ministry of Health, the Health Ministry of Piñera said, oh, sorry, we didn't know how poor were the Chilean families. So we didn't know the living condition of the poor. So we we did a mistake. Oh, well, so you, you have an elite governing a society that didn't know, but that, that don't know. Uh, but when Boric, the current president, uh, is facing the uh, crisis, the security crisis, uh, he's saying, oh, sorry, we didn't know how big the problem was and how weak the state was the policy in this case. The, 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 the policies were, were to face this. So, I think this is the the, the the Chilean drama. Have an elite, conservative elite that don't know the country they rule, and you have a progressive movement that uh, are is unable to um, to govern the complexity of the current society. Thank you. I think that's always our problem, right? Progressives, because conservatives seem very good at getting together under one banner, despite their differences. And we like to duke it out. We like to keep talking. Makes it harder. Wow. <laughs> you raised me a lot of questions. <laughs> yes, because when we talk about the multiculturalism, you know, it's, it's, it's it's important that we understand this, like, university, you know. And we use it to joke because uno, university uno, just one kind of knowledge is there. University, you know, is the name already say what it is. It's supposed to be multiverse. And, and one of the things about the multiculturalism, it's because the university and the other place, what have the diffusion of the knowledge, they only practice the Eurocentric knowledge. All the other kind of the knowledge and the other way of passing the knowledge is not respected. The indigenous, the Afrocentric knowledge, they don't have no respect over there. And when I say respect, is to put out at the same level. Do I need to have a doctor degree to be he, or just a as a capoeira mestre can be here? Because I have been practicing capoeira for 50 years. I don't know how many doctor degree I could do in that during this time. But a uh, yellow Risha Mãe de Santo, she spent like whole life there. But she can sit with a uh, doctor to tell the way to make one person healthy, different to own with a uh, psychiatrist, you know, like a psychologist or something. Because she helps some people to overcome depression and everything. But can she sit side by side with some kind of respect? And that's raising me all the questions. It's like because if the place, what the food, our knowledge, what I call the UNO diversity, if they don't open up for other kind of knowledge to come together on the same level and be discussed and passing this for the students, how are you going to change? My question is, what we are you doing for that? Or we just sit down on this comfortable place, what sometimes 
we are afraid to, to raise some question inside and don't, I don't know the word in English, não ser bem visto. But there's one thing. I think I'm gonna talk about us here, okay? Most of you eyes, what I can see, have been on this fight for long years. Uh, my question is, what drive us to that? Why can we leave everything and still believe things can be changed after so many fails? What makes us believe we can still win? We still can change. What makes us to leave everything on our place, husband, wife, kids, uh, to come here and sit down and choose, still discuss the thing what we know people have been discussed for more than 100 years. And we still believe we're going to change. What, what is inside us different from other people who cannot sit here with us and fight? That's the question. I could answer the fate. We have so much faith. We're going to win. We're going to change. And we can make everything for that. We can be night with no sleeping. Like you say, you travel, you know, go for the front, you know. Uh, this year, I got myself in front of a protest, you know, with the police and like, and after I look and say, God damn, you are not more 20 years old, man. He was 16 years old, man. He was like, what are you doing there? It's, it's supposed to be there on the back. <laughs> but at the same time, I was there because if the young people see me there, they're going to be encouraged to fight because they're going to look and see if he's there, I need to be there. And it can answer me other question. If you're asking me why I'm still fighting, I'm going to tell you, my people have been fighting for more than 500 years. And they did not give it up. The reason why they did not give it up, the proof is I'm here. And I believe if I fight, at least more, I don't know, 10 years, five years. I'm going to bring some other people with me. But my question is still for you guys. What drive you in this fight? Thank you. I go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so... Uh, it's 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 uh it's hard to 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 say something uh, meaningful <laughs> after some of the things we've just heard but I, I did want to share with you a couple of thoughts so so one is um something about the things i learned and um uh, and i want to mention a couple of things that i think i learned in in, in the sessions uh so one is this uh question of the neoliberal trap so so i think i think we're, we're too easy to just condemn neoliberalism instead of trying to understand where the trap lies how how does it entrap us how does it work i i i'm kind of going a little bit in in in, <laughs> in, in your line you know of, of trying to think a bit more carefully as we as we make the criticism it's similar to what i used to sometimes tell students i tell them you can tell me it's capitalism it's colonialism it's liberalism it's neoliberalism you know but I want you to think harder. You know, I want you to not just give me the shorthand, tell me you're on the right side of the barricade, 
I want you to tell me more about how this works. And, and, and that's kind of, I think, one of the challenges. And I think one of the things I, I it dawned on me, and this comes from Viri's thing, is it's this defi, def, defi, uh, defeat, <laughs> defeatism, how do you call this, yeah. of the left. It's almost like the left has given up. And, and, and that's very troubling, you know, when, when at least from the Mexican perspective, it's like if the left gives up, then, <laughs> then what's left? You know, then, then the next question is a little bit about this thing that I think it was it was Juan Pablo who mentioned it, this empty citizenship. If I'm a citizen, I'm supposed to live in a democracy, I'm supposed to be empowered. You know, why has this citizenship become so empty? And that's something that, you know, Guillermo Donnell, you know, talked a lot about this in, in his later work about this, uh, you know, low intensity citizenship that the, the transition to democracy brought us. Um, a third thing I learned, and I'm sorry, I'm going to contradict you here. But Galeano's book of La Venas Abiertas is not the best book on Latin America. Uh, but La Memoria del Fuego is the kind of book that would connect us to our ancestry in a very different way. It's in this more sensorial way. I mean, Galeano himself, we have this discussion in Bolivar House about, about what we need our students to read before they come to get a master's. Mm -hmm. And of course, the immediate candidate is Las Venas Abiertas. My preference is on the Memoria, Memoria de Fuego because it is about that connection with our ancestry and, and to make, sh make sense of this walk and this journey and also make sense of these immigration mirrors as, as we think about kind of the US. But anyway, that, that's, that's a little bit some of the things I learned. I, I do want to share with you a little bit what I also think reflecting throughout the day on what's, what's the kind of left I would like to see. <laughs> and I would like to see a left that does something we have not been able to discuss enough, I think, but it's a left that is completely rejects and intolerant of authoritarianism. So this is a very complicated problem because you mentioned this about, you know, what do you do when you have a president on the left? You also have to protest and you also have to show them your grievances. We have a very serious problem in Latin America because we are always having trouble with what do we do with the Ortegas? What do we do with the Chaveses? What do we do, I'm sorry, with the Castros? And, you know, how do we deal with the left that is authoritarian? We have no problem saying there was an authoritarian left governing Russia, uh, Russia, the Soviet Union under Stalin. We don't have a problem with that one, but we have a problem when we have to say there is an authoritarian left uh, in Latin America. So I would like a left which is democratic, that is completely committed to democratic values. Uh, the second one is this idea, I, I think I like a lot more how Christian phrases it. It's not about markets, it's not about capitalism. It's about a left that chooses to decommodify, I think you can see I'm tired, mm -hmm. <laughs> but that chooses to decommodify some realms of our life. We as a world, as a global society, vaccine access became decommodified. There was like a general agreement that something as important as getting a vaccine was not going to go first to the rich and then to the poor, although it did go first to the rich and then to the poor. But, you know, regardless of this, at least there was this agreement that we could decommodify. The companies did make millions of dollars. You know, we're still not there, but we have this sense. I mean, the left, one of the legacies of the left to us from the fights of the 20th century was to tell us there's some things that we don't leave to the market. You, you get schooling to every kid and that's not going to be done by the market. We give basic public health to every person so that kids don't die prematurely. We, we just think that's something that is not up to the market. So, so I think we, we have to move the terms a little bit about that. What, 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 was, what, what the content of our criticism to neoliberalism is. And, and the last one is, I, I would say that the big, big thing, and this is really, you know, resonated with some of the things you told us in, in this panel, is, is the treatment of humans with dignity. Uh, so so how, does, how does that happen? That happens when we have the capoeira mm -hmm. performance going on. And at least I can share with you what I felt. I felt I could connect with thinking, okay, this is an Angolan legacy that I can see coming through Africa, coming to a kind of a, a new way of doing it, because it's not necessarily the way somebody would have done it in the 12th century or in the 15th century or in the 17th century. But here we are, and we have this sensory connection to that basic human dignity uh, that 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 is not about classical music is 
first and foremost, the best music. Uh, but that's one of the things the left always stood for. You know, this sense of, you know, a worker is just as valuable as as, as any human being. And, 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 and we seem the left has lost kind of that basic idea. We have reparations to come for enslavement. We have these are serious questions that the left is not dealing with as far as I can tell. So sorry. <laughs> Well, that that was interesting. <laughs> um, one of the things that the MSET begins with every day, and it's uh, at the uh, Scola Nacional Florestan Fernandes and then the encampments and whatnot, is a mystica. So there's always an emotional either piece of theater or music to, to wake everybody up and get everybody engaged. And when you're giving a class that goes all day long, all of a sudden somebody stands and goes, yeah, and starts to uh, commence the, starts to play the guitar and sing us. Everybody gets up and sings a song, kind of shake, shakes you up, but it kind of gets you animated and feeling like you're in a group. And I think that's one of the, one of the key takeaways that I got from Dardo and Laval in talking about neoliberalism, their book, the, the, uh, do, the moon, Novo has on the mundo in Portuguese, um, that, Neoliberalism insists on competitiveness, uh, and that's the, at its core, it's something that's trying to make us all feel like uh, the best way to get ahead is to think of individually, how can you be better, compete better in that line of work and to believe in yourself. And so you'll, you know, you'll be the best uh, influencer on the on the web on the web and you'll make a million dollars and all that kind of stuff um and and the other value is, is uh community cooperative cooperation collaboration the surgeon general of the united states was talking about how in the united states we're so alienated from one another and that's one of the things causing so many problems in the present and suicide and 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 other issues serious very serious issues so we need to communicate more with each other, give each other a hug, <laughs> all that kind of a counter culture to a competitive culture and build that in. And, and that's what, in a sense, a welfare state is teaching because it's showing that the state is something that, that teaches, that, that helps uh, make you believe that it's worthwhile, important to care for one another, to care for the society. That's what make one of the important things that makes a society tick. And, um, so, and I was interested in the universo that you mentioned because I I uh, I don't see uh, an uni one, although it does have that significance. It also means everything, universe. This the universe is a place where the the university is where you can have everybody working in a sort of unison, collaborating, cooperating, trying to learn from one another. So that's the universe that I think about <laughs> <laughs> should be uh, should be uh, um, and I think and um, and about the left uh, I think it's important to remember well I, I think history is important to to keep in mind and I loved what you started with and I forget your name Ch Chela um, and that's the alternatives, you know, that we used to think they're alternatives and they're bad alternatives because it was this, you know, the 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 Guerra Fria, the Cold War, and there that was the enemy over here. But it was also really an alternative. And I grew up in San Francisco with communists going down to help out in the um, sugarcane harvest in in uh, Cuba, when the uh, as a as a kid of the lab the longshoremen's labor labor union worked on the waterfront too, and um, uh, so that that sense of um, the the left is uh, of alternatives is important, and that left. Uh, the the communist left left that was dominated by domi uh, communist parties in diverse countries in, uh, linked to the Soviet Union uh, was one that uh, had the argument that you had to build cap capitalism so that that in many ways supported the capitalism in diverse countries uh, that would be the national bourgeoisie you wouldn't want it to be so linked to imperialism because that was helping the United States. But uh, there's all these arguments historically of the left 
but leading toward strengthening capitalism because that was the stage that you needed to get to so you could get to socialism, so you could get to communism. So uh, it's, there's nothing um, uh, alien about the idea of the left supporting capitalism, at least historically speaking. <laughs> and, I, and I think that's probably uh, the best option that we can think about a real capitalism like uh, Viri is talking about not having that in Mexico, building capital, just getting capitalism there that was really functional and not monopolistic and had a, a social uh, uh, infrastructure uh, would be a, a real plus. So anyway. Some uh, some of my observations today. <laughs> we have till five thirty. I I'm glad everyone got a chance to kind of say some things. Um, it, if anybody, um, I know Chuck, you spoke, and then yeah. would you like to say any more? And then maybe if people have something they want to contribute, please just raise your hand. And you're also, as an old professor, you learn ending early is never, you're never punished. The, the, the pueblo will not throw any rocks if we, we don't have to go to fire. No, I just want to say, I mean, I want to thank everyone and, 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 and congratulate. And the, the, there are a lot of discussions. Obviously, these discussions are going on around on the ground. I mean, I've been in meetings in Peru with the old left and the new left. And, you know, there's a lot more commonalities. There's a lot of, there's also a lot of respect, I think, I, I think. So I just want to point out these are rich debates as well. I mean, there, there is the defeatism of the left um yet there are you know many great my, we, we learned today about micro projects local projects that red things like that and so um i don't know i mean there's lots to be done but i also see a lot of positive signs including these discussions that are reflecting broader discussions in the in in academic circles but above all in, in community circles and politics etc so is anybody inspired? Well, and I'm against trying capitalism. <laughs> I, I, I suggest that Mexico doesn't try capitalism. Does that? If I, yeah, if I can. Yeah, please go ahead. Just to uh, add to Alberto's and, and, and Christian's needs, uh, I think there are two issues that the left has to think deeply about, and, and, and we don't have answers to, to, to that. Uh, I mean, we 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 all agree that decommodification is, is is crucial, right? That probably that enacting care policies and and uh, in that way like favoring also gender uh, uh, like uh, and, and, and uh, like policies that that go in terms of like uh, like enhancing gender equality are, are, are crucial for, for a leftist agenda. Uh, we know that uh, sustainability and environmental sustainability are, are crucial and, and cannot be done away with, uh, but we don't have, we lack a growth model. How, how is, are these countries going to grow, right? And in, in like, um, Chuck was uh, mentioning that uh, like Peru is one of the fastest growing economies in, in the region. The other is Paraguay. Right? Those are the two uh, like uh, uh, more dynamic economic uh, economies in, in, in Latin America in the last 15 years. Much of that growth has to do with informal economy, with criminal economy. Uh, how is the formal economy going to grow? And, 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 and what's the left uh, model for that? Um, and like thinking out what, what uh, a bit of the discussion in Chile, I mean, one, one alternative is, well, we have to bet on unicorn, right? Like this new, uh, like, uh, uh, New, new, new technology companies that uh, uh, are are emerging from Latin America, but those companies do not generate much much employment in the region. They like are rapidly sell, uh, sold and 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 they they go to Wall Street and and they don't have much impact in in, in the local economy. Uh, the other alternative is degrowth. Well, what what's the political economy for degrowing? In, in, in a context like the one we have in, 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 in our society. So that, that's one pending issue for which the left, in my view, doesn't have an answer. 
and, and, and the second one has to do with security, right? Um, we don't have any viable alternative to iron test uh, unit level right? uh, for addressing the security crisis in the region. Um, we know the, the, the strong hand doesn't work, uh, but it captures people's imagination uh, without any counterpart from uh, leftist leaders uh, to, to, to fight back on, 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 on policy alternatives to that. Great, thank you very much. Um, is there any other uh, inspired? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Anyone? <laughs> yeah. comment, Please, sure, go ahead. So, sorry. Sorry that I'm I'm still hung up with the Petro visit in in Stanford. So um, I don't know if you noticed it, but we did see it in the slides at some point. Uh, the, the Petro had the Stanford seal. <laughs> thank you for doing that, or maybe not. Thank you. Uh, but 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 I mean I I think Petro came as the leader of the not the leader. I don't know if he's the leader of the left in Latin America, but he came as a as a as a president that is facing incredibly difficult challenges to govern a country that has incredibly complex problems. And I'm sorry, but I was disappointed by his speech because all he told us is capitalism is bad and climate change is a big problem. We already knew that. So, 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 so I mean, I, I'm trying to just you know a bit more imagination or how, you know, degrowth, what just Juan Pablo said, for example, how do we create an agenda of degrowth in the most unequal region in the world? Maybe it's possible. It would help with the carbon footprint. It would, but, but the question is, how do you do that? You know, because you need to think about how you redistribute because the reason why growth is so attractive is because you think, oh, well, the poor will somehow live a little better, you know? Uh, but, but, but I think, Juan Pablo is pointing out the thing about, okay, we decide it's not capitalism, if we decide it's not um, growth, then we have to figure out how you do the growth. And, and maybe you have some answers. I... <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't have the answer, but um, <laughs> also looking back at recent history, the model of growth that the United States was pushing in Latin America was uh, the family farmer. So, uh, of course, it didn't ever get that way, and it was uh, moved toward the Green Revolution and the consolidation. But I think that's the model that the MSCT and the Tea Dupovo is thinking about a little bit. If all those people were generating an income on the land, they'd be buying things and they'd be they'd starting starting a consumer economy in the countries that could be sustaining. <laughs> no, it's just to say, because we were talking about, look, um, the majority of the food grow in Brazil is made by the small farmers, okay? The big farm, the agronegocio, receive most of the support of the government. And when you look at the number, it's more than 10 times more what they give for the small farm. It's like a picking agriculture. But we are one who supply the everyday food because the agronegocio for export. They don't supply inside. It's like, you know, when, when we talk about this, it's like what the day, what we try to do is like, okay, let's support yourself. We first, okay? We first. We said, like, we supply ourselves first. I know, I mean, not naive to think it is going to change everything, but at least we know what you're doing is a beginning. We don't know what you're going to get. It. We really don't. But we decide we're gonna do something because the way it is and they have been done, it's don't have it been work for us. It's just the indigenous people still fight for their land. 
and look, this land belonged to them before the European came in. And now they, they and right now in Brasilia have a, we have a, a, a big movement called Demarcação Já. Why? Because the government said all the people who not have been on their land until 1998, it cannot take over the land. But look, if you look at the history of Brazil, the people who have been on the coast, when the European came, they pushed them to inside. And if have a document what show that people occupy that place, but they, it's not there anymore, because they was pushed. And now they cannot reclaim the piece of the land. But look historically, who does whole land belong to? It's like somebody coming to your house, take it over, and after you need to prove the house is yours, but you don't have any document. And we, last time we was joking because uh, some of the people, the evangelical people, really support this kind of thing. I'm sorry, I don't want to get on the religion of anyone, but if you are evangelical, that's fine. I know I have nothing against. But you know, what, what I'm telling you, you will believe in God. No? You believe God creates the earth. He is one who creates everything on this earth, okay? And he owns the earth, okay? But now I want to know who have some people signed by God to tell you bought this piece of land for him. And now have the right to occupy this place. Why you have the right and some other people who have been here is cannot have it. They was here before. And like us, Afro-descendant, my ancestors did not ask you to come to Brazil. You was forced to be there. And decides to be there, now we want to stay. Don't think about it. some people go back to Africa. No. I did not ask you to bring me here. And now you're going to tolerate me here. And I want my peace. Because my ancestors worked so hard to make this land good. And now I have my peace. And that, that, that's the whole thing. You know, because historically, and we stood about that, but when we started to put in practice this thing, it don't work. That's what the net of the people at the of we decide we're going to get our territory and you're going to make our territory work. And space by space, you're going to support other people who have the territory. You know, I don't know how long it's going to stay. We don't know if really, if you start to be too big, people are going to crush us. That's possible. You have seen other examples in other countries. But at least we believe we're going to try to learn from the mistake what other people did and to not try to do the same thing. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, we have a few more minutes if anybody. Oh, she, she, she was... Elizabeth, did you? OK. Any last comments, anyone? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you need, you need. Come here, come here, come, come. No, no. not in the, not in the streaming. Or <laughs> Um, no, I just wanted to say that um, I've been accompanying the Zapatista movement, as many of you know. And one of the first, I mean, when the uprising happened, the, uh, the ACLN in southern Mexico happened, they said when they declared, the, I mean, when they they were fighting against the Mexican government, you know, and, and they declared the war to the Mexican government, and then they realized 
that it was an empty place, that the power didn't really reside there, that the power was in the financial institutions, you know, and then the, so and they, ever since then they have been saying, you know, these spaces are, yeah, sometimes you have a good capataz or a bad capataz, but you still have a capa it's a manager. They say the the presidents now are managers of our con of countries because they are not the ones, it's not the power that's not there. And somebody mentioned, I don't know if it was you or, or um, Juan Pablo, that, that part that, you know, they really sometimes don't have the power. They are just managing a country and they have to obey and they have to, you know, it, it's complicated in that sense, right? So anyway, that, that was my contribution. <laughs> Up there is another one. Ah, sorry, <laughs> can do it. Um, hi, my name is Eva Gutierrez. Uh, I'm a first year here at UC Davis, and I'm freshly 18 years old. And I just wanted to go back to your um, your question that you had asked about why we um, or why you are in this industry and why you are, continue to advocate for what you advocate for. And um, I I don't know if I said this, but um, I'm a history major. And when you asked that question, it really, it resonated me. And it also kind of scared me because I realized, why why am I here? And like I said, um, I'm, I took history um, of Latin America um, from six, uh, 16th century to 17th century. Now I'm in um, history of Latin America from 19th century to present. and I'm realizing now that I'm continuing with my education, how important it is um, for the advocacy, for the education, for the academia of these situations and um, for everything that's happening um, in Latin America, the effects of the U.S. on Latin American countries and the development of these countries. Um, like um, going back to what we've discussed here, your role in this is so important because then we see advocacy in students in Chile, in Mexico, across the board, with the increase of education and advocacy for these issues, change comes. And that's something that we have seen in the past that the lack of education and a lot of the times countries prohibit people who are young from learning about their cultures, from learning about their histories, to prohibit them from gaining their cultural heritage back from gaining their land back, from gaining everything back. So just in saying that, I think that for me, that is why I am here, why I'm going to continue to fight for these issues. And then just thank you all for, for being here and then also helping me conceptualize all of this information. <laughs> Anyways, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, well, I I, I want to say that the, the the student movement in Chile, at least, the the interest rate decreased a lot. <laughs> Banks are out of the student loans, and free universities now a reality for eighty percent of the students. So this is all because of the student movement. Yeah, and and in Brazil, I was mentioning how important the student movement has been to preserve the federal university. But I wanted to say to my compañero. <laughs> that uh, he's gonna, he said he's gonna stop fighting in five years. And from what he's told us, he'll be 67 in five years. Well, I'm 67 already, and I'm not gonna stop. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you gave us the answer here to some of our questions. You know, what can the the left do? <laughs> Invest in the youth, yes. that's it, which is lacking. All of our countries. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much. And I think that question really took my closing comments and just wrapped them up beautifully. I absolutely agree. Answering the question that Maestra Cora uh, Mansa offered to us: What are we doing? Why do we do this? Um, you know, I personally continue to fight for the humanities in the university. It's under attack, and. Um, you know, I'm there to defend my students' right. Uh, many of them are learning about their own cultures. Many of them are first 
generation immigrants to this country and they're coming to our department, the Spanish section, to to dive back into that, to recapture their language and their culture. So um, that's just a wonderful way to end it. You know, definitely the youngsters, the the youth, where are the are the future? So um, I would like to close. Um, oh, there's another question. Oh my goodness. Okay, the youth the youth are getting excited at the very end. You're still awake. It's amazing. Uh, I just wanted to add for a lot of people like me. Um, so I'm not from Latin America. I don't have a lot of links to Latin America. My dad's from Ireland. My you know mom is just a white American basically. Um, and I just wanted to add that it's also extremely valuable for someone like me, things like the, things like these events like today, um, the people here today speaking the ways they do, um, to realize that like if someone like me, who comes from a small conservative town and has really ugly roots, to be honest, um, to recognize that and to place myself in history and to change that and to beautifully personally grow out of it as well. Um, and Davis has given me that. And yeah, it's just, it has a big impact on people like me as well, um, which I think we all need to make this a better place and to accept our roles and our legacies, right? So just thank you very much for being here today. Okay. <laughs>